Hello everyone, it's the Drinker here and I'm joined once again this evening by Danquish, the inventor of the Drunk Saber and survivor of severe internal injuries. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. <laughs> it's, uh, uh, it's good to have you on again, man. How's, how's everything going? It is going well, th sir. Thank you for having me back. Nice one. That's oh, always good. And I know we were batting around different ideas about what movies we could cover. And I think we we thought about doing Kurt Russell's uh, Soldier, which is mm. which is quite a decent little action movie. Um, and then you you just hit me with this this great suggestion. Let's do RoboCop. And I was yeah. like, fuck yes, perfect. Exactly. Um, one of those awesome movies from my childhood that was just brilliant. Loved it. Um, and almost had forgotten about it it's been so long since i'd seen it um mm. and it was just great to be reminded of it and um yeah it was just like the perfect one to go for so it was a total pleasure to watch it again today like i watched it just this afternoon so i could be nice and fresh with it um when we went and talked about it tonight so um yeah it's it's awesome to get fired into it um it's one of those movies that was on quite a bit when i was a kid and i was like watching it like way younger than I should have done, um, and <laughs> yes. we got the we got the weird censored version um, when when it was on TV here in the UK. Like the mm. the scene where Murphy gets killed is way cut down, and um, the bit with the the toxic waste guy near the end is completely cut out. So it's really weird. Like Clarence just randomly crashes his car for no reason. Exactly. Yeah. <laughs> the context is missing when it's so heavily edited. Yeah, uh, yeah, definitely. But uh, no, obviously, I got to watch the the full and complete version today, so that was great. Um, and hail to chats! Thank you to everyone who's going to join us tonight. Hopefully, we can put on a nice stream for you and um, have a nice bit of nostalgia for this awesome movie. Um, as with usual, uh, I'll keep an eye on the chat and try and respond to things um, as they pop up. But um, we'll generally leave the super chats more towards the end, so we're not we're not stopping and starting because it makes for a better chat that way but we will obviously get through all of them so not to worry uh yeah so i mean i was gonna ask you you know do you have a sort of recollection of when you first saw robocop or like how you first got into it because for me i think it was just one of those ones that every everyone saw like as mm -hmm. i was i was a kid like my friends would have seen it and then it's like oh it's on tv tomorrow night i'm gonna i'm gonna stay up late and watch it or whatever um and it was just one of those ones i saw from a really young age mm-hmm no, I remember it like it was yesterday. Um, I was too young to see it in the theater, obviously. But uh, I remember my brother had told me, hey, I saw this cool trailer on TV for this new movie called RoboCop that I think you're going to like. And I hadn't seen the trailer, so I just took his word for it that it, okay, it sounds cool. Uh, and for some reason in my young brain, my my mind immediately thought of Johnny Five from Short Circuit. You know, that's oh, what yeah. So I don't know why that came into my head. I'm like, okay, whatever. Didn't give it a second thought. Then we went to go to the theater to go see Predator, um, of all things. And there in the foyer of the cinema was a cardboard cutout for, for you know promoting RoboCop. And my eyes just fell out of my skull. I'm like, is that that movie? And my brother was like, oh, yeah, 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 that's a movie I was uh, telling you about. So, and all I could think of was this cool cardboard cutout, even though we were about to sit down and watch Predator. And then the trailer for RoboCop was before Predator. And I almost fell out of my chair. And it was absolutely amazing. Um, I remember the audience just gasping uh, at the scene where he, you know, puts the gun back in his holster and it retracts and everyone went, oh, you know, it was, <laughs> it was so thrilling. And then I remember being traumatized the scene later on in the trailer where he's being shot, like the, the, the police are, you know, trying to shoot him to death. And I was like, what are they doing? What, why, why are they doing this? Uh, so much so that I could hardly even concentrate on Predator afterwards. <laughs> it was, that's kind of ironic. And a but, movie that can distract you from Predator is, is a hell of a movie. <laughs> it, it, it was, it was. And then of course I was, I couldn't see it. Um, I had to wait until it came out on VHS and, uh, and then I watched it and yeah, it was transformative. Uh, I was just absolutely consumed with Robocop for, for several years. Nice. Um, and then the sequels happened, sadly, and they uh, they didn't really live up to it. Um, you know, RoboCop 2, I think, is actually pretty good. I, I saw that in the theater as well. I definitely was old enough at that time to go see it. Uh, and I thought I thought RoboCop 2, like the actual robot, Kane, was amazing. 
I just I mean it. they they obviously had the challenge of like can we create something that's bigger and more mm -hmm. intimidating than the Ed 209 and it's like sure. okay well it's like it's like an Ed 209 on steroids with mm -hmm. like another RoboCop in control but he's evil um, right. and yeah there's <laughs> there's some great um great scenes in that like when this this thing when Kane's on a rampage near the mm -hmm. finale um, mm -hmm. and he's just gunning down civilians left and right and like an ambulance tries to come in to rescue people and he blows that up and mm -hmm. you know the chairman of OCP is just standing on a big balcony overlooking at it and he's yeah. like this could look uh, bad for OCP yeah. Johnson <laughs> exactly they, they really no, no shit man he's destroying yeah. the city well they tried to go continue the whole satire narrative that uh, Verhoeven had done uh, in the first one and it, it kind of works but not really like it feels like the joke has already been played out you know with those faux commercials and uh, uh, the board games like um, Nukem and, and all that kind of stuff uh, but still I thought the that like the stop motion photography and everything in Robocop 2 was was really cool and the robot yeah. was awesome that's uh, that kind of stop motion um, animation. It's it's so unique to mm -hmm. like these, these older movies. Like I think it goes all the way back to like you know the, the early days of cinema, and they were able to keep it going in more sophisticated forms. Um, oh, I sure. obviously had movies like The Terminator that still used it. Um, I loved it in Jason and the Argonauts with Talos, that like giant oh, yes. Iron yeah. Man thing that just like you see it picking up entire ships and throwing them around. It's like Absolutely. so such a cool look. It's hard to it describe, is. but like because it makes things. Um, so it, there's a slight jerkiness to it and a slight yes. unrealness. Um, yes. It almost makes it somehow more effective. It's hard to explain, but I just it's it's so entrenched in like cinema for me. Like I just I always appreciate it when I see it. Um, and I did like some of the commercials in RoboCop too, like Sunblock mm -hmm. Five Thousand. Yep, that was awesome. <laughs> yep. Like, uh, where it's yep. like warning, may cause skin cancer. Exactly. You know, <laughs> it's so supposed to protect you from what. <laughs> Yeah, <laughs> humor like that was absolutely fantastic in the movie. And then uh, RoboCop three, I don't really want to talk about uh, that. That just hurt me to my core. So we'll just leave it at two. Uh, yeah, there's some great um, quotes in chat, by the way. Um, a lot of like from the from the movie, like uh, the six thousand SUX. Yes, <laughs> <just> talks. Yep, <laughs> uh, that was a fantastic uh, reference there. Uh, I'd buy that for a dollar. Yeah, that mm -hmm. guy's. We'll talk about him for sure. For sure. Um, yeah. Give the man a hand. Yes. Ugh. Oh, that's a, a tough scene to watch. Uh, uh, the bit where the the guys, um, the city councillor is taking the mayor hostage and they're negotiating mm -hmm. with him, and it's like, oh, we'll even throw in a blow punked. Yes. Remember I when blow punks were like top of the range stereos? Seriously, uh, that's I think that's one of my favorite quotes in that entire movie, and it's how I you that's my metric for shopping for a new car. It's like, yeah. what do you want? I, want, I don't know, something with reclining leather seats that goes really fast and gets really shitty gas mileage. Yeah. <laughs> so. Can you fly, Bobby? Bobby, <laughs> oh, yeah. Clarence, no! Oh, yeah. And then, like, uh, what's his name? The um, the guy who plays Joe. Uh, he's got that really cool laugh, you know? Oh, yeah, yeah. It's really high-pitched. Like, <laughs> yeah. Yeah. yeah, like uh, Murphy's standing there with his arm hanging off, and he's just mm. laughing at him. Like, yeah, he's uh, he's he's quite good. Does um, it hurt? It's, it, Does it hurt? Yeah, <laughs> it's Emil that I like, um, and he's the one who gets turned into the toxic crusader. <laughs> he mm -hmm. drives straight into a big vat of toxic waste. Yeah. Uh, oh, that was that was gruesome stuff. Um, but yeah, I'm sure we'll get to it. Um, but yeah, what we I guess what we normally do is we kind of go go through the movie uh, mm -hmm. from from beginning to end, and if you're cool with that, we can yep. we can get cracking. And yep, see I've if we can make sense of the puzzle that is RoboCop. It is a pleasant puzzle to get through. Um, so yeah, obviously the movie's set in like the near future. Um, it's mm -hmm. not. Uh, we were talking about this just briefly earlier. Um, it's not like super futuristic or anything, where we've got spaceships and flying cars and everything. Like people still drive around in regular cars. They still use guns. You know, they 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 can't like teleport around or anything crazy like that. It's just like um, sort of slightly dystopian future where Detroit's an absolute shithole. Um, you know. Giant mega corporations are, are gradually taking over things um, and privatizing like pretty much every service that the public uses. It's basically 2020. Mm -hmm. so, sure. We're pretty much there already. Yep, it is a very very prescient movie. OCP is basically just Apple, pretty much. <laughs> 
I, I have to say, uh, for the record, the the uh, the eighties were a great time to be a, a like a, a young person going to the, the theater because I was just looking at the dates again. Like holy shit, within the span of three years, we had Aliens, Predator, and RoboCop. Yeah, that was that was just the the holy trinity really of movies. Yeah, absolutely. It's, uh, it's a great time, and it, you know. I, obviously, this was Paul Verhoeven's first um, breakout movie in the U.S., um, it was, and it's what yeah. established him. And it's it strikes a great balance between satire with all the commercials and stuff, mm -hmm. and the, the references to like corporations, like privatizing like hospitals and mm -hmm. prisons and all that stuff, um, but also like genuine like drama and um, like you know. A, kind of good thriller, like good action scenes. Like it, mm -hmm. it strikes that great balance between those two things and it never goes too far in either direction. So it becomes like quite a complete, um, satisfying, balanced movie, which is quite exactly. rare. It's not an easy path to walk, I don't think. No, and that's why I think the the sequels uh, just didn't quite capture that. The first one was, like you said, a great balance where you, you could quite, you didn't know if you were supposed to take it seriously or whether you were supposed to laugh at it. You know, because the uh, the opening sequence here with the newscasters, you know, they're just they put on the faux sincerity and you know the kind of lack of sympathy that they have. Yeah, and they're covering like major wars breaking out oh, as yeah. well, like yeah. South America or no South Africa. I think they've unveiled like neutron bombs that they're threatening to use, and like mm -hmm. you know this this could result in like millions of casualties. And then they're like, yeah. okay, and we're going to commercial, and then it's just That's like it. a commercial for artificial hearts made by Honda. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> it's just brilliant. <laughs> And remember, we care. We care, yeah. <laughs> Again, it's it's so on the nose. It's painful, you know. It's exactly how commercials work. Um, yeah, I love that satirical aspect of it. But it establishes like this this world pretty effectively. You know, it's mm -hmm. a dystopian near future place. Everything's a bit shit, and like you know, corporations are kind of running everything, masquerading as if they they care about you and like mm -hmm. it's it's all very fake and um and controlled and that's that's the world of um of robocop um and what i like is you know it it gives you that um and then it takes you down to like the street level of like um the the actual cops in their their um precinct in i think mm -hmm. it's east detroit or something uh, uh, but it's like the, the, it's uh, the old part of detroit anyway like the roughest patch um and you know, it's it's exactly as you'd expect. Like the precincts all run down, it's overrun, everybody's overworked, like the cops are going around in full body armor at all times. Um, you know, it's like it's like a war zone basically. Mm -hmm. It okay kinda reminds me of Predator too, actually, that we reviewed. Oh, yeah. You know, same For thing. Sure. Like I just I just needed to see a guy headbutting a police officer in the yeah, middle exactly. of the station. Yeah. It's just <laughs> pandemonium, social disorder, yeah. You got these two scumbag lawyers accosting the chief here you know trying to plead their case yeah um and uh, are they not arguing for like reduced charges or something yeah. so that he can get bail and then and get out and the the chief obviously is having none of that shit yeah. he's like get your scumbag client out of my my precinct right now yeah throws him uh, out and then and walks our hero yeah so there comes murphy he's a new he's a fresh transfer over yep. from um whatever precinct he was in in a better part of detroit as it's That's implied right. metro um, south and, yeah uh, and what's interesting is um he's he's told that he tells the the captain like oh you know i, I guess they were um, moving people around because he didn't mm -hmm. request the transfer he was put there that's right. Um, and then later you get a scene with um, with Bob Morton at uh, OCP talking about mm -hmm. the, the Robocop program. And That's he's right. like, we're just looking for a likely candidate. And we've we factored in like our candidates that we think would be good for this. We've put them in the most dangerous places right. um, in Detroit. And we're pretty much just waiting for one of them to get wasted. Mm -hmm. uh, and I was like, brilliant. That's like a nice little tie in. It explains why Murphy's there. Mm -hmm. He's one of their prime candidates. And they have put him in the hot zone, hoping right. that he's going to get killed. I always saw, thought it was just rather uh, arbitrary. Like, yeah, he was transferred there, and yeah, Bob Morton, because um, when they're coming down the elevator after the presentation, and and uh, Johnson says, you know, when do we start? And then Nor uh, Morton says, as soon as some poor schmuck volunteers. So I think it was just a matter of, okay, you know, the first one to get wasted that we can we can salvage. 
Well, no, because there's actually a scene um, just slightly before that where um, Ed 209's gone ballistic on someone and killed him, which we'll talk right. about in a second. Um, okay. And that's when Morton seizes his chance and goes and speaks to the, the president of OCP. And mm -hmm. he's like, look, this thing's a waste of time. We've got this Robocop program. Um, mm -hmm. We could um, be ready to go in like 90 days. Um, mm -hmm. All we need is a, a viable candidate. We have already worked to assign potential ones to like um, high risk areas based on their personality mm -hmm. traits, based on like a bunch of data basically. Okay. Um, and he starts to give kind of an explanation. So they were already putting that in motion to get Murphy into that dangerous position and probably other guys just like Murphy who For would sure. be good candidates to make sure that they, one of them would get killed. So okay. Murphy's transfer is entirely because of OCP and, and Morton. Mm -hmm. um, okay. Because by this point, OCP is kind of in charge of the police. They've started yeah. to, I don't think they, I never quite understood what the arrangement is, but it's like they've started to privatize the police force and manage it instead of the city doing it. That's right. So they, they control like where people get sent and stuff. And so they've, they've been able to pull these strings and make that happen. But it's, it's cool. It's like, it's just a neat little, they didn't even need to explain something like that. It could have just been, well, Murphy was just unlucky. He got transferred and, and then he got killed. Never mind. But well, this way, it's like, okay, someone made that happen. You know? Well, they, they give a little exposition here in, in the scene that follows as Murphy goes into the locker room and he's talking to this other officer and they have the little back and forth of like, you know, hey, transferring in? Yep. Uh, well, why? Uh, I don't know. I think OCP is making a bunch of changes. And then yes. you see this guy wearing a towel um, and then he just goes on his little rant of like, ah, man, I tell you what we should do. We should strike. Fuck him. Yeah. So already you've got like the, the police are obviously discontent because they're stretched yeah. thin and like they're they're obviously struggling to cope with all this stuff that's going on and they, they don't particularly appreciate being managed by a private company. No. Um, what's funny as well, you go into that locker room and you see a woman just getting changed into her body oh, yeah. armor. It's just there, like completely topless. <laughs> yep, like, exactly. Uh, okay, mixed changing rooms, eh? Fair enough. Hey, I wouldn't work a, in that precinct, man. This is a progressive future, let me tell you. And well, Verhoeven was quite keen on doing this kind of thing because if you watch starship troopers it's the same oh, yeah. thing like there's the shower scene in that and it's just men and women showering together and nobody like plays drop the soap or anything mm -hmm. um it's just it's a strange kind of thing maybe, maybe like in the future nudity is just not considered an issue but yeah uh all i know is that as a young impressionable uh movie goer when i saw that scene i'm like oh wait wait what was that yeah, I think as and I were talking about this, um, 80s movies, they just had almost like a formula where it's like you've just got to get a random tit shot in. Oh, absolutely. Uh, Commando did it for absolutely no reason, but just sure. they could. <laughs> and this one does it too. Well, uh, I've heard it I've heard it said it, it's the special, it's the cheapest special effect known to man. Yes. Everyone appreciates it. Hey, Everyone appreciates it. That's right. Uh, uh, so, yeah. Murphy's there and he gets partnered up with Lewis, who's, you know, she's like a, obviously a veteran in this precinct and they're mm -hmm. going to be working together. Um, and yeah, straight away, like I think he, they get their car assigned to them and they're about to go out on patrol and um, she's about to drive, but then he just leaps in ahead of her and he's like, oh, I always like to drive when I'm breaking in a new partner. Oh, uh, that patriarchy right there. I know, I like that because see if this movie had been made now. Um, I don't know if this happens in the Robocop remake or whatever, but, um, you know, she would have taken command of that situation immediately and he would be like, oh, okay, I guess I'll sit in the passenger seat. Yeah. You know, no, uh, it's, uh, I don't, 80s, man, they're, they're just not taking any shit. It's like, I'm fucking driving and you sit there. No, they, like cha they changed up a bunch. They gender switched a lot of roles in the re remake. Uh, so Lewis, uh, they're like, they're both men. Um, and they don't have that that type of uh, banter that you see okay. in this one. So, yeah, I mean, uh, I like the the relationship between them because they're not really together for all that long. Oh, no. uh, which I think is good because Lewis, you know, obviously when when Murphy gets killed, she is cut up about it, but she's not like you know weeping for a, a friend that she's known for years or anything. This is literally right. a guy who transferred in that day, and she's only right. known him for a matter of hours. Uh, which I, I think that's fine. She almost gets to know him more as Robocop than she does sure. as Murphy. Right. Which I think is an interesting way of doing things. Um, but you do get to see them, like, you know, they have a little scene together where he's, he's twirling his gun, mm -hmm. uh, which becomes important later, but you find out that he's got a wife and a kid, and his kid, you know, is a big fan of, like, this TV show, like TJ Laser or something, <laughs> uh, which yeah. is obviously TJ Hooker, but, you know, yep. with laser guns. <laughs> hey, why not? 
Yeah. Um, but you know, it's fine. You get a good sense of who Murphy is. He's, he's, he's a family man. He's, he's a decent guy. And, um, you know, he probably would have gone pretty well with Lewis if they'd been together for longer. I think um, so. You know, he's not too, not too jaded and not too cynical yet. So that's, that's fair enough. Um, but then it flashes over to OCP, which is this, this scene is just brilliant. <laughs> Where it's like um, OCP is obviously the the big corporation that's kind of got its fingers in every pie, and they are planning to demolish most of Detroit and build mm-hmm. Delta City, which is going to be their new uh, their new shining city that's going to replace all the the crumbling old stuff. That's um, right. That's going to be great for them apparently because they'll make tons of money out of it. Um, but in order to do it, they need to get crime under control because um, I think you know their their workers won't be safe unless they do that. Uh, so the, they're having a big board meeting. Um, Dick Jones, who's like the, the <laughs> vice president of OCP, is like, ah, don't worry, I've got the, the best thing that's going to sort all crime out, and it's the ED-209. <laughs> and it's this, this fucking beast of a machine that comes well, straight like- into the boardroom, and it's like a, it's like a walking tank. Mm-hmm. Well, and again, there's uh, some really great exposition here uh, when just before the board meeting where he and uh, the CEO are chatting back and forth. And he just explains, ah, you know, what's going on with our, the police, you know, ah, the union's been bitching ever since we took over. Don't worry, we'll straighten it out. So yeah. it lets you as the viewer know, uh, you know what, you know, the OCP is in control of it. They're having some trouble, but they're going to just, you know, they're going to power on through it because uh, they just have complete control of the police. Yeah, and um, you know they're very much like, yeah, nothing's going to stand in their way essentially. Mm-hmm. Um, and you also get to meet um, Bob Morton, who's like a rival to Dick Jones. Mm-hmm. Um, he's he's like a young upstart who is ambitious, but he hasn't really had his opportunity yet. And he's bitching about Dick Jones being an asshole. Mm-hmm. Um, and you know, the, there's a bit, <laughs> there's a bit where the president of OCP gives a little speech, like you know, we're going to build Delta City and it's going to be great, and we, we're going to mm-hmm. we're going to really sort out Detroit. Um, and he absolutely goes crazy with clapping, um, yes. just like a, a total kiss ass, basically. Oh yeah, totally. It just and everyone turns and looks at him, you know, like what are you doing? And uh, that was you didn't get your cue to clap, but he's doing it because he wants to show that he's a he's a company man. Look at me, pay attention yeah. to me. Exactly, yeah, and it's just that corporate culture of like, if I kiss enough ass, then I'll get ahead, sort of thing. Mm-hmm. Uh, so, yeah, Dick Jones unveils the um, the Ed Two Hundred Nine, which comes in, and he's like, "Look, we need to, we're going to simulate how good this is at disarming people." So he gets this poor mm-hmm. schmuck to to hold a handgun out to it, and it's like, "Ah, oh, you know, you have." you have to drop the weapon. You have 20 seconds to comply. And this, exactly. this thing oh. is like the angriest machine I've ever seen. Like it growls at you. And the sound effects were fantastic. Like just the, the whirring and the clomping and the, you know, the mechanics of it. It was frightening, but also just really cool. Yeah. Cause every time, like it strides towards the table, the, the boardroom table where everyone sat and people mm-hmm. start panicking immediately and screaming mm-hmm. and, and trying to back away from it. And then it just stops. Cause like at this point it's just coming into the room to like That's right. start the presentation and they all kind of like calm down a little bit. Like, Oh yeah, yeah. We, we knew it was fine. Mm-hmm. It was just there for demonstration. Don't worry. We weren't scared. <laughs> yeah. Sure. And I just, I love the whole concept of, you know, this is a, a place of business, a corporate boardroom. And you're bringing in a demo model with live ammunition. And as we see later later on in the movie, there's a loaded gun, you know, just in a case. It's like, why do you have firearms with live ammunition in your corporate environment? That's the 80s, man. In case you need to fire someone, there's a gun there on hand. There you go. Okay. Yeah, there's probably another box with, like, just lines of cocaine ready to go. Maybe. Uh, Maybe. (laughs) We need to park this meeting up a little bit. That's right. Oh, oh, shit, man. Uh, come and get it the scorpion is <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> well predator too man honestly i could go right back to talking about that but i oh, won't okay um, stay focused yeah so that yeah so this this dude's like um oh you know you've got 20 seconds to comply and it's like well you better put the gun down so he does but it, it right. doesn't recognize it and it's like right. you have 15 <laughs> seconds to comply and then the fact- this, poor, this poor guy starts panicking and trying to yeah. escape well, like you feel bad for this guy because he's like, you know, obviously a rookie and he's just doing as he's told and he wants to be compliant and hey, look, I'm playing along. And then he just genuinely panics. 
yeah, and then people, like because he's trying to run away, isn't he? And like yeah. blend into the crowd, almost like get someone between him and it. Um, yeah. And people just keep pushing him away, like get the fuck away from me! I don't want you near me. Well, the over the top screaming that they have, like the, there's this one woman who just gives this loud shriek, yes. and it's, it's it's so over the top that you're like, calm down, lady. Uh, yeah, totally. I'm surprised she didn't like, rip her blouse open just for another like random TNA shot. That's um, true. That's true. But yeah. <laughs> Um, yeah, so he's like trying to panic in, trying to get away from it, and no one's letting him near them. Um, and then it just like opens fire on this poor guy and just yeah. obliterates him. Like we were saying earlier, like they must have gone through some amount of squibs for this this sh- movie because his entire torso just kind of evaporates. Um, blood sprays everywhere. He falls onto this table. The thing just keeps going like. Poof, 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 poof. Um, and you just see him like going like jerking up and down as like uh, more explosions happen <laughs> it's just yeah, awful yeah i'm just watching it again here like this is the uh the extended cut you know so yeah he's lying on the model of delta city just getting pulverized and yeah he was must have just been loaded with as many squibs as they possibly could put on a human body i mean that's got to hurt hasn't it like every time a squib goes off on you like you oh feel yeah it. So this poor yeah. guy must have uh he must have earned his paycheck in this movie i think so uh, but yeah, like it, it just obliterates him. Um, mm-hmm. he, you know, he's he's killed, and eventually they, they yank out all its circuit boards and it stops. Um, and it's just it's sat there with like smoke trailing from the gun barrels, and uh, you know everyone's like, oh, "Fucking hell, that that wasn't good." Um, some mm-hmm. guy even says, "Like, God, oh, get a paramedic in exactly. here." <laughs> like, I don't think you're going to be able to help this guy somehow. Yeah, he's he's gone. Dick, uh, I'm yeah. very disappointed. Yeah. <laughs> Uh, but even like, the president, he's not like, oh my god, one of our guys just got horribly massacred in front of us. He's more just yeah. like, yep, yeah, this this product is a failure. I'm pissed off at you because you haven't been able to make it work. Yep, and it's going to yeah. cost us a lot of money and set us behind. And yeah, um, Dicky here in the chat is saying CGI bloodshots will never do the same thing. No, they absolutely no, no. won't. Like squibs are the only way forward, as far as I'm concerned. I want to see sure. real stuff explode on screen. So. Uh, yeah, I love that. I love the the sheer over the top gore of it. Um, but this this is when Bob Morton uses the opportunity to to leap in because mm-hmm. obviously the Ed two hundred nine doesn't work, and he's like, "Look, we've got this other project that we've been mm-hmm. working on called RoboCop. Um, we think we could make something better than this. Um, give us a bit of time. Give us a chance to make it, um, right. and we can do it for you." And so the president's like, "Oh, okay, that's interesting." Um, you and know, then the just the the evil stink eye that uh, Dick Jones is giving him, like he's just sitting there seething, and you know it's just yeah that, that tension is established there. Yeah, straight away you you recognize like Dick Jones is not the kind of guy that's he's not going to take this line down. You know right. this this usurper is trying to take his position, mm-hmm. um, and I think like. <sighs> Morton just gives him this look um, mm-hmm. right at the end of the scene, like, ah, mm-hmm. I got one over on you, you asshole. Yeah, um, and then the, the camera pans on uh, Ronnie Cox's face. You know, he's just like, you know. Yeah. And you, you can, I think you can hear the smoke alarm going off in the in the distance, and it's almost kind of sounds like, uh-oh, red alert. Not only did we just have a traumatic experience in the bo- boardroom, but Dick Jones is now pissed. You know, yes. why, watch out, you know. So it's kind of a neat little story element. Yeah, so was, you know that this guy's obviously going to have uh, more to do, I guess, in the mm-hmm. story. Uh, then you get back to Murphy and Lewis, um, who get called out on a, um, you know, like an APB kind of thing. Um, mm-hmm. That there is a, a robbery that's taking place, and the the perpetrators are escaping, so they go after them, and that's when you get to meet Clarence Bodiker and his mm. gang, uh, I, and they're escaping in a van, kind of from a, the scene of a crime, I guess. The and his one of his lines and there was another one of my personal favorites like i just love the way he's freaking out you know you burnt the fucking money you know i had to blow the door what do you want and he's like it's as good as marked you asshole you stupid stupid asshole and yeah. like just, just kurtwood smith's delivery of that line always makes me giggle because he's like he's so angry and he doesn't he can't th- he can't even think of what to call him you're an asshole. You're a stupid, stupid asshole. And, and uh, I think that's good because, you know, when you're really seething, like, oh, yeah. you know, yeah. you don't become this, like, you know, professional lyricist. Like, yeah. words kind of escape you, and all you can yeah. do is just blurt out whatever's in your head at that moment. Exactly. And yeah, like, stupid fucking asshole. Yeah. 
<laughs> it seems quite quite appropriate. Um, and I have to say, like the casting of Kurtwood Smith in this movie was a great choice because he's not he's not really what you'd associate with like a um, a gangster type character. Like he no, doesn't no, he's not like a big powerhouse. He doesn't look like he came from like um, a rough neighborhood or anything. Like he's mm-hmm. you know he's middle aged. He's balding. He wears glasses. But um, it makes him it makes him look a little bit more cerebral. You know, sure. and it makes them more calculating, which I like. Yeah, and I mean, again, we had a steady diet of movies in the 80s where this is the token bad guy, this is the token henchman. And, you know, so you had a stereotype or caricature in your head. And so mm-hmm. now you see Kurtwood Smith and you're like, uh, he looks a little different. Can I can I trust that he's going to be a really bad dude? And he was fantastic. Yeah, he really was. He's got that sadistic edge just perfect in this. Um, but yeah, so he's... Um, he's pissed at like the guy who blew the safe and burned all the money, and then they mm-hmm. they realize that they're being tailed by the police and they can't outrun them. So mm-hmm. they they have a a shootout. They open the doors of their their truck and start opening fire. Uh, Murphy shoots back at them and he injures one of them. Uh, he injures poor Bobby. Mm-hmm. Uh, hence all the quotes in chat. Uh, he gets shot in the leg and it's like he's out of action. Oh uh, shit! Clarence, like, oh. my leg. Yeah, just like he, he, he can make it out of there, you know. He's he's hurt, but he can he can get pulled through. And they're like, uh, Leon, get him on his pick him up. <laughs> yep. Yeah, and it's like, can you fly, fly Bobby? Bobby? Clarence, no. <laughs> the, this guy obviously knows exactly what he's going to do to him. And then we get our first uh, uh, sound of Joe's laugh. Just like, yeah, it's so hard to duplicate. Of like. <laughs> Yeah, it's really like high pitched and cackling, yeah. you know. Um, but he's he's just he relishes all this stuff. He just loves seeing people suffer. Yeah. Um, and they just yeah they throw this guy at the rear doors and straight onto the the hood of the police cruiser, mm. shatters the windshield. Um, then he falls off and it delays them long enough for the gang to escape. But they're able to tail them to like a steel mill, isn't it? It's like mm-hmm. this big disused steel mill. Again, looks like a real location. And mm-hmm, for sure. It's, just, it's great. You know, it's just really run down. Like, looks like a, an absolute industrial hellhole, but that's kind of what you want in a film like this. Well, fun fact, uh, this movie was filmed in Dallas. Uh, really? Oh, yeah. And uh, for a few years, or, yeah, for a few years, my wife and I lived there. So I actually went on a field trip and visited all these places because one of the guys that I worked with was like, hey, do you want to go see the gas station that they blew up? Do you want to see the steelworks? And uh, yeah, so we got to see some of these locations. And the um, OCP is actually the da- is uh, City Hall, the Dallas City Really? Hall. Yeah. Ah, that's interesting. It's a very modern looking tower, that, isn't it? Like, I assume the real building is nowhere near as tall as like the OCP building because that's like well, 100 stories tall or whatever. Yeah, they, I mean, they composited that just like they do in uh, The Boys. Like, um, uh, the, the, what's the name of the company? Uh, uh, Vought. Vought, Vought Enterprises. Yes. That's actually um, Roy Thompson Hall in Toronto, Ontario. And then they just superimpose the big superstructure behind it. But uh, Right, okay. So they did the same thing here with, uh, with OCP. Right. Okay. Uh, yeah. I mean, it's it's a nice, big, big, imposing tower. So it's exactly mm-hmm. what you'd expect from a big company like OCP. You know, mm-hmm. it's huge and dominant. That's what that's what you would get. Um, but yeah. So Murphy and Lewis arrive at the steel mill. There's no mm-hmm. backup available, so they have to go in themselves, and they split mm-hmm. up, which seems like a, a daft idea to me because you're, I, you're up against the superior numbers. I'm just watching it again, and it's like you know what this whole splitting up and then Lewis makes the stupid mistake of trying to confront this guy and she takes Julia. her eyes off of him and then she gets punched and falls down. It's like, yeah, uh, because he's taking a, he's taking a piss, isn't he? Yeah. Like, like she stops him and he turns around. I guess he's like still hanging out there. Yeah. Um, and you know, he's like, I oh, mind if I zip up and there's this really long pause where you can yeah. tell she wants to look down. <laughs> But she doesn't. Yeah. And then eventually her eyes just go and he's like, ah, perfect. Like, knocks her the fuck him. out. Yeah. Which uh, leads yeah. me to think it, I think Murphy would have been okay if they would have just stuck together. Just saying. Yeah, I mean, they could have covered each other, um, probably. Um, you know, they they obviously have superior combat training, but then Clarence's gang has got, like, more guys. Uh, they got superior numbers and superior weapons, so it would have been a uh, been interesting firefight. Right, but um, either way, like Murphy 
has gone his own way and he confronts uh, Emil and one of the other guys. Um, they're watching this the TV show with the, I'd buy that for a dollar. Exactly. <laughs> I just love how that's a running gag throughout this movie. For like sure. that's like the one and only fucking TV show that's on, and everyone well, thinks it's the funniest thing ever made. Exactly. They have their little back and forth here about smoking and uh, their their definition of capitalism, which is an actually like just a hilarious little explanation. You know, we steal the money, but we don't get to keep the money. You know, and then Emil explains to them how they do it, and you're just like, that is so twisted, but okay. Yeah, and yeah, because he's like, why steal when you've got free enterprise? It's the same thing. You know? Yeah, exactly. And like, that's not how this works. But uh, okay, sure. And then he turns on the TV, and you got these scantily clad women with uh, a birthday cake that's shaped like a pair of breasts. Okay, yeah. it's it's so I love the because it, it's obviously so mindless, like just the dumbest oh, of yeah. the dumb humor. Um, yeah. But in the future, like everyone thinks it's the the best thing ever made, and like as soon as it comes on TV, people just instantly start laughing at it. Yeah, <laughs> it's great. Yeah. Without knowing any of the context behind the jokes, it's just like ah, yeah. it's instantly funny. It's great. Um, people, I was just looking in chat as well. The turning on the screw here says they filmed in Dallas in the summer, and they had to drain Peter Weller's sweat out of the Robocop suit between oh, yeah. takes. For sure. Yeah, I mean, why Dallas of all places, man? Honestly, like, who knows? Because I Detroit, think... Detroit's nice and far north, isn't it? So it would be fairly, fairly cool there. I would have thought. Uh, well, I mean, I grew up in that area, so I know that in the summertime, now you're dealing with oppressive humidity. Uh, so it would have been equally as uncomfortable. With Dallas, I think it was just dry heat, but just miserably hot. And yeah, poor Peter Weller. This suit was made out of latex and rubber and plastic, so he was just dying. In this they should have filmed in methyl in Scotland, man. That's an absolute mm. shithole when it's freezing. So, like, Peter Weller would have been totally happy in his Robocop suit. Sure. Okay. I mean, and it wouldn't be the most unusual thing you see in Scotland. It's like, <laughs> just a guy in a robot suit walking down the street. Ah, that's fine. It's a Saturday <laughs> yeah. night. Ah, it'll be fine. Ah, it'll be fine. Um, someone else mentioned as well, Jack Torrance here says Dick Jones's arms were way too long when he fell towards the ground right at the end. They really were. It was so off putting yeah. and weird. It was like, why couldn't you just composite the actor falling onto a green mm. screen or whatever, and then, you know, instead of doing this weird mannequin that they had, I there's, don't understand. There's a, also a couple of other really noticeable goofs throughout the movie that we can touch on when we pass those scenes. But, yeah. Uh, yeah, and most yeah. Noted, I think we're coming up on it. Uh, the scene where he punches the councilman out the window. Oh, uh, yeah, yeah. Yeah, like you can see when the camera is like following down and then it, it cuts to the news broadcast. If you look on the little screen, you can see his feet bouncing as if he had just landed on a, on an, a crash pad. So ah, it's just, right. It's just kind of funny to see that. Yeah, no, it's like little things like that. Um, but yeah, so um, Murphy takes out one of the gang members that tries to shoot him and then Emil, um, he takes him prisoner. Um, mm -hmm. But then the rest of them show up and like subdue him, and that's when Clarence mm -hmm. strides on in. Just um, your ass is mine. Yeah, um, and that's when he like pins him to the ground. And he's like, <laughs> you know, gets in real close to him, and he's like, "You probably don't think I'm a very nice man, do you?" <laughs> it's a great line. Like, it is. Yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah, like Murphy's like yeah, like you say, he says that that I think you're slime. You know, mm -hmm. it's like your classic action hero bit of dialogue. But then everyone just laughs at him and mocks him because they know how, like, helpless he is. Mm -hmm. You know, he's he's got no backup. There's no one there to help him. Mm -hmm. uh, and that's when Clarence just lays into him with a shotgun and blows his hand clean off. Well, um, before before that, while they're like taunting him, "Where's your partner? Where's your partner?" And then that's when Joe comes in and says, "Oh, she was sweet. I took her out." You know. So then Murphy, the camera, you know, zooms in on his face and he's like, "Oh shit! What happened to what happened to Lewis?" You know, so yeah. he's got that genuine concern. Yeah. Um, so yeah, they're like it, it's it's just a bad day all round for Murphy, mm -hmm. really. So the, the blows his hand clean off um, mm -hmm. again. Great bit of prosthetics there. Um, it's yeah. all practical effects. Um, then they, you know, Clarence is laughing at him and he's like, "Ah, oh, give the man a hand," mm -hmm. <laughs> you know. And they really leave him to suffer for quite a yeah. while. Oh, exactly. Uh, and then they shoot again and it blows his entire arm off this time and it's like fuck me and then they just they all open fire with their shotguns mm -hmm. and this scene just goes on and on like yeah 
fire it like round after round just getting pumped into him and i i guess because he's wearing a vest it's it protects him to some extent and that's why right. he doesn't just instantly get killed by it but right uh it's just like it's pure torture that's all they're doing to him um and he's just getting reduced to like pounded meat basically uh, well apparently uh, paul paul beerhoven he uh he admits or he says he had a real fascination with the crucifixion story of christ and so that was the analogy that he was, or the parallel that he was trying to draw here. So he really wanted to make the scene look as, you know, painful and torturous as possible. Like they wanted to symbolize the crucifixion with this particular scene. So he's just, he's in agony, he's being pierced, he's being blown apart. Um, yeah. because he really wanted to sell the idea of a resurrection as, you know, Robo Jesus, as he called it. Yeah, I can get, I can totally get what he was going for there. And if he's there to like make you feel bad for Murphy, then yeah, he absolutely succeeds because the guy's mm -hmm. um, being tortured. Mm -hmm. um, and it's, uh, again, it's one of those scenes when it was on TV, it was really shortened down. So you just, mostly it's just shots of the, the actual shotguns firing, uh, yeah, close yeah. of his face rather than showing the body getting hit again and again. Mm -hmm. uh, but it's then Bodiker um, is the one who like finishes him off with with a gunshot to the head because like he's right. still alive at that point, uh, and that's what puts him down. Then they all kind of clear out of there and escape, and that's when Lewis finds him, um, and obviously he's <laughs> there's not much left of him really. But they, oh. they, for some reason he's still alive when they bring him in on the hospital. You know they they get a medivac to take him in, um, and he and still seems to be alive at that point. And I wanted, I, I think I told you this um, before, but uh, when I was hospitalized with my accident earlier this year, that was such a traumatic experience. And, you know, they had, you know, filled me with some form of pharmaceuticals and stuff, but, you know, it was this flurry of activity. And that was what was going through my head, actually. You know, my my ribs were broken, my my lung was punctured and stuff, but I'm looking up at the ceiling and the only way that I could sort of keep a smile on my face was I was pretending, you know, I was remembering this scene. My eyes are wide open. All I see are lights, you know, flashing above me. And then, you know, a flurry of surgical people around you doing, you know, we got to put in a central line and, and whatever. So, Damn, yeah. Because if they're not like talking to you and explaining exactly what they're doing, you're going to yeah. think the worst, I suppose. Like it would oh, be yeah. pretty yeah. freaky, man. Yeah. All I know is like I had, you know, strangers all around me and they're like, can you hear me? Yes. All right. What's your name? Uh, uh, you know, and then, you know, we need to remove your clothing. And I'm like, okay, sure. Fine. And so, so things are getting snipped, cut off, x-ray machines are scanning, you know, and then I'm getting a, a tube inserted in my side. And, you know, before I know it, you know, that I'm being wheeled out of there. So it felt, it felt very much like this scene. So yeah well fortunately you turned out a bit better than murphy did um, uh yeah i don't know i could really go for a cyborg body right about now my knees hurt yeah <laughs> um <laughs> man like so yeah i mean it's it's a horrific scene but it accomplishes the aim and oh yeah sure. when you when you see him getting wheeled in you know he's um he's breathing his last basically mm. like you can hear the heartbeat thing going all erratic the doctors are working on him he's seeing mm. flashbacks to like the murder scene i think you see some flashbacks to his son and his wife mm -hmm. as well just as he yeah. fades out uh and then that's that's it he dies mm -hmm. um and the screen goes black but then it comes back a few seconds later and it's um it's in like tv view it's all pixelated mm -hmm. and you see like scientists working around him and obviously yeah. that's when they're starting to um turn him into robocop and which i what i thought that was such a great transition like it did yes because you don't need to see you don't necessarily need to see all the work that's being done you're just getting oh. to see it from his point of view and mm -hmm. you know sometimes it will go black and then it you know it'll come back again and they're further on in the process but you don't know what they're doing to him but you just mm -hmm. know like it's some serious stuff yeah like he's it establishes that he's already like the work is sort of half there because when they introduce the arm, you know, here it is, you know, 400 foot pounds. All right. Attach it to his shoulder. So obviously he's not done yet, but he's done enough where, uh, like he's conscious again. Uh, it yes. was just a great transition. Uh, it didn't need a lot of explaining. And yeah. I mean, and you see them, like they're they're doing various things to him, and sometimes mm -hmm. like you hear one of them go like he's working a screwdriver on him, and he's like ah fuck I've done it ah, wrong, and then suddenly yeah. it blanks out. You know, so obviously like 
it's a trial and error process. Yeah. Um, you see uh, Morton at one point, and they're like, "Yeah, we managed to save his arm," and he's like, "Oh, fuck that! No, we need yeah. a total prosthesis here. Yeah. Uh, lose the arm." Yeah. Um, and yeah, like just snap decisions like that. Like you're talking about a man's life, and like they're just they don't care. He's just a piece of meat to them. Well, he, he asks Johnson, like, what do you think? Well, no, he signed the release force when he, or, or well, he signed the release forms when he joined the force. He's legally dead. We can do pretty much what do we want. It's like, okay. Yeah. Lose the <laughs> yeah, arm. Yeah, so no problem. Lose the arm. Yeah. Um, you even get like a New Year's scene where every, all the scientists yeah. are partying. Um, and like one of the women kisses him on the cheek before falling on her ass. So yeah. that was a nice, totally yeah. pointless scene, but it's just funny. Yeah, but she's a, she's a drinker level of intoxicated at that point, which is awesome. She is, yeah, 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 because she, she's all like unfocused as she's coming in. <laughs> it's quite funny, um, but yeah. So eventually, he's finished, and you know, he's just got like this plastic sheet on him, and like they they whip it off, and Morton's there, like yeah. So it's my pleasure to introduce RoboCop, and that's mm. when again you don't see what he looks like. He's just walking forward. Everyone's clapping, right? Um, and it, it's good for building the anticipation. It's that classic thing of like you keep him hidden until the last possible second, but you know it's a big deal. But you see and a you're... little, you see a little glimpse of him on a side TV, and that's yes. your your uh, the audience goes like, oh, "Holy shit! Wait, what was that?" And it, it's just enough to give you a little tease. Uh, but you're right, you know, it's he's still hidden at that point. Uh, I yep. just thought it was really well shot. Yeah, absolutely. Um, it's it's a nicely done sequence that builds up the suspense and the intrigue, um, and just gives you some idea of like the, the amount of work that it takes to to do something like this, I guess, and like the extent of how they're altering him. Mm -hmm. um, and you're like, God, what is actually left of this guy that's even going to be recognizable? Mm -hmm. um, and then, yeah, it's like when you flash over to the police precinct and you actually get to see him for the first time walking in, like the big heavy thump of his boots, you know. Yep. Zzz, zzz, zzz. And, there, and there's this cool hum that's overlaid on top of it, which you don't know if that's the soundtrack or that's actually him. Uh, but it, it's just this ominous scene. Uh, where they're having this argument, like, hey, I take my order from cops, you know, and then what, and it cuts over. Was... Yeah. Um, and again, you know, when you get your first look at him, it's, it, I guess it was a challenge for them to create a, a robotic suit for Peter Weller that would mm -hmm. not would they would look effective but not look ridiculous. Um and you know, you get a sense of like it's heavy and cumbersome and he's kind of mm -hmm. like a walking tank. Um but for he sure. doesn't look, you know, too stupid. It looks like something that's quite functional for the most part. And Absolutely. I think that's that's pretty decent, you know. Um he's obviously got the big heavy walk, his arms are kind of awkward and like it's what you would expect, I guess, from a machine like that. Well, I always just appreciated, because uh, I didn't know much about Peter Weller at the time. Uh, I think this might have been the first movie that I saw. Uh, I just loved his physical acting. Uh, like, his, like, like my wife will comment on this, why she loves The Mandalorian so much. You don't get to see the guy's face, and when you have to do body acting, like emoting, uh, it really can sell the character. And I think Peter Weller, like just the way he, his pantomime and his 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 caricature and the way he carried himself was absolutely perfect, like mechanical, yeah. but he wasn't over exaggerating it. Like if you were to compare it to, I think his name was Robert J Burke or something who was in the, in the third one. And then also whoever played in the TV series, they, they tried too hard to be robot like, and it ruined it. Yes. Um, but with this one, yeah, he's, he's, he's kind of heavy and clunky, but like he doesn't, um, I, it's hard to say, but it's like he's in, at the same time he's kind of smooth. He doesn't waste any yeah. effort, like turning his head from side to side because he yeah. doesn't need to. Like it's, it's exactly how a machine would move, I guess. Like you plot sure. the most efficient path to get someplace, and off he goes. Mm -hmm. um, this, so I was just looking at chat as we're going as well. Uh, Miranda Garland here was saying, I am a repeat offender. I repeat, I, repeat, I, I will again. offend again. I take my orders from a higher. So <laughs> shut up, asshole. Shut up. Does your mother know you suck like that? But I love how yeah. even the wino is like totally shocked by the appearance of Robocop. Oh, He's yeah, like, what the sure. fuck is that? Yeah. Yeah. The whole, audio, <laughs> the whole room is stunned. And, yeah. Uh, yeah. It's such a great scene. But so that 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 gives you your first real look at mm -hmm. Robocop as he is, and uh, Lewis sees him. I don't know if she realizes like that it's Murphy 
because I don't know if she recognized him at that point, but you can no. tell that something's going on there. That like she's right. she's really like shocked by the appearance of this thing, for sure. Um, but yeah, so it that at least gives you your introduction to him. So, mm-hmm. um, you know, he's installed in the police precinct, um, and that's his chance to um, to go out on his first patrol, I guess. Um, I'm just trying to think what happens next. You get, yeah, you get that little scene where it's like, you know, he obviously has to eat to sustain mm-hmm. his like biological parts, and you get to see this horrible like paste thing that it dispenses. And mm-hmm. for some reason, Bob Morton's like friend really likes this shit. Yeah, and he's like, it, oh, it tastes, tastes like, like baby food. food. Yeah, knock yourself out. Yeah. It's like, why are you eating this? <laughs> like, but but then they give like they do their little rudimentary tests to make sure that everything is running well. What are your prime directives? Uh, you know, that's the first time you hear him speak. Well, actually, no, yeah. I'm sorry. He says, when you are at rest, you will sit in the chair. And that's the first time he talks. Yes. Uh, um, and also, um, it lays, uh, it, it sets up something that's going to happen later because his three mm-hmm. main directives are like, you know, protect the public trust, um, mm-hmm. uphold the law and protect the innocent. Mm-hmm. Um, but then it's like directive number four is classified. Exactly. Uh, yeah. And so you're like, oh, what's what's that? What could be the meaning of this? And obviously right. it's going to come into the four later, but it's like, you know, straight away there's something else mm-hmm. going on there that's going to be significant later. So again, just a nice little um, setup there. Um, people asking, how's Tatiana? She's fine. Yes. Oh, yeah. um, the Her her employment isn't as good um, at this time when everything's locked down, but uh, don't worry. I, I keep her I keep her sweet. So it's cool. Anyway, uh, moving on. <laughs> actually, if you want to grab a, a couple of super chats, uh, this uh, the scotch that I'm drinking is going right through me. So I just need to take a quick break, and I'll be right back. Yeah, no problem. I'll uh, okay. I'll get cracking on that. No cool. worries, mate. Uh, like, let me take a little look at the super chats here and the normal chats. Uh, look at that fucking gun. Yeah, that's from Pyramid Blaster. Yeah, that scene in the rifle range where you get to see um, Robocop's gun for the first time. That is an incredible machine. Like, I have no idea what kind of weapon that is. Um, I assume it's it's been beefed up as a movie prop. Like they've added a bunch of extra stuff onto it to make it bigger, but uh, it, it's brilliant. It sounds cool. It seems to be a burst fire weapon. So um, no, it's an awesome, awesome piece of hardware for Robocop. Um, okay. Native here um, for the first super chat says a good guy with a gun worthy of being Quigley's predecessor. Uh, yes, you're in luck, my friend. I've downloaded Quigley down under, so it's ready to go. Uh, you're finally going to get my impressions of it. Uh, Charles Caballero. Uh, so, my question. The trailer for Cobra Kai has an image of the legendary hawk with a bloody fist over his foe as if he smacked around Harry Styles for wearing that emasculated dress on Vogue. Yeah, Christ. I don't know if, how many people in chat have seen this, but um, yeah, Harry Styles, they put him in a dress for some reason because they, they wanted to redefine masculinity. Uh, okay. <laughs> like, Why? Uh, I mean, I'm sure he was really happy to wear that. Um, can't say I would have done, but uh, never mind. Each to their own, I suppose. Uh, yeah, I'd love to see Hawk beat the shit out of him for that. That would be nice. Um, also from Charles Caballero. Part two of my question is, do you believe that the writers will cement Hawk's place as a villain and also bring back his masculinity that he had in series one? P.S. Thanks for all, answering all my Rocky super chats. It was my pleasure. Um yeah, Rocky, the Rocky stream we did was great fun. Um, we did the first three movies, um, and we're going to set it up so we can do round two and do the the other three because it was a great laugh, and it was a great collection of, of guys to contribute, so it was really fun talking to them. Um, as for uh, Cobra Kai, yeah, I'd like to see Hawk... Um, you know, carry on as, as being kind of a villain. I think he's kind of in between. Like, he's obviously a young guy who's eager to prove himself. And, you know, that that determination can kind of manifest as, like, um, acting rashly. And then he kind of gets drawn down that path of being a bad guy. And I don't know if he'll, he'll stick with it because it's better to be a bad guy and feared than just being a, a, a nice guy that gets ignored um, in his mind. So maybe that's the direction they'll go. But, yeah. Great character, and uh, I think the actor that plays him is awesome. Um, Dominic the Donkey. I'd buy that for a dollar. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> um, excellent quote. And Street Fighter 88 says, stay out of trouble. Yeah. Good advice from Robocop. That is solid advice. Yeah. That's when he's meeting all the kids, isn't it? It's like, do you have any yeah. advice for the children out there? Stay out of trouble. What I love about, uh, again, the dialogue in this is and it harkens back to when Murphy was still human, 
is he he comes across as kind of like a milk toast kind of guy like his his phrases that he says they're just so non-threatening uh which carries over to his robocop persona yeah and he's like, like it's, um, so simple, it's not pretentious it's like i don't know how you would describe it it's like he's got this vision of what a wholesome hero is mm -hmm. you know again born out of like that that uh, TJ Laser show that he yeah, watches yeah. with his kid. Um, it's almost like he's, his whole life is trying to live up to that ideal of what he thinks mm. a hero should be. And it's like a guy who's clean cut and, you know, he doesn't swear, but he'll just yeah. like, you know, rather than try and intimidate a bad guy, he'll be like, oh, I think you're slime. Exactly. You know, like, it's the kind of like, just like you say, a really milk toast kind of threat that doesn't have any weight behind it, but it's like, that's what he thinks a hero should be like. And it's something, it's kind of endearing. Very. That very. He's trying to be something that uh, he's seen on TV and he's trying to live up to, like, his, say, his son's expectations of what a hero should be. Mm -hmm. uh, and it's, and what you find, obviously, in this movie is that that kind of, like, um, you know, golly gee whiz, like, heroism just doesn't mm -hmm. hold up to, like, this horrifying world that they're in. You yes. know, where, you know, he tries to uphold those ideals and he gets blasted apart. And, and yeah basically killed as a result and so. that's what that's what makes it so tragic yeah uh, but yeah d just his iconic line you know your move creep you know it was that was uh, like a cult line everyone loves that one but you can't replicate it ever again like you can't repeat it it's not like dirty harry saying go ahead make my day it's like it's a one-shot affair but it was really really effective i think Yes, absolutely. The, there's something about that, I guess, that combination of like mm -hmm. uh, almost like golden era heroism combined mm -hmm. with like this this cold cyborg kind of appearance of him. Mm -hmm. It's like a machine trying to emulate what it thinks uh, uh, you know a charming kind of hero should be. Mm -hmm. You know, and it's yeah, it's 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 a it's, it's a clever bit of writing, I think, mm -hmm. um, which seems so it seems so simplistic, but it's actually quite smart. The thought process behind it. Well, I think it it shows like the fact that even though he's more machine than man at this point, by him delivering little lines like that, it's it shows that Alex Murphy is still in there somewhere in a subconscious yes. level. Yeah, and it's almost like the first hints um, of him being there. Likewise, when he's on the rifle range and mm -hmm. you know he's firing with the gun, and when he finishes, he twirls it just like mm -hmm. uh, Murphy did. You know, obviously a machine wouldn't do that because there's no purpose to it. It's just like a flourish that a human would do to show exactly. off. Exactly, but that's uh, where we I, get that. That's where we get that money shot that made the entire theater gasp when the trailer, uh, when we saw the trailer. Like, I had personally, I had never seen that before. He's got a gun that retracts into his leg and then you got these cool mechanical sounds like what the fuck that was awesome yeah it, it looks good and it, it totally makes sense like yeah, <clears throat> sure why would he have a gun mounted on the outside of him in a holster mm -hmm. when he can you know he's a machine he can just like you know have this compartment set inside his own body that he can store it in so no one mm -hmm. can get to it uh great and the, the mechanics behind it like you say it looks yeah. cool it looks functional and the, the, the camera editing here, of course, you know, you totally believe what you just saw, even though, you know, that would have been a prop that they shot separately. And then, you know, because all you see is his thigh, you don't see the whole thing. Yeah. Uh, so clearly it's like, it's a fake leg, you know, mm -hmm. it's not him standing there. But like you say, when you shoot it in that way, and that's, you, you've seen him standing there, the next shot is like the leg with the, the collapsible compartment. Mm -hmm. your mind just automatically links the two together and it's fine you know there's no cgi involved it's all practical effects again yeah. so great stuff that and blood squibs lots of blood squibs yeah so many blood squibs um someone is asking in chat as well like if robocop was a female would they have boob armor uh mm. just like in the mandalorian i like to think so just to piss off everyone on twitter hey <laughs> absolutely massive massive boob armor for no reason <laughs> Because there's not even going to be boobs underneath it, but I don't care. Just to piss them off. It'd be great. Exactly. I mean, come on. <laughs> Have a sense of humor, people. Yeah. <laughs> um, so, um, yeah. Murphy then goes out on patrol. and mm -hmm. Or should I say Robocop. And I think his first guy that he brings in is like a guy robbing a convenience store. <laughs> um, yes. he's, he's in the middle of robbing it. And again, the fucking, I'd buy, I'd buy that for a dollar. Dude yep. is playing on the TV because he's always on twenty four seven. 
<laughs> well, I, I just love this whole setup. You know, it, it's this mom and pop owned convenience store. Pop is sitting there laughing at this stupid TV show and his wife is, you know, you know, obviously puts up with it. But you can tell um, she's not watching it because it's like, this is garbage. And so she, someone has to mind the store while this guy's watching this dumb TV show. Yeah. I, I think that's what is truly the most horrifying aspect of Robocop's dystopia, the fact that there's only one TV show on 24-7. Oh, yeah. It's that. <laughs> well, that, that we know of. You know, I think it just establishes that this society, there's what they call entertainment, is just so lowbrow and stupid. Uh, you know, then again, you know, not much different than what we have now. Pretty much, yeah, pretty much. So there's that, and there's endless commercials for, for stuff, which the commercials are all awesome. I love them. And just oh, news yeah. broadcasts where they clearly don't give a shit about like these horrific world events. Exactly. Know? I mean, I want to play that game Nukem that they have. You know. Me Get too, yeah, because there's buttons and stuff that you can press. You know? That's right. That's it. I'm withholding military aid. Yeah, yeah, that's right. <laughs> Nuke them. Get them before they get you. And, you're just, and then, da, 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 you know, happy music, and then that's it. You're just, wait, what? Yeah. <laughs> you know, what? This is a family game about global thermonuclear war. Okay. Yeah. Uh, it's, it's it's great. Is there not like a, a war going in an Acapulco as well? <laughs> like, that, yeah. There's, there's uh, something going on there where like separatists have seized control of it or something. That's right. Yeah. <laughs> it's and I, shit crazy. I wanted to, we were not at that scene yet, but I wanted to comment on that. Uh, when the two uh, scientists are like, you know, they're, they've got the night shift and, and Murphy is having his bad nightmare. Yeah. Uh, she, they comment on that. Uh, I just thought that was hilarious. Like the one guy says, Oh man, goddamn re rebels blew up the airport of Mexico or something. And then the, the, the female says, great. We were going there next week. And yeah. I thought, <laughs> but I thought the way that she delivered the line was so blase of like, listen, if you were going on vacation next week and you were really looking forward to it, you found out that your destination had just gotten blown up, wouldn't you be a little bit more upset? Oh, yeah. great. Yeah. This whole situation must have come about pretty quickly. Like, if she was still planning to go there on vacation, sure. uh, it must have been pretty safe. And then, like, it's now gotten to the point where, like, rebels have blown up the airport. Mm -hmm. and stuff. It's right. like, wow, that, that happened real fast. Right, you know, that, or she's got balls of steel. She's like, yeah, I'm going to go into a war zone on vacation because, man, the hotels are cheap as fuck now. Yeah, maybe. I don't know. Uh, I just thought that was a comical thing. People were saying she lives in Detroit. So, yeah, uh, true. Okay. it's probably quite hard into that sort of thing. Yeah. Ah, war doesn't phase me. I'm from Detroit. <laughs> okay. All right. I can see that. Good call. Um, I, I just like to point out as well because some people have mentioned in the Robocop arcade game. I once had the Robocop game for, I think the the Commodore sixty four. I did and too. It was yeah, legit the worst fucking games I've oh, ever played in my life. Yes. Like I couldn't even. You got. I think I got past the first level like twice in mm. all the time I played it because there was no rhyme or reason to it. Yeah, you were just shooting um, street punks over and over again. Yeah. And there was no t sense of like, well, when when do I get to the next level? Like, how many do I have to kill? I don't fucking know. Just keep going. Yep. It was so the, weird. And the sound effects weren't even the right sound effects. They were these cheap 8-bit bleeps and bloops that didn't yeah. sound anything like it. Oh, man. I hated movie tie-in games. Like, they were the worst. Mm -hmm. Same with Jurassic Park. Piece of shit. Anyway, that's a whole other discussion. All right. Yeah. Okay. I'll get sidetracked for like two hours just ranting about crappy video games. Um. Yeah, so what does he do? Yeah, so he goes out, um, he arrests the guy. Who's, yeah. yeah, the convenience store guy. Um, you know, he sees Robocop come in, he starts shooting at him with a machine gun. Obviously, it just bounces off his armor. Robocop mm -hmm. then just grabs him, or sorry, the guy tries to run away. Robocop mm -hmm. just clotheslines him, and he goes mm -hmm. flying into a refrigerator, like smashes straight through the, the glass. And then Robocop just leaves. <laughs> Yeah, which like, I love. It's like, uh, don't you just, have to arrest him or take him in or charge him or something? Nah, just well, go. Not only that, but all of the property destruction. You know, here the guy just open f opens fire, destroys half the store's inventory with the ricocheting bullets. Then he gets knocked into a display case, and you know, mom and pop are just like, okay, well, whew, great. Uh, exactly. Yeah. Insurance is going to cover this. Or Someone's questioning as well in chat. Uh, was it transmission G G B? Is the safe in the shop hidden in a stack of beer? Yeah, it is. Yes, it is. It's just totally beer, loose beer cans just stacked up around it, and it's yeah. out. It's not even behind the counter or anything. It's nope. like out in the in the shop. 
Mm-hmm. <laughs> Why? Why? Is exactly. it, isn't there a, isn't there an office or a back room or something? Oh, it's amazing. But then we get the you know the little cutaway after he disposes of the criminal. Thank you for your cooperation. Good night. And then it cuts to the TV at the right moment. I'd buy that for a dollar. And then the woman laughs. You can see her cracking a smile. Yeah. <laughs> uh, so that's his first. That's his first. Mm-hmm. Um, I was going to say arrest, but it's not. It's his first victory, I suppose. His first kill, oh. maybe. That guy yep. looked pretty fucking dead. Well, somewhere there was a crime happening, and he just stopped one. Great. Problem solved. Yeah. And then uh, I think the next one is like a woman who's getting attacked by these two mm-hmm. punks. Oh, uh, they're they're like start, they start cutting her hair off. Mm-hmm. And, like these dudes, Th- like, they are. I yeah, don't know I don't... what they're jacked up on, but man, I yeah, want exactly. some. Exactly. They are like, gonna say. Uh, they're like monkeys that have taken a combination of like cocaine and steroids. Like they're just, like, yeah, they're like sp- whooping and hollering just as they run around. Speaking voices. Yeah, it's hilarious. <laughs> uh, there's more hair down there. Ah! Yeah. You know. Oh man. Yeah, it's like they're, they're just cracking up at their own jokes. It's amazing. Mm-hmm. Uh, but then Robocop rocks up and um, one of them, like, he takes her hostage. He's like, oh, yep. I'll kill her, man. I'll kill her. And he, like, yep. I, I didn't notice this the first time around, but it wasn't until I rewatched it. He hoists her up off the ground so that she's higher than him. Because mm-hmm. then Robocop is able to fire through her dress, like, between yep. her legs. And, yep. oh, hits him right in the nuts. Um, and I guess, like, obliterates them. And you just see him drop to the ground, like you know, screaming. Uh, and you got to think, of, you got to think of how they did this scene, you know, because obviously she had a squib, probably mounted underneath her dress. Yes, uh, you know, in order to cr- in order to create that explosion. And you're just like, uh, you're a brave lady. I hope they girded your loins nicely, you know, so that this explosive device doesn't go off too close to your your privates. Indeed, yeah. Uh, this is probably a stunt woman, I guess. Okay. Um, Someone else as well, Mike Corder says, I bet you were pissed off when they shot the bottle of Jack in the convenience store. Yeah, I was. Yeah, and that yeah. was one thing I noticed. It, 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 the camera's right in close on it as well. Like You just see this bottle of Jack get shattered by stray gunfire, and I, I shed a quiet tear. It's yeah, like, all oh, that wasted Jack? Exactly. That's, that's painful. Okay. I sympathize. Yeah, I had to take a moment there. I paused it and went away. Like, punched a wall and then came back. Oh. <laughs> Um, so but yeah, like when the the woman um, is obviously you know traumatized, or she's yeah. grateful to RoboCop, so she's like, "Oh, thank you, thank, thank you. you, thank you." And he's he just goes like, "Madam, you have suffered an emotional trauma. I will notify a rape crisis center." Right, and then she like she stops, and then she kind of pulls back from him at that second of like, "Wait, what? What the hell is this?" And then the camera pans away. I thought it was a great scene. Yeah, it's uh, it's yep. It's um, it's a good reaction from her because she's clearly mm-hmm. like, you know, this is not what's uh, what she was expecting from him, right? Um, and he's he obviously doesn't care. Like he's just a machine, and he's just like, oh, input that I need to react upon, right? But it also just goes to show like the the purity of his character, like whether this is RoboCop or Alex J Murphy, who's got this strong sense of duty and honor and respect. It's like he he's by the book kind of thing yes. so very straight laced so it comes across as funny but also endearing i think yeah yeah i think so um and so that that kind of shows you that he's now out there fighting crime and he's mm-hmm. you know he's he's doing well i suppose like he's mm-hmm. able to perform his duties um and his his kind of enhanced abilities allow him to do things he probably couldn't have done it as Alex Murphy, you know, when he can target people, mm-hmm. you know, shooting through the dress, all that sort of thing. He couldn't have done that before, but now he can. So you sort of see like, well, there is a, a potential to Robocop. Like they have successfully managed to take the, the best of both worlds, like mm-hmm. man and machine and put them into this thing. And I would just like to, as a commentary, I appreciate his method of law enforcement. I'll tell you, we've had some situations in my home city here where this this could have solved a lot of issues. Yeah, just send in like a, a squad of Robocops and then you're good exactly. to go. Hey. Uh, I, I I think then the scene kind of switches over to OCP because mm-hmm. um, now 
Bob Morton is like a rising star and he's mm-hmm. all full of himself and he's yep. like in the corporate restroom because he's been promoted. <laughs> you know, you need a special access card to get in there. And he's Yeah, that banter back and forth is so good. Yeah, and they're standing there and they're, he's taking a piss and he's like mm-hmm. shooting his mouth off to the, the dude beside him. And he's like, mm-hmm. oh yeah, the guy's trying to warn him like Dick Jones is coming after you, man. He's pissed. And he's like, yeah, Dick Jones is old, like, and you know, he's um, he's got this killer reputation, but it's all just bluster. Like, he's yeah. useless. Um, he's a total dick. And so, um, he's old. We're young, and that's life. <laughs> exactly. And they're laughing, and then you just see everyone in the the, the place start to get worried, and they start oh. to like clear out of there pretty quickly. Um, and you hear Actually, a toilet flush, and then that's when Jones appears. <laughs> Well, we just skipped over the scene where he, the third thing that he stops is the uh, guy taking the politicians hostage. Oh, shit. Yeah, I forgot yeah. about that one. I thought yeah. that was later, actually. Nope. After he uh, rescues the, the woman, it cuts to him driving down the street, and then he shows up at this hostage standoff. And that's where we get introduced to the, uh, whatever, the, the police captain here who just loves playing it up for the camera. Uh, yeah. Um so that's when he's trying to negotiate with this this councilman who's taking mm-hmm. the mayor hostage, mm-hmm. um, and that's when you get the the blow punked line, you mm-hmm. know, because the guy's like, <laughs> it's like Murphy's like, oh, I'm going to go in there. You just keep him talking. Just so keep him. Like, oh, okay. So yeah, he's clearly like, okay, well, what's your demands? We'll just agree to anything you want, just to like get you get you on side. Um, and the guy's like, I want a recount, and no matter yeah. how it goes, I I want to win anyway. I want my old job back, and I yeah. want the city to pay for it all. Yeah, he's like, I want a bigger office. I don't want a new car. Yeah, what kind of car, Miller? I don't know. Something with reclining leather seats that goes really fast and gets really shitty gas mileage. Yeah, and in short, he needs the six thousand SUX. He damn well, he damn well does. Which is funny because it really looks like a piece of shit. Like it's so oh, it's chunky and and old and outdated. Definitely, they had a contract with Ford for this movie because you know the police off the, the uh, squad cars are Ford Tauruses, and the uh, six thousand SUX just looks like a, a shoddily clad Ford Thunderbird of the time. Yeah, oh, it's so cool. It's it's like yeah, again, just like I guess a, a movie on a budget. It's like what can we do? We'll just take a car that's kind mm-hmm. of big and chunky, and we'll make it even more so. Uh, mm-hmm. And it's yeah, it's the the fact that it's the six thousand sucks <laughs> like. It's great. It's just hilarious. Just humor like that was just so funny. So uh, yeah, Robocop bursts through the wall, um, mm-hmm. pulls this guy through, um, and then just punches him straight through a window. And that was like you were saying earlier. You get to see him land, mm-hmm. um, and his feet kind of bounce up and down like he's landing on a crash mat. Oh yeah, for sure. But even going further, like this, this was the one camera angle that really bothered me because when Robocop punches him, like gives him the right hook or right cross or something, he very clearly misses his face by inches. Like you can, so you can see it. And so it was an odd camera choice. They should have shot it at a slightly different angle. I mean, I can understand why he pulled his punch so far back because well, for sure. that, that prosthetic that he's wearing, um, mm-hmm. it's going to be like, you know, I'm sure it's rubber or something, but like you really wouldn't want to get hit by it because there's probably exactly. like plastic or metal in it somewhere. I just think that, you know, for the sake of hiding it, you know, they could have shot it at a different angle, but uh, yeah, it, it gets the point across. But I also love the the satire here of, or just the commentary as he flies out the window. You see all of the news cameras trail, like following him down because they want to get every shot of it so they yeah. can put it on their sensationalist news that night. I I just keep thinking about that that um, what's his name Pope from Predator Two again, like mm, same yes. kind of deal, like action yeah. news. Yep, <laughs> hardcore, live, and in your face. Yeah, like, oh, God days hell down here. Yeah. <laughs> I love that movie so much. It's great fun. Um, but yeah, so let that's um, again, Robocop's able to save the mayor from a hostage mm-hmm. situation. So damn, mm-hmm. he's doing he's doing great. Yeah, um, and obviously because he's doing so well, um, what's his name? Morton is getting showered with um, success. Because yes. of this, you know, he's taking all the credit for it. Um, and as I was saying earlier, he's getting all full of himself, and then mm-hmm. he's in the corporate restroom, and that's when Dick Jones, I guess he was in there taking a shit, and he just yep. happened to overhear all of this where where um Morton's shooting his mouth off. And I love how the dude next to him um is like, Oh, I gotta be going, I've got a meeting to mm-hmm. get to, and he zips up and you can see yep. that he's got a piss stain down his trousers. Oh, to use a clip. <laughs> 
to use a classic drinker line there, uh, I think I might have pissed myself. Yeah, <laughs> but it's like that's a great way of showing like how desperate he is to get out of there. For he's sure. like still midstream, and he's just like, "Oh fuck mm -hmm. it, I need to go need to get out." Yeah, um, and you get like uh, yeah, a good scene with um, with Dick Jones and Morton where Dick's like, you know, the you've you've really screwed things up for me. Mm -hmm. Like you've disrespected me, and this the Ed two hundred nine thing was going to be a huge money maker, and you know you better watch your back, basically. Well, I just uh, loved his whole little monologue that he gets there. He goes like, "I remember when I was a young executive for this company. I used to call the old man funny names, Iron Butt, Boner. Once I even called him asshole, and yeah. just the, like the delivery there." was like, oh, you used the word asshole. Yeah. <laughs> uh, Silver Sailor here says, uh, better to piss yourself than get cornered by Jones. Uh, I would mm -hmm. be I'd be inclined to agree because mm -hmm. it would just send someone out to, to whack you. Um, but that hadn't been established yet. Like we weren't. No, like, no. That... Like Morton was arrogant because he didn't think, oh, you know, what's the worst that can possibly happen to me? You know, like maybe I'll get a tongue lashing in the bathroom. No one's going to come and kill me. Uh, and you don't know that Dick Jones is capable of doing that yet because it hasn't been established just how far he'll go. Yeah. Well, his his threat is almost based on what's going to happen in the future because he's saying to him, like, look, you know, the, the president of the company is, like, on your side, but he's mm -hmm. an old man now and I'm number yep. two and it's only a matter of time until he retires and then what yep. do you think is going to happen? So yeah. the, the threat is man. already there. Yeah. yeah. But it's, like, obviously at this point in the movie, you don't know that he's capable of acting on it like mm -hmm. here and now, basically. Mm -hmm. So um, I think even there, though, um, you know, Morton is intimidated by him because mm -hmm. you can For see sure. he's scared. Um, and he's trying to he's trying to put on this front. He's trying to put on the bravado. But really, he's like shitting himself because yep. this guy is like, this is the vice president of the company and he's pissed mm -hmm. at you. So, um, yeah, good scene, but it establishes like what's going to happen next, I mm -hmm. guess. Um. And uh, I'm just trying to remember where we go from there. So there's probably it goes back to Robocop again. Yes, he's he's back from his his patrol and he's yep. in sleep mode. Yep. I guess. Yep. And this is where he has his little dream. Yes, uh, that's when he, he dreams about being shot um, and what happened to him is Alex Murphy basically. And so he wakes up all of a sudden and mm -hmm. storms out of there. Um, the, the scientists are all like, you know, Oh shit, what the hell's happened mm -hmm. to him? He shouldn't, he shouldn't be doing this. Um, he runs into Lewis who does recognize him now. And that's when she does that, that thing where she kind of looks around and there's no one mm -hmm. there. And she's like, Oh Murphy, it's you. Mm -hmm. And again, that causes him to like have more of a, a recollection. Um, and so he storms out of there um, I guess like he's he's going to go out and try and find answers to what happened to him. He's going to try and track down the people who um, who killed him. And again, and, uh, sorry, I'm just watching the scene right now where he's having his little uh, nightmare here. And this is again the 80s. And as we pointed out in Predator 2, like this is supposed to be the future. And we're looking at all of this high tech equipment. We've got cathode ray televisions. Yeah, uh, large push buttons, oscilloscopes, you know, everything is just so really like you think that's the kind of tech we're going to have in the future. All right. I think I, I'd said to you um, when we were watching Predator 2, mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. it was like one of the things that they did back then to make it look futuristic was they just put TVs in random places showing yes. like inconsequential stuff. Yeah, like there's sure. a bit in the the locker room in mm -hmm. the police precinct where like there's a TV just overhead and it's just got mm -hmm. like a schematic like a computer schematic of one of their patrol cars. Mm -hmm. It's like why? Well, oh, <laughs> what exactly. Was to tell anyone? Oh, okay. It's this just, looks like the future to me. Yeah, it's just like vector graphics, and it's like, oh, th this looks cool. It's like got technical stuff on it. Like, mm -hmm. yeah, fuck okay, it, just play that on a loop. It'll be fine. It looks futuristic. Yeah. Um, but it's uh, yeah the. Like you say, that they've got like CRT televisions. They've got like um, paper printouts of his like okay. mental state, where it like starts vibrating more and more as uh, as he gets more um, agitated from his dream. Um, yeah. So yeah, just all like retro futurism almost. Exactly, and it's like almost low budget in a way. Yeah, but I guess it's the technology they were working with at the time because they wouldn't have had really an alternative to it. For sure. 
but it works. It, it gets the point across, I guess, of like how disturbed he is, and then mm-hmm. it just suddenly goes calm again. Like, oh, he's woken up, and now he knows what he's going to do. Mm-hmm. Um, so he goes out, and um, that's when he goes after Emil, I think. Uh, let's see. He interacts with Lewis, and then, yeah, then because uh, Emil's Mort- bro- busy robbing a gas station, isn't he? Yeah, Morton comes in, chews them out, and then Lewis says, "Sorry." Sorry, sir, I fucked up. Ah, yeah. Don't worry about it, kid. This guy's a serious asshole. Uh, so that just lets you know that police chief has her back. The police stand together. They don't care about OCP. Yeah. Uh, the hell with that. But yeah, you're right. Next thing is the <clears throat> gas station. Yeah. So again, Emil's there. Um, like, there's just it's a late night gas station. So the guy mm-hmm. working there is like a college student just trying to do some studying, and like mm-hmm. he, he just comes in, knocks on the glass with his with his submachine gun, mm-hmm. and he's like, "Hi, I'm here to rob your your, your station." Yeah. Um, and he's like, uh, he's making fun of him while he's doing it because he's yeah. like, "Oh, what are you, a college, college boy? boy? You yeah. think you're smart? You think you can outsmart a bullet?" Yeah, it's. I mean, you could go on for hours talking about the kind of socio-economical interplay here yeah you know, the, the, this here's this poor guy who is trying to better himself he's going to school he's an educated guy but he's powerless against this uneducated thug with a gun yeah and so the balance of power and well, yeah uh, and i like how he, he gases up his bike as well mm-hmm, for sure because he can it's like well, yeah uh, might exactly. as well while smoking a cigarette, which is like, dude, what are you doing? Yeah, uh, 80s, no one gives a shit. Smoking yeah. in gas stations, it's fine. Yeah. Nowadays, it's you're not even time. supposed to use a cell phone there. Like... Absolutely. Like, geez. Yeah, anytime I fill up my bike, it's like, you got to be so careful not to spill fuel all over yourself. And you got to, it, it dribbles. And the last thing I'd want is a cigarette hanging out of my mouth. But yeah, maybe, maybe I don't know how to be, live dangerously like Emil here. Yeah. Um, oh yeah, well he he he's the kind of guy who who lives fast and dies young, isn't he? That's right. Um, well then, uh, yep. Then Murphy shows up here, and they have I, this I, yeah train. yeah. So he's like, oh, dead or alive, you're coming with me, and that's what mm-hmm. um, clues him in. Like, oh, this mm-hmm. is the guy that we we it met before, and he's like, oh, we killed you, you're dead. Mm-hmm. And that's uh, again triggers another memory for Murphy, so he kind of stops mm-hmm. in his tracks while this guy's shooting at him. Um, he bursts open the gas hose. Mm-hmm. Um, gets on his bike, drops his cigarette on the ground to like ignite the gas, and then just t- hightails it out of there. Um, and you know the gas station just kind of engulfs Murphy in flames, but doesn't hurt him obviously because he's armored. Um, and and I'd, he... like to, I'd like to point out that this is the this is future gas because I've never seen gas lines that are clear and gasoline that's pink. So yeah, exactly. I, I, don't, I don't know what this is, but uh, it looks futuristic to me. Future gas. Future gas, yeah. Um, but yeah, so Murphy like shoots his bike. That like, It's a great scene as well because he shoots the bike, damages the engine, the guy loses control, skids out, mm-hmm. hits a car, and mm-hmm. just goes flying right over the handlebars. Like, this is a high-speed crash. Like, exactly. I've watched this scene so many times. I'm like, how did they do this? Like, oh, that impact is like, ouch, that is so painful to watch. It yeah. ranks up. It ranks up there with the opening sequence of John Wick Two when he uh, takes out a guy on a motorcycle. I'm like, ow. Oh. Well, remember, um, remember in Mad Max Two, there's a scene kind of like this where it's near the end with the big chase scene with the gas tanker, and one mm-hmm. uh, one guy, um, the he's on a bike and they they push him to the side and he hits like an obstacle and it, you get this slow motion shot of him like he hits it, goes flying over the handlebars and he just goes like Rah! towards mm-hmm. the camera. Okay, uh, like just cartwheeling through the air, like that was a legit real stunt they got done, and the the guy actually got seriously injured from doing that. Um, but they kept it in the movie just because it was such an incredible shot. Wow, uh, okay. and it just kind of reminded me of that. Like it's yeah. just uh, brilliant. Like obviously now it would be done with with probably a combination of stunt men and CGI to keep it safe. Uh, but like, well, it, it would be all CG, I think. Yeah, but yeah, you, uh, props to stunt people that. You know, I just put their lives on the line literally for for our entertainment. Yeah, uh, people in chat saying here, yeah, the Mad Max Two stuntman flew over for real. Uh, yeah, and and he was seriously injured. Um, incredible stuff. I'm just trying well, to remember that scene. Uh, the only one I can think of is like, I guess, was it the Night Rider or the Toe Cutter, 
when they come over the hill and he hits the truck or is that a different, different so it's yeah. it's the you know right at the end where it's the um I'm just trying to, yeah, I'm trying to, like, because there's a big long chase scene where, like, the, the tanker's cruising along, there's various, like, guys in buggies and stuff um, yeah. on either side of them, and the, <clears throat> there'll be times when they, like, push them to either side, um, mm -hmm. or, like, they'll maybe shoot the driver and, like, the car will veer off to one side, and I think there's there's, there's just one moment where there's a biker there. Um, I think it's even... Um, he tries to, like, shoot out the tires of the, um, of the gas tanker like he's got like a, a gun attached to his wrist and he gets in too close and it like um disrupts him like it okay. ricochets off the wheel as it's moving um, and he doesn't see this obstacle coming hits right into it and then just goes straight over the handlebars okay. i think anyway um, i just, would need to watch it all again i just remember that particular scene really sticking in my head i'm just scrubbing through it right here and yeah this is a really intense scene um okay yeah this is oh, so much destruction Oh, there it is. <laughs> Holy, yeah. Dude, yeah. Guy on a motorcycle. He hits uh, the dune buggy that flips over. And ah, he, right. he just, one, two, three. Three full body flips through the air. Yeah. Uh, that's amazing. All right. I mean, it's great that they caught that on camera because, For like, sure. a scene like that, you, you couldn't do it twice, basically. Yeah. Okay, that was great. Uh, let's try that again. Uh, no. Yeah, it's like, no, well, six months from now, once I've yeah. like recovered from like breaking ninety percent of my bones, they, oh, I'll give it another yeah. go. Why not? Yep. Call central casting. We need another thug. Yeah. <laughs> um, but in this one, anyway, um, okay. Emil goes over the the bike. Um, yeah. He gets injured. Murphy's able to take him in um, mm -hmm. and arrest him. Um, and I think well, then he's. Well, no, he leaves him there. Like first, he asks him, "Like who are you?" And then he just drops him, and then that's when he heads back to the police station. Right. Okay. Uh, and he's obviously recorded that guy's voice, and mm -hmm. he's got his image on screen so that he can then mm -hmm. put him through the the facial recognition system. And I just love his his input device. Yeah. You know, nowadays sure. he would have a USB connector, but now he's got this fucking huge metal spike that just comes out of his his hand. Yep. It's, like, it's the most intimidating fucking peripheral you could ever imagine um, because some guy tries to stop him like, oh, you can't um, you can't Cecil. come in here. You're not allowed to be here. And Murphy just turns around, holds his hand up, and this thing just like shoots out of his hand. It's, uh, it's brilliant. Good old Cecil. <gasps> yeah. yeah. He looks at it. Yeah. And you're like thinking, what was the design uh, thought behind this? Why is his interface this huge spike? in his his hand i don't yeah. know looks cool well it's obviously um it's going to be relevant right at the finale of the movie exactly. but yeah. it, it just again it, like it establishes it here as a thing that serves mm -hmm. a purpose um and that's yeah fair enough it's it's kind of like r2d2 where you can plug oh. into things like it's the same thing you just shove your hand in and turn it certain ways to input data i guess mm -hmm. uh, but yeah so the, he's able to get the other members of clarence's gang from this like it right. matches up the guy um and that's i think when murphy goes out on his um like revenge spree against all the different dudes because he goes to like, like a nightclub where one of them is so that he can well arrest I, that guy i think the first thing he does is he sees his home address and oh is that at this point yeah because he's like looking at all of these things and he finds clarence boddicker recognizes his face and then sees suspect murder of alex murphy and then oh he, yes he hears uh lewis's voice in his you know it superimposed over his the sound there and yeah. uh so she he sees oh geez who's this guy is that me uh, let me go investigate yes and he goes around his old home um yep. and it's just empty Mm -hmm. um, and it's quite a good scene because you get to see him remembering the place and remembering yeah. his family. Um, and one thing I like about this film is that his family are never actually in it in nope. the present day. Like all he sees them are memories. Mm -hmm. uh, and I, I think that's that's kind of good because it would make sense that they would move on. And I, mm -hmm. I don't think you would really want to see him interacting with them as he is now. Like he's kind of, he's moved beyond that. Um, but it, it's like a, a moment of like, He's almost trying to reconnect with who he was yep. as Alex Murphy, but he, he just sees flashes of memories. Um, and then, yeah, he, he punches the shit out of the virtual salesman that's there. <laughs> exactly, which is so high tech. You know, we don't <laughs> yeah. need people anymore. We just have your virtual salesman. 
Yeah. I like how the place is up for sale and like there's yeah. like smashed stuff lying everywhere and yeah. Like it's it's odd. It's like there's stuff that's been burned in the sink in mm-hmm. the kitchen. Like I don't know what that was meant to what that was meant to show us. Like, like maybe the, they left in a hurry or in like in the future people just don't care about presentation, you know, maybe because there's no person there guarding it, you know, maybe people were squatting in the house through a party, you know, left their shit behind. Yeah, I'm not sure. Okay, um, but either yeah, I'm not I'm not sure what they were trying to because it was his possessions, and it's almost mm-hmm. like she burned them before she left. Mm-hmm. Like she wanted to get rid of all the memories of him, but like fuck knows why you'd do it in your kitchen. Like mm-hmm. you go into the yard; <laughs> it's the better place to do it. But um, yeah, someone's saying I always assumed it was a squatter. Uh, maybe yeah. it was. Yeah. yeah, they 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 left the rest of the place fairly tidy, so I don't know. Yeah, there's like discarded. Um food containers on the counter and this and this is where he finds the photograph that he took uh, yes so again more memories yeah uh, and he sees the the tj laser guy mm-hmm. um with his son so yeah it's it's him recognizing that alex murphy was a real man and it was him yeah. and that clarence's gang murdered him and now yeah. he's out for revenge yeah. you know it, it's now gone from just being him upholding the law to i'm going to kill them Mm-hmm. Or I'm going to bring them in and, and take these guys down. So that's when he goes out um, to go after the rest of them. And I think he, he does go to the nightclub next, doesn't he? He does, yeah. Where, where one of the, the gang is partying away. And man, this place is wild. Like there's it a is. woman, like you just see it briefly, but it's like, again, another tit shot where a woman's mm-hmm. just dancing topless <laughs> in the middle of the dance floor. And she's not like a, a stripper or anything. She's just she's just a patron because that's that's how things roll in this club. And there's a, a cameo of Paul Verhoeven in there as he's one of the people on the dance floor dancing. Um, oh, is he? Yeah, like uh, apparently in this scene, he was trying to get these extras, you know, party, this is a party, have fun, do this. You know, so he, the, the cameo that he does was his direction. Like he, this is how he wanted people to, to act. And since they weren't doing it, he just said, fuck it, I'll do it myself. And then they included it in the movie. Ah, all right. So it says here, actually, the guy who catches his gun and dances mm-hmm. around, that was Paul Verhoeven. Uh, okay, let me just see. If it is, that's cool. No, uh, no, that's a different guy. Uh, Paul Verhoeven is coming up. After he tries to kick him in the nuts, there he is, right there. The, the dancing, crazy, frenetic guy that you see right in front of your face in the camera, that's Paul Verhoeven. Ah, okay. So first, is- Leo... Yeah, I, I can tell you. Garage. I can tell you as well from experience. Like, um, see when you shoot scenes like this in a nightclub, mm-hmm. uh, ninety nine times out of ten, there's no music of any kind playing. Mm-hmm. It's completely silent. Yeah, um, and you've got to dance and pretend like you're dan- Like, there's like absolutely banging music pounding mm-hmm. out. Mm-hmm. Uh, and it's just the most awkward, cringeworthy thing imaginable. Because like mm-hmm. normally, like when you're in a nightclub, like obviously the music's so loud you can't even speak, and mm-hmm. like you're usually completely wasted. So like oh, you I dance care. like a moron and you just don't care. Um, but like to try and do it stone cold sober in like the middle of the day with absolutely no sound, it's the strangest experience. Oh, for sure. Yeah. Um. But yeah, it's 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 weird. But yeah, it's cool that Verhoeven got a cameo. Um, yeah. And I love the topless woman. Perfect. I want to go to that nightclub. Hey, what? Um, Who says you haven't? Isn't yeah. That, like, works. I don't know. Well, yeah, that's not that's not strictly a nightclub though. Mm, okay. All right. All right. No questions. Um, but also, yeah, I love the fact that this dude who's partying there is clearly like forty years old easily. Oh yeah. <laughs> yeah it's like, it's like oh, you're a bit old for nightclubs, mate. Uh huh. Like yeah. Okay. Let's just but roll that's, with it. that's the power of cocaine, you know. So you can which do anything. We, which we then cut to in the very next scene. Indeed, yeah. Um, speaking of people that are too old for this, like, yeah, Bob Morton is partying away with a pair of hookers mm-hmm. who are way too old <laughs> to be doing this stuff. Exactly. I mean, yeah, they're fine for the eighties, but like, sure. man, they they do not. They're not young women. Put it that mm-hmm. way. <laughs> it's, it's just a really strange scene. It's like, oh man, you're a rich executive mm-hmm. that you could. This was the best they had for you. Yep. I, I don't know, couple, man. Could have done better. 
Well, I, I just, I mean, did you see that video clip that I sent you the other day of explaining the whole yes. thing? Yes. Oh. Just, just for context, guys. So, um, yeah, like he's partying away with these hookers and he's snorting cocaine out of their cleavage, which we've all done. It's it's the way to do it. Um, it's a rite it's, of passage, you know. It's it's how you party eighties style. Um, but then Bodiker arrives, shock horror, um, mm -hmm. and his first thing when he, he comes in, he gets Morton at gunpoint and he just goes, "Bitches, leave." And as, as Danquish was saying there, he'd sent me a video clip, which is like an interview with the actors involved. And um, Kurtwood Smith was saying that uh, when Paul, Paul Verhoeven was directing this scene, like English is his second language. And he didn't quite realize that bitches is like kind of an insult. Um, and so he kept referring to the girls who were doing this scene as just bitches. And so um, they would shoot the scene and he'd be like, ah, yes, well done. Excellent performing bitch, performance, bitches. Um, do you think the bitches should leave now or should they, they protest a little? And then they go. And then they're like, uh, I, I don't know. They should probably just go. Like, he's got a gun. He's like, oh, okay. Okay, so bitches leave. Uh, right, round okay. of applause for bitches. They yeah, did but, great. That's a wrap on the bitches. Thank you, bitches. You know, it's yeah. <laughs> so hilarious. Because we just found it so funny because it's like, I don't think he was being, like, he was trying to be nice. Like, I don't think he was being insulting or disrespectful. He just didn't know that that was a pejorative term. So yeah. just the context of it, it's like you would just be sitting there cracking up. And then knowing that, uh, Kurtwood Smith having to do this scene, you know, the final, you know, this is the take that they're going to use. I, I wonder if he, how hard it was to keep a straight face to deliver the line after that point. Oh, totally. Yeah, it must have been wild, man. I just, yeah. I'd love to be in a Paul Verhoeven movie. <laughs> Seriously, yeah. Like, how many, <laughs> how many takes do you have to, to do? I know. Uh, but it's good because it's like, they would leave obviously mm -hmm. in a situation like that he's got mm -hmm. like their their host at gunpoint and mm -hmm. um, one of them even is like oh you're gonna call me bob? yeah yeah it's like i'm sorry Gee, bob you're gonna call me later Gee, like, bobby, I, I, bye are you yeah. gonna call me the other one's like come on let's go let's go yeah it's like the dude's got a gun to his face yeah, like, yeah. I, don't, I don't think bob's gonna be calling you anytime soon put it that way uh, well uh, just Doing hard lines of coke here on the table. Uh, yeah. yeah. <laughs> and um, yeah, so Clarence uh, shoots him multiple mm -hmm. times in the legs. Like he just does not let up with this shit. Yeah. Um, again, just totally over the top movie. He doesn't just shoot him once, it's like four or five rounds into his legs. Good old um, use of squibs again. Yeah, totally. Um, and he's got himself a DVD with him. For um, sure. I, I, I guess this would have just been like a video CD or something back then because yeah. DVDs didn't exist. But mm -hmm. yeah, it's cool that they got it. That probably would have been cutting edge, man. And I'd also like to point out, as you said about multiple TVs, like in the corner of his living room, he's got three 27-inch uh, TVs stacked on top of each other. So that's how you know that he's successful. Like, look yeah. at how many TVs this guy has. His whole, um, his whole like sound system area, it's like... Mm -hmm. Something you would find in a professional um, audiovisual lab, mm -hmm. like there's there's control panels everywhere. There's like, you know, CD trays. There's DVDs. There's like um, old kind of like spooled cassette tape players. Like everything's there. Like yeah, how, for sure. Like, and this this dude takes his like entertainment seriously. Oh yeah. Um, but yeah, it's like what would you if you were a young executive and you know you just made it big what would you do it would all go on cocaine and and, oh, okay. hook, and right. hookers that were way younger than those ones you know okay. <laughs> like, fair enough fair enough all right like, they should probably be under 40 at least mm. um hey that's yeah hey, uh, yeah you, you, you better think about what you just did you're gonna get doxxed and set on there's, fire well you know there's something to be said for experience maybe um people point out it was laser disc that you had um i thought laser discs were bigger i thought yeah. they were like almost like um LP size, they were huge. They were they look like twelve inch um, singles, yeah, uh, like pressed records. I like the fact that if you got a movie on them and it was longer than about ninety minutes, you had to have two, and then you oh, had to swap them over. <laughs> well, that, <laughs> Who, whoever thought that was going to take off. And then, like speaking of which, like, geez, do you remember when video game? Yeah, uh, video games had to be spread across multiple discs as well. I remember uh, it well. Final Fantasy yeah. VII came on three discs. 
Oh, I when I first discovered Resident Evil 4, I specifically bought a GameCube just for that title, and it came on two discs. And it's like I played it so many times, so I had to constantly be swapping the discs back and forth. Yeah, that's what you had to do, kids. You had that's to, right. You had, to swap, you had to swap discs halfway through. You'd get to a point in the game, and it'd be like you just get this loading screen. It's like, please insert disc two. Oh, mm -hmm. fucking hell. Yeah. And these were in the days before uh, DLC, so you know your games had to had to be had to have a finite amount of memory allocated to them. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Yeah, because on a CD, you only got like 800 megs, so that ain't much. That's not That's much right. space to play with. That's uh, all you get. Yeah, oh, that was great. Technology was awesome <laughs> back then. Um, but that's when... So Clarence uh, subdues Bob, shoots him several mm -hmm. times, puts the disc in. It's like, oh, what's going to appear? And then all of a sudden, it's Dick Jones that appears on the screen. Shock, horror. He's been mm -hmm. working with Clarence the whole time. On multiple um, TV screens. you know. Multiple, wow. yeah, he's everywhere. And so, yeah, he's like, uh, well, I had a feeling you'd be like this, Bob, on your knees begging. Mm -hmm. Well, you know, um, too bad you've you've insulted me, and you know you've you've cost me too much. So I'm going to have to take you out. Mm -hmm. um, and it's yeah, it's it's a good little speech he gives. It's like it helps if you think of this as a game, Bob, and I'm cashing you out. That's right. Every game has a winner and a loser. And then yeah. I love this, this high tech grenade that uh, Clarence puts down on the. On the table here i just i'm freeze framing it and i'm looking at it and you can very clearly see where the prop department just slapped cheap pieces of plastic over top of a actual grenade to make yeah. it really high tech yeah and and, and a, an lcd counter on it as well because mm. you know that that definitely is the sort of thing you'd need on a grenade Absolutely. Like, if you throw, throw it at your enemy and they can just look at it and see like oh i've got a few seconds i can chill for a bit before i have mm -hmm. to move but but also again a, a nod to kurtwood smith here uh, the menacing way that he pulls the pin out with his tongue. It's just like, yeah. uh, that's creepy, but, you know, sinister. And yeah, he's, he's making love to the grenade. He's just having exactly. a great old time. Yeah, I like that. Um, so, yeah, it blows up Morton. So he's he's out the mm -hmm. picture now. He's gone. Um, and such a shame because uh, it's Miguel something, isn't it? What's his surname? Miguel Ferrer. Ferrer, yeah. The, the actor is great. I really like him. Um, He's, he's always good in everything he does. Mm -hmm. um, but he's gone, so it's now then back to uh, Murphy, I think. I'm just trying uh, to I'm trying to remember what where we get to next in the movie. So um, he's now dead. Um, yeah, so then it goes to the cocaine factory. Oh, yes. Awesome. So, yeah. Um, Clar uh, Clarence is there to make a, a deal with like a cocaine supplier, um, mm -hmm. and they're they're fucking around with each other. And Clarence mm -hmm. is trying to like lay down the law because he's like king of the hill, I guess, yeah. in Detroit. Um, the guy, <laughs> there's a really weird bit where like the guy's got a glass of wine that he's walking around with, and Clarence yes. just dips his fingers into it and snorts yeah. it. Yeah, like, well, that, no, that's you, a... you don't snort wine, mate. <laughs> yeah, exactly. I don't want to fuck with you, Sal. And then he snorts his wine. Yeah, and then the guy drinks the wine. It's like I'm not yeah. drinking that. Your fucking hands have been in it, man. Yeah, man. <laughs> uh, but that's that's when Robocop bursts in, and mm -hmm. um, again another big shootout where nobody thinks to shoot Robocop in the face. It's always just the mm -hmm. chest and stuff. Um, and yeah, there's one dude who I don't know if you notice it. Like the, in the background, he gets his gun out and knocks over a bunch of like vials of cocaine that just spray all over him. Mm -hmm. So he's like pure white. He's covered in cocaine. And yep. it just it really made me think of the scorpion. From, from, exactly. Uh, Predator yeah. Dude, like be careful. You got a lot of product around here. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, you would like, if you're going to face Robocop, like I'd want to get pretty high. Mm -hmm, for sure. But I, I, I mean, I, again, the simplicity of it. I love the line that he delivers after he punches the door down. Where it's just like, you couldn't think of anything more badass to say other than, come quietly or there will be trouble. Yeah. It's just a great line delivery and simple. Yeah. Um, again, it's, just, it's the kind of banal thing that uh, like Robocop would say, you mm -hmm. know, totally underplaying it. It's like, you've got like 20 guys here with machine guns pointed at you. It's like, right. come or there will be trouble. <laughs> and and then like the melee that ensues afterwards, I think we got to see every iconic 
uh, weapon of the 80s. You know, we've got uh, AR-15s, Berettas. We've even got the Spaz-12 shotgun in here. And There's got to be a few the... Uzis as well, surely. Oh, for sure. Uzis. Yeah. Uzis were everywhere in the 80s, man. Everyone oh, yeah. loved them. Um, but yeah, so like none of them, none of them can put a dent in him, obviously, mm -hmm. because he's he's bulletproof and he just mows them down. And it's like, it's Clarence who's all that's left, mm -hmm. um, and then he just starts throwing them through windows, which is you know it's great to watch because he's just like taking out his um, his revenge on this guy. Yeah, um, and Clarence is getting progressively more fucked up every time he goes through one. His face is all like cut and everything. Um, and yeah, that's when he's like, I work for Dick Jones. Mm -hmm. Dick Jones. Don't you get it, you cocksucker? <laughs> yeah. Um, and uh, Jones is OCP. OCP runs the cops. Mm -hmm. um, and that's, I think, um, when one of Robocop's directives comes up on screen, it's like, oh, you've got to uphold the law. So he's like, right. okay, I'll take you in. Yep. Uh, yes. So he I takes him into cop. the, yeah. So he takes him into the police station and, yeah. Um, they're like you know he's under arrest and the, the sergeant's mm -hmm. like what watch the charge and it's like oh he's a cop killer mm -hmm. and i like when um clarence just like spits blood all over the the charge sheet on the desk yeah. and he's like just give me my fucking phone, phone call. call yeah <laughs> yeah, yeah he's just like, uh, he, he knows he can get out of it yeah total lack of respect for authority uh you know but this time like he's obviously a little um like not as cocky because he's all messed up, but he still knows he's going to get away with it. Yeah, exactly. Because he's obviously got Dick Jones on his side, and yep. he can pull some strings and get him out of there. So that's enough for him to like. Um, yeah, he's not sweating it too much. He's just like, this is a minor inconvenience for me, mm -hmm. pretty much. Um, no, nah, it'll be fine. Yeah. Uh, so now that he knows that. Uh, Clarence works for Dick Jones. He then goes to OCP headquarters to arrest Dick Jones, um, which doesn't go too well for him. Um, he gets into his office and he's like, "Look, you're under arrest for a bit, aiding and abetting a criminal." And Dick Jones is like, "Well, you, I guess you better take me in." And that's when he is directive number four that we talked about earlier just suddenly mm -hmm. comes into effect, and it's like you can't oppose an OCP officer. Mm -hmm. uh, and so it basically paralyzes him so he, he just falls to the ground um and yeah that's when he explains like yeah this is an insurance policy so you mm -hmm. can't just arrest people like me um right. and so he's he's kind of got all the bases covered does mm -hmm. does dick well yeah i mean it was it was a great little you know villain monologue as it were you know which is quite a staple for for all bad guys to to deliver uh you know and just explains that he was behind the whole thing yeah um is that where he yeah that's where he also says the 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 thing that's going to be really important in the finale where it's like mm -hmm. he explains he had to kill bob morton because he made that's a right. mistake yeah. uh, and he's like now it's time to erase that mistake and in yeah. comes ed 209 again that's right uh and he's he's the only thing i guess that can damage robocop because he, mm -hmm. he opens fire on him and it like genuinely damages his armor yeah um and he, you know, he throws them through walls. He shoots rockets at them. It, it damages them. Robocop kind of flees um, and makes it down the stairwell, mm -hmm. which the the Ed Two Hundred Nine can't go down because he's he's just you know he's not able to negotiate stairs, I guess, and he falls. Right. Um, and this thing's like freaking out, like it's like screeching and like mm -hmm. flailing around trying to get back up, but it can't. And so again. It, like hats off to Phil Tippett, the guy who did all of the uh, stop motion for this. Like it was just great animation, you know, to see it flailing around. Uh, you know, the movements were just really awesome. Yeah, because it doesn't look too unnatural, like the way it flails around and stuff. Like I think the bit where it actually falls down the stairs is just a real prop. Like they could yeah. make it tumble, uh, and then when it's trying to get up, that's the stop motion. But either way, so it's, it's out of the game for now. So Robocop is able to escape, and then gets downstairs and man the police got there quickly yeah because like dick jones just phones for them and he's like yeah you know robocop's here you need to arrest him and like they just show up within yeah. seconds and there's like dozens and dozens of them and then here comes the scene that traumatized me before seeing predator you know when i saw yeah. this on the trail i'm like whoa, 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 what are you doing why it's it's like um it's like running the gauntlet or something 
for RoboCop because they all mm-hmm. open fire on him and like the because his armor has been damaged already, it's starting to cause real damage to him. And like, he's just kind of stumbling away from him with like mm-hmm. bits of his armor getting blown off. And like, um, it, I guess it's that, that, that whole like robo Jesus thing that you mm-hmm. were talking about with, the, with Verhoeven, he wants to show him suffering. Yeah. And, uh, and it's almost like if this had been in biblical times, he'd be getting whipped or something. Yeah. You know, it's sure. that same kind of thing. Uh, so it's, you know, it causes a lot of damage to him. He's able to like fall down like different levels of this this parking lot um, until he runs into Lewis, who pulls up in a, a squad car, and she's mm-hmm. able to rescue him because um, he's he's pretty fucked up by that point. I guess he's been badly damaged. Yeah, um, and, and yeah, it's it's quite you know you see him suffering. I guess I don't know if he can even feel the impacts of stuff like that, but um, he it's just that gradual like wearing him down. Kind yep. of thing that's uh, that's kind of difficult to watch, I suppose. Well, the, the just before that, um, before he outsmarts the Ed two hundred nine, there's just this cool little camera angle where the camera zooms in on his human eye that be- behind his uh, like bullet damaged visor, and it was just mm-hmm. a cool little thing uh, because you know being able to look into someone's eyes is is what makes us human. Uh, so the fact that they they did that here just shows. You know, he's not a machine. He's there's a man behind there, uh, and it yes. just gives a little bit of sympathy, empathy for the character. Yeah, um, and it's I, I guess it sort of represents how you know his humanity is starting to come to the fore more as the for movie sure. progresses. Like as his armor gets blasted away, like the man beneath it starts to come out a little bit mm-hmm. more. Um, but Lewis is able to take him away, um, and you know, I guess so that he can be repaired a little bit, or that he can get himself together. Um, oh, just and then, yeah. like take and care it, of his needs and yeah, exactly. And then it, I think it goes back then to um, to Clarence, who's been bailed out of prison, obviously because Dick mm-hmm. Jones has pulled lots of um, strings for him. Um, his office is in the midst of getting repaired because it's been absolutely destroyed by like exactly. the fight with Robocop. <laughs> yeah, like, uh, and I one thing that cracks me up here is the uh, his secretary. Uh, when he comes up and uh, I've got an appointment with Dick Jones, uh, you know, and he puts the gum on 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 her nameplate, that is Kurtwood Smith's wife. Is it? It is. Yeah. So oh, that that's must, funny. That must have been a, a hilarious scene for the two of them to try and film, because he's like, you know, coming in being this this punk, and she's just not having it because she obviously doesn't care about him. Yeah, but, totally. It's like when he goes, "Oh, you can keep the gum." Mm-hmm. <laughs> hey. <laughs> Barbara, I'm here to see Dick Jones, but uh, maybe you can fit me in. Yeah. Again, it's great 80s movies because like, the guy's always sleezing on every female mm-hmm. in, in sight. You know? Oh, <laughs> just and, like uh, constantly trying to have a go. Just after Lewis rescues him, we cut to the commercial of the 6000 SUX with oh, yes. the T Rex going through the street. And there's another Paul Verhoeven cameo in here. He is uh he's the one guy who points up to the to the sky and screams and runs away. Oh really? Yeah. Oh, he gave himself lots of little cameos in this then. Yeah. I, I think like that. that when I if I recall correctly from the, the um, commentary, that was another one of those things where he was directing the extras of like, I want you to do this. You know, pretend there's a there's a giant dinosaur and point in the sky and do this. And so he just added himself doing it, uh, just for extra footage. That's it. Well, I mean, like, if you've got the vision, do you it. Know, and nobody else can carry it out, then you just go for it, Paul. Mm-hmm. Yeah, love him. Um, so, in this scene, then Clarence and uh, and Dick Jones are are in his office, um, and that's when Dick's like, "Look, we have to end this. We've got to find Robocop and destroy him because he now knows uh, that I'm involved, um, mm-hmm. and that's admissible as evidence because you spilled your guts to him." He's a so, cyborg, you idiot. Yes, exactly. So, like, he can record everything that he sees. So mm-hmm. that's obviously the, the major problem that he's got. Um, mm-hmm. But they've got a tracking device on Robocop, so they know where he is. They just need, basically, Clarence to get his gang together and go and kill him. Um, and Clarence obviously realizes Robocop's protected. He's he's difficult to destroy. We need heavy firepower. And so mm-hmm. Dick Jones is like, yeah, we, we practically are the military. We can get you anything you need. That's right. Uh, 
and you get that great scene then following on from that where Clarence rocks up with these enormous like 50 cal sniper mm -hmm. rifles. I think they're Barrett 50 cals. They sure were. were. They, yep. they just dumped some extra like, you know, um, dressing on them to make them more bulky. But what puts the big uh, comical looking view scope on the top of it, makes it look yeah. all high tech. Yeah. But they, they are just like, they're just big 50 cal sniper rifles. And mm -hmm. um, Clarence uses it to play. <laughs> blow up one of his mate's cars yeah, who pulls up in a 6000 sux it's like yeah. what do you say clarence joe's got a car just like yours yeah he just like <laughs> smiles and gets the gun out and blows up yeah. <laughs> and then they all start blowing things up like they're just having a whale of a time with these guns and they look amazing like i know real barrett 50 cals don't explode when you shoot things with them but oh. man they look great fun i i gotta say that like hats off to anyone who can fire it from a standing position. The uh, the gun club that I'm part of, uh, one of the employees there has a, a Barrett 50, um, so they let me you know hold it and see what it's like. That thing is heavy. Yeah. Like just being able to like shoulder that weapon, I can't imagine firing it, but it is that is a heavy weapon. I mean, most of the time they've got them slung over their mm -hmm. shoulders, like so they've got a sling to support it. So, but Ooh, even then, I guess the the recoil would be pretty. Um pretty brutal yeah it's got uh, it's got some kick to it yeah um that'd be it'd be they're they're cool looking props anyway um, for sure and it was an impressive scene i mean it's again loaded with so many great one-liners and and uh, when emil fires it for the first time you know just his his expression and i like it yeah <laughs> Um, yeah, so they, he, he's now armed his gang up, and that's yep. them ready to take on Robocop because they can track him, so they know where he is. They just need to go um, and and go and take him down. And you then get a, a bit of a scene between Robocop and Lewis where he takes his helmet off, um, and you know he warns her, like, you might not like what you see underneath it. Mm -hmm. And Yeah, it's a, it's a good... When you get to see his face fully for the first time, yeah, um, I think I was saying to you before, like it's not like gory or horrific looking, but it's like you kind of almost pity him because you see what he's been reduced to. Yeah, you know, when the helmet's on, you can almost forget the extent of what's been done to him. But like once it comes off, and you just see like you know his face is just almost like a, a veneer of skin over this machine for sure uh, beneath you know, and, and it's, which was yeah, which was the whole point of the scene uh, for to now he is you believe that he's human and you feel sorry for him because of like, like you said, this is what he's been reduced to. And that was completely lost in the remake. Uh, when his visor goes up, visor goes down. It's, they keep on jumping back and forth and it, it's, this is so, so much better. The effect here. Yeah. And it's because it's precisely because of everything he's been through. You know that his armor has been damaged and everything, and he's he's all kind of messed up. Um, that it's stripped away that machine element to him to some extent, and now it's the man beneath that's coming to the fore again. Mm -hmm. um, and yeah, the, the makeup and everything—it's all obviously real prosthetics, I suppose. Mm -hmm. Like or, around Peter Weller, like it must have been a hell of a makeup job to do all that sort of thing with him. Yeah, um, you can, it, it just mean, looks good, you know. Yeah, you can see all that, like the putty, the makeup putty that they put around his face uh, in order to go around whatever prosthetic they had on his skull. Yeah. Uh, so it, it makes his head look a little wider than normal, but y you let it go because it's just... Really well, yeah, you can, see, you can see what they had to do in order to make it work, but you're kind of like, they did it well. Mm -hmm. um, working within the constraints of what they had available, like I think it's, it's pretty decent, actually. Um, I was just looking in chat. Eric O'Sullivan here was saying the failed Robocop 2s uh, were the funniest ones. You oh, know, where yeah, you see the, sure. the training videos and it's like, yep. you know, it'll be like a skeleton head underneath. Yeah, and, and it goes nuts, takes its helmet off and shoots the guy. You know. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, because you see it shoot the scientist in the yeah. arm and like the guy, like he's watching it back and he, he's yeah. got his arm in a sling and you just yeah. see him wince like, oh man, I remember that. <laughs> and again, like I, I laugh at the just the safety protocol of that you know you've got these untested prototypes and you've given them firearms with live ammunition why would you do that yeah i'll be fine you know yeah. what's the worst that can happen exactly yeah exactly um but yeah i think the fact as well that like the lewis has brought him food but like she knows mm -hmm. that he can only eat that paste stuff so it's baby yep. food 
Yep. And it's like that's that's what that's what Alex Murphy has been reduced to. You yes. Know? He's just uh he's having to eat baby food and he's mm-hmm. just a shell of a man, you know. It's uh it's pathetic and and sort of tragic at the same time and mm-hmm. yeah, I think it's it's a well played out scene, I think. Well, you just like the music as well uh just really makes you feel sorry for him what he's having to go through and um like you said like what he's been reduced to and uh this was not his choice yeah and uh, but then he delivers that great line of uh in, uh, when he's re- like trying to remember his family and he says i can feel them but i don't remember them it's mm-hmm. like that's a that's a really like heartbreaking line and he he refers to alex murphy in the third person Mm-hmm. You know, he's like Alex Murphy had a family. What happened to them? Right. You know, it's not like I had a family because he sees that as a different man. Mm-hmm. You know, and what he is now bears very re- little resemblance to Alex Murphy, and that's uh, it's a it's a thing that the movie gets across quite effectively in a subtle way that mm-hmm. he's he doesn't really see himself as that man now. He's just like an echo of him. But it's only by the end, right at the end, when someone asks, when the, the OCP president asks what his name is, and then he says mm-hmm. Murphy, it's like he's now reassumed that identity. But it yeah. took the entire movie for him to get to that point. For sure. Like, it's a it's a great progression. Yeah. Um, but so he he has, you know, that, that scene. Um, he does the, the tracking thing with his gun where he's got to, like, run how to aim again, and Lewis helps him um, just in time for for Clarence and the others to show up. Mm-hmm. Um, and that's when they, we have the big uh, finale, the big shootout um, where they come in. I think um, the Robocop shoots uh, Joe, first of all, doesn't he? Yep. Like he's on a gantry above, he shoots him down, mm-hmm. they, they fire back and it, they miss, but they blow up everything around him because they're shit aims, I guess. I love how they got these these like high-tech sniper scopes on their their. Um, assault rifles, or yep. sorry, on their sniper guns, and they never use them. They just yep. fire from the hip every time. <laughs> exactly. It's like it's there for a reason, guys. Yep. No, these are not skilled soldiers. Yeah, yeah definitely. Um, and that's when they they go after him. Um, Emil tries to run him over. Yeah. Which is a bad move. <laughs> yeah. Because he's, then, he drives straight into the big tank full of toxic waste. Yep. Then we get that great scene. Yeah, um, and I love how it's just labeled as toxic waste mm-hmm. on this container, and no one's ever emptied it or anything. It's just sat there, you know. That's right. You know, it's just a random thing. You know, we, you know, be be careful. There's barrels of toxic waste everywhere you go. Yeah, uh, but this is this is another scene that was cut from like when I was a kid, and it was on TV. You would never see the what happens to that guy. He just drives into the toxic waste container, and it just that's him out of the movie. Then it's like, oh, oh really? Oh, yeah, they it's cut like it that oh. much. Yeah, so it's wow. like, oh, I okay. guess he died then. <laughs> but okay. like, it just seemed weird. And then obviously when I saw it for the first time, I'm like, ah, that explains it. Mm-hmm. So yeah, he gets melted by this stuff. And it's it's good special effects, I thought. Like, oh, yeah. it's obviously all just um, makeup. Uh-huh. Um, but they, they do a good job. Like, one side of his face is all kind of um, <sighs> melting off. It's so disturbing. Oh, yeah. you know, he, he's like gasping and wheezing and yeah because uh. <laughs> i love how he runs into one of the other dudes mm-hmm. and he's like ah oh, help me, help and the guy, me. And the guy just goes yeah. like get away from, from me man, man. yeah yeah it's, <laughs> it's kind of how you would react like ah, oh, oh, seriously. don't touch me <laughs> like you would at least want to like maybe go wash your hands because this guy like i think he's got the covid so yeah yeah, it, it's not something you would want near you anyway. And it's like, mm. well, what can you really do for him at this point, you know? Yeah. Um, I, but then he, um, yeah, <laughs> this is why, like I was saying to you before, um, this the scene obviously next, he's like stumbling across the road mm-hmm. and Clarence has tried to make her a run for it. And he's getting pursued by Lewis in the squad car. <laughs> Clarence just drives right into him and like yes. instead of him going over the windshield, he just kind of explodes all over the front of the car. <laughs> And I don't think any, I, yeah, I don't think anyone was expecting this, you know, like, oh shit, you know, he's walking and at least maybe he'll do another Mad Max catapult over the, the hood, but no one expected him to just completely splat. He was that badly melted. He just, yeah. like, there was nothing holding them together pretty yeah. much. His um, bones are dissolved. It's. Yeah, and, it's the bit where like you can see his hands and it's like mm-hmm. his, his finger bones are sort of sticking out, but then his finger flesh is melting yes. off them so it's they're sticking out dripping. 
Yeah, it's like really like they really put the thought into the special effects there or into the makeup. It's you know, it's so, like what would this what could we do? What could we have this do? It's like, oh, it melts your flesh, so it's literally falling off your bones. Well, I love that after Clarence hits him, splat hit the head goes flying over the roof of the car, and then the camera cuts to the inside and the windshield <laughs> wipers are going while just, just <laughs> viscera is all over the windshield. It's just like, okay, that's gross. But awesome. He's not even he's not even shocked by it. He's yeah. more just like, ah shit. Ah, you know? shit. Yeah. Can't see. But this is why, like in the TV cut of it, right? This is a really weird scene because they have to cut that as well, because otherwise mm. it wouldn't make any sense. Okay. So all that you saw in the TV edit was like Clarence is driving along and he just like drives right into an obstacle and goes and crashes. Mm-hmm. But there's okay. no explanation for it. It's like, oh, I guess he's a shit driver then. Yeah, like, okay. Well, maybe the six, the 6,000 really does suck. It, yeah, I think it does. Yeah. The 6,000 sucks. Um, but he, yeah, so in this case, he does hit the guy. He can't see. He hits an obstacle, drives like over a, a, a cliff and into mm-hmm. like a big, uh, a big pit filled with water. Mm-hmm. So he's crashed. Lewis gets out to like go and finish him off and then he just appe- he just bursts out the car and guns her down oh he's totally fine like he just flew through the air did a barrel roll landed and yeah i'm all yeah. right he's he's cool he's a tough son of a bitch yeah um and then <laughs> this this bit always makes me laugh so he guns her down right and then mm-hmm. murphy shows up to arrest clarence yeah uh, or to take him down anyway and, and uh he's like yo drop it creep so mm-hmm. he drops his gun, and Clarence is like, "Oh, you know, he's just going to arrest me, like he has to mm-hmm. do." Uh, he's like, "I'm not here to arrest you this time," and it's like he's clearly just going to murder him. That's mm-hmm. what he's got planned. But then Clarence's mate shows up, still armed with this high-powered sniper rifle that could blow up Robocop in one hit. Doesn't right. bother using it. Gets into a crane nearby, and then uses that to drop a bunch of like wreckage onto on top of Robocop. Right. It's like. Why are you doing that? You've got exactly. a gun that can blow him up. Maybe he's just really good at the claw game. You know, it's a throwback to his childhood and like, hey, watch Maybe. this. He, he really seems like he's enjoying it. Like, uh, I've got, I know what I'm going to do. Mm-hmm. I'm going to drop this shit on him. Yeah. Um, but it, it it lands on Murphy. Uh, he thinks he's won. Lewis, who's been injured, manages to get the, f- the dropped sniper rifle that was Clarence's, mm-hmm. I guess, and uses that to blow up Clarence's mate. So it's just just the three of them left. And then so this, is, yeah. this is, yeah, sorry. Um, were you going to talk about the stabbing? Yes. Okay. Um, so like Murphy's pinned underneath all this wreckage and Clarence just gets like the, a big metal rod that's like, ha- you know, sticking in the ground and just starts hitting him with it and then jams it right into his chest. Um, and it's, it's like, oh man, that's causing some damage there. Like he's even twists it around. Sayonara, Robocop. Yeah, <laughs> um, yeah, and that's when Robocop uses the famous data port thing that's actually just a giant metal spike just right into his neck. Um, but, then, but then we get into a great <clears throat> example of 1980s practical effects here. Because uh, like after he stabs him and pulls it out, you get all the splatter on on Murphy here. Like it's just all this goo lands on him. Oh, and, so much. Yeah, it's like someone just turned a hose on him. Yep, and then the effect of uh, Clarence holding his neck with the blood spurting out of his neck uh, because they had a tube running up his leg. And so the blood that's shooting out of his neck was being fed from a hose that ran up like from the cuff of his pants. Yeah. So it was just... It, it totally That's makes sense. Yeah, he would have to cover it, and yeah, it's like it's everywhere. Um, a couple of people in chat were saying like the the guy with the crane didn't have his sniper rifle. That's why he drops the wreckage on Murphy. He did have it because if you watch him, he's running along that gantry towards the crane, and he's got the sniper rifle over his shoulder, like he's got it on the sling. So he's there with it. He just chooses not to use it. Uh, I'm just gonna scrub through. I think you were right. Yep. Yeah, the one that Lewis shoots is the one that Clarence drops. Yeah, so it must have got, like, the one that she uses, that probably got thrown out of his wreckage of his car when it crashed. Right. So that makes sense that that would be there. But the other guy, he had his, and he was, he, he, he's at the gantry, he sees what's happening, he's like, ah, I've got an idea, and he goes along to the, the crane, 
that's just further along, but he's running with the sniper rifle in his in his arms, like kind of slung over his shoulder. Mm -hmm. Yep. Yeah, there it is. He's got it. He's carrying it. And he, uh... Uh, but I think yeah, he just he just wanted to do it. He just wanted to use that crane, and it's yeah, fair enough. Okay. Um, uh, the plot needed it to happen. To quote exactly, yeah, it did, yeah. Because if he'd just blown up Robocop, I suppose that would be the movie over. So, yeah, I would rather he was out of ammunition or something. That would have been a little explanation. Uh, yeah, who knows how many rounds these Cobra assault cannons can fire? Yeah, um, but yeah, so that's that's Clarence dead. You know, he's he's been stabbed in the neck, and he fuck man, that's a that's a gory death. Um, <laughs> Very satisfying as far as eighties go. It is, yeah, because he deserved that. Um, and, and Lewis is like, "Oh, Murphy, I'm a mess." Mm. He's like, "Oh, they'll fix you. They fix everything." everything. Yep. Yeah. Uh, it's like, ah, oh, she's not quite like you, Murphy. Yeah. Uh... Poor, poor girl. Think, yeah. Well, the thing is, like, obviously, she's in the sequel, but you. You could almost see it as ambiguous whether she survived or not in this one because mm -hmm. you never see her at the end. It's just like, you know, she's lying there, been gunned down, um, and then it just cuts to the next scene and Murphy rocks up at OCP headquarters. So it's it, you can probably infer that she survived or that she was hanging in there. But, yeah. you know, she's pretty messed up. Uh, and, and who knows, maybe they took her to the heart center to get a, a Jensen or a Yamaha new heart or something. I, w I would go for a Yamaha. For okay. sure, I would. Right. Uh, you want a high performance heart? You do. You do. As long as it's under warranty. That's true. With extended yeah. financing and yeah, or and, no, uh, financing. I, I would, well, I'd want it in my contract as well that the the surgical team would care. That's right. We Remember. care. <laughs> uh, such uh, sincerity. I know. Yeah, um, it's almost as sincere as Disney. <laughs> oh, <ouch. laughs> um, anyway, uh, before I get banned from YouTube, uh, yeah, so Murphy care. Murphy rocks up to OCP headquarters. There's an Ed 209 garden building. <laughs> and um, again, it's just, it's got this amazing voice where it's like, you are illegally parked on OCP property. Uh, Murphy just gets out the, the sniper rifle and just blows the shit out of it. You know? Oh. Um, yeah, and here we go. Yeah, so it looks like yeah they had actually built a one to one scale version of Ed two hundred nine because that was a actual prop that they had there. When it turns yes. and looks at him, then it switches to the the stop motion, and the uh, the editing is just so seamless. Yeah, yeah, it's fine. I just love that um, you know he's able to use this gun and blow up this mm -hmm. this machine right outside, and nobody gets alerted by it. Yeah. Like, nobody in the boardroom is like ah. aware that this has happened or anything. Yeah, that makes sense. This is just an average day at the office. Uh, yeah, well, I suppose when you think about the kind of shit that's happened in this movie already at OCP, it, it, they're used to gunshots, I think, in that building. Yeah, why not? This is old Detroit. Yeah. So he heads up to the boardroom and um, he tells them that uh, Dick Jones is under arrest. And they're like, um, well, on what charge? And it's like, well, he just uses his, his data port thing again to bring up that image of Dick Jones admitting to murdering Bob Morton. And it's still all covered in blood. Yeah, exactly. Um, good little touch there. And that's when Dick uses that gun that was set up earlier, because, you know, boardrooms yeah. have guns, I suppose. Exactly. Um, not, it's like, and not just any gun. It's a nice uh, Desert desert Eagle des 50 cal. Because desert Eagle, yeah. 80s, man. They just... Because the Desert Eagle was pretty much the biggest semi-automatic you could get your hands on back then, I would have imagined. Exactly. Very important. It's, it, it's nickel-plated as well. For sure. <laughs> Just to really drive the point. Yeah. Bob Morton made a mistake. Now it's time to erase that mistake. Um, and so, yeah, he's taken the president hostage, but Murphy can't oppose him because of Directive 4. You know, he mm -hmm. can't take on an OCP officer. Uh, and that's just when the president just goes, Dick, you're fired! Mm -hmm. <laughs> it's Robocop. Just, yeah, this is just a great little exchange here. Yeah. Because it's uh, like, officer, why don't you do anything? Well, you know, he realizes that he can't. And then that's quick thinking on the CEO's part. Yeah. So. Uh, and you just, Robocop just goes, oh, thank you. Yeah. And then 
you know, guns uh, guns them down. Uh, and you get that extremely fake shot of like the oh, fake geez. Dick Jones falling out. Yeah, the I'm just looking at that again. Like, yeah, what the hell did they do to his arms? That is bizarre. There's so many different ways you could have done that. Yeah. You know, I, I honestly think that was like added last minute in post because they're mm-hmm. like, oh, we need to get a reaction shot of him falling. But it's like you could have just got the actor, had him fall onto a green screen yeah. and shot it like that. That would have been fine. You could have got a dummy and thrown it out of a window and shot it from the ground. But it's like you you took like the most like fake looking way possible and did exactly. it like that. And you didn't you- even get like a, a lifelike model of him. Nope. Yeah, I guess they just wanted to capture the emotion of him screaming and falling to his death. It's like, uh, it's terrible. Yeah, the arms, man. The arms. They were longer than his legs. He's like Slender Man or something. Ugh, that's creepy. Yes. Yeah. Uh, I love how Robocop shoots him like five or six times and then he falls out the window and he's still yeah. alive. <laughs> and like it, the blood squibs again in his front and back. So obviously there was an entry and an exit wound, but the glass doesn't shatter behind him. So I'm like, uh, okay. But yeah, people are saying, how does one scream when their lungs have been shredded by bullets? Pretty Who knows? Much. They they could have hands grubered him and dropped him onto a green screen. Yeah, just like yeah. I was saying, it's so easy. Uh, but who knows? Paul Verhoeven is a mystery to everyone, including Paul Verhoeven. I suspect that's true. But he Stre- Stretch Jones. <laughs> Someone called him. <laughs> All right, that wins. Stretch Jones. Stretch Jones. <laughs> David Rayner, comment of the night. <laughs> That's brilliant. Um, he's got Yamaha lungs. Mm. According to Aviac, yeah, he must have got them installed. Okay. Um, but yeah, the final scene is just um, the, the OCP president saying, nice shooting, son. Uh, what's your name? And he's like, Murphy. And that's just, that's where it ends. Mm. Good ending. I just I loved like the lack of sympathy on the part of the CEO. Like, oh, okay, well, thanks for uh, taking care of that guy. We were just in the middle of a board meeting, and uh, well, uh, he's been with the company for a long time, but uh, now he's out the window. Okay, yeah. You wonder how many times things like this have happened at OCP. You know, just like people getting killed in boardrooms and stuff. Just like it's just another day at the office, I suppose. For sure. Yeah. I'm just well, um, I'm just appreciating the costuming here. I'm just going back through this scene, like. This is supposed to be the future, and they have just the most '80s-looking business suits. You got this this secretary here with her '80s haircut and oversized glasses. Yeah, have yeah. they got the shoulder pads as well? Oh yeah, Big broad shoulders. Uh, yeah, it's the same with it's the same with the newsreaders. Like when they're doing their news reports, and the oh, women's yeah. wearing like really '80s sweaters. For sure, that was good old. Uh, what was her name? Lisa Gibbons from Entertainment Tonight. Oh, is she a real person? Oh, yeah. She was a real, um, uh, you know, like on one of the popular U.S. Uh, primetime entertainment shows. Uh, right. She was, she was quite a celebrity at the time. Cool. Um, but, yeah, I mean, overall, like, just a total blast of a film. Like, mm-hmm. I, I really enjoyed watching it. It's, it's not even very long. Like, I think it's about 95 minutes. Mm-hmm. Like, it moves along in a fair clip, but it, it manages to get an, a lot in to that time. Um, it never really feels rushed. It never feels like they're they're skipping over important information. Mm-hmm. Um, things are set up. Things are established early on that are used later. Like, it's, it's a good kind of solid screenplay. It doesn't mm-hmm. tell a terribly complex story, um, but it, it does it well. And I think that's just, yeah, I, I can't really criticize it too much apart from some dodgy special effects like you know stretch jones and stuff like it's <laughs> it's generally pretty good yeah which is, at the time i think it just kind of goes by and you just don't notice it until you were, had the chance to rewatch it and you're like uh okay that looks wrong yeah uh, someone here saying galvatron is uh saying they're writing a prequel series with dick jones rising to the top I, I kid you not, they probably are. Like, they've already got an Alfred Pennyworth um, series somewhere out there that's, like, about Alfred in his younger days before he became a butler. Like, they will they will have something out there about Dick Jones oh, uh, or Murphy yeah. the early years before he got turned into Robocop. Like, fuck. I don't, I don't need that. I don't want to know that. Yeah, exactly. Uh, but this, as, as I said at the start, you know, as a... 
a movie that kind of walks that fine line between satire with like the news reports and the, the sort of critique of corporatization and everything, but also just telling like a, a good, compelling story. Um, it, it does it really well, I think. Mm -hmm. it, it, does, it walks that fine line quite carefully and effectively and really good. And it was, like you said, when you did your, your Predator review, that movie isn't very long either, but it's just brilliantly paced. Uh, it's the setup where the story is told. You get, you get just enough exposition so that you understand what's going on and why. Uh, and this movie was exactly like that as well. Nothing yeah. had to be overly explained. You didn't, it wasn't spoon feeding you as the audience. I, I think the one thing I might have asked a bit more from was just maybe fleshing out the reason why there's a relationship between um, Jones and Clarence, because it's like it's kind of like just two bad guys who are working together. But I'm I'm always like left wondering, well, what did Jones gain from using Clarence as like his uh, his enforcer? Mm, kind okay. of situation like what was what was he hoping to achieve by that because you you get a conversation between them where it's like okay when we start construction on delta city there's going to be like a million construction workers there mm -hmm. they're going to want like uh, drugs prostitutes alcohol all that sort of stuff and you can corner that market you know mm -hmm. you can be in control of all of that i'm like okay well that's obviously going to be a huge um, lure for clarence to be that kingpin of crime there but what does Jones gain out of doing that? Because isn't that just going to delay Delta City? Isn't it going to make it really hard for that to get constructed if maybe. there's crime everywhere? Yeah. I'm thinking maybe it would that would be the driving force for his Ed 209 unit of like, hey, right. look, it makes it an easy sell. Look at, you know, look at this crime that's on the streets and I've got the solution to it. Bam. You know, and then the military wants this hot new toy that he's created. So he kind of used, he would have used him to create a crisis and then used Ed 209 to solve it and probably would have turned against him at some point and had him killed, I guess. Right. Well, okay. I mean, it's the satire of the movie and it's a commentary on how that's very commonplace. Uh, I mean, that was the main plot of uh, Mission Impossible 2, right? It's just like, well, we need, a, we need to make money. So let's create uh, a problem and then we'll also create the solution so that we could look like the savior yeah okay i can i can go with that because obviously there's a theme in this of the police getting pushed to breaking point until they eventually go on strike mm -hmm. uh, and then it's just complete lawlessness uh and that's when i think dick jones uses that as his opportunity to step in and say well this is where we need the ed 209 the police can't handle it anymore right uh, robocop is now out of the picture we need this right so and I think it's implied that they're, they're purposely not running the police department very well to undermine their efforts and undermine their morale. So that, yes. Uh, and that's established in RoboCop 2, you know, where they just want to take Detroit private. So that was the plan all along. That, yeah, that makes sense. Um, now, I did say earlier on, um, sorry, I'm just doing a bit of admin here um yeah i said we'd obviously take a look at the super chats as we sure. work our way through it so i don't know if you've got a bit of time we can crack on with that if that's okay i always enjoy listening to these super chats great questions all right nice one um yeah so i got started with a few just earlier while you were um out this out the stream um yeah oh yeah here we go so did the first few and then one from Automata here saying an interesting bit I noticed on a recent rewatch was the police's mixed gender locker room. Oh yeah, as mm -hmm. we were saying, and how they desexualized the touch of nudity shown there was. Uh, yeah, I don't know if that's a thing with Paul Verhoeven. Um, he's Dutch, isn't he? As as mm -hmm. a director, they're pretty um, liberal about all that stuff. Um, I don't think they're too bothered with like nudity and, and things. Um, and they did the same exact thing in Starship Troopers, um, mixed gender shower rooms. And it's not shown as being a big deal at all. Yeah. Like they they just kind of do it um, without even, you know, batting an eyelash. Um, yeah. I know in Starship Troopers, the actors insisted that like they would only do that nude scene if Verhoeven would direct it in the nude. Um, and he really? was like, yeah, of course. Um, yeah, why oh, wouldn't oh. I? <laughs> oh, okay, I get to be naked? Well, this is, yeah, uh, we call this Tuesday. Yeah, exactly. So he was fine with that. And so the scene was done. 
Um, okay. But yeah, it's it's interesting. Maybe that is just the way they were going with this. Like in the future, um, you know, things are more liberal and nudity is just not even seen as a big deal. So who knows? Yeah. Um, suede off the cuff. Silly question and super chat to support. Would you consider doing a nine book anthology bundle release in paperback? P.S. Um, you're out of some of paperbacks in the Amazon store. Uh, well, I mean, doing an anthology is a question for my publishers rather than me. Um, I don't know if that would be even feasible to take nine books like that and, and compress it down. But, um, you know, they're, they're available as far as I know in paperback. They're, they're out in Kindle. They're out in um, audiobook. Uh, you know, take your pick, basically. Um, but there's there's various other things that we're working on at the moment. Um, now that the series has kind of reached its uh, its conclusion with this, um, we can look at re releasing it, doing different covers, a bunch of different stuff that we're trying to decide on. So uh, stay tuned. Uh, Street Fighter eighty eight says, "Nice shooting, son. What's your name, Murphy? Yeah, what a great line to end the movie on." It really was. Yeah, it was just, it just, like you were saying earlier, it just shows the completion of Murphy's or uh, Robocop's uh, story arc where he regains his humanity. Yeah. Or his uh, identity. Yeah, that was his journey, I guess, through all of this. You know, to lose his humanity, to lose all sense of who he was, and then to gradually recover it. Um, and then by the end, he's reassumed the identity of Murphy. So uh, it's a good character arc for him, I think. Um, Chad Sheldon here says, instead of saying go away now at the end of your streams, you should change it to <laughs> bitches leave. Yes. <laughs> I, yeah, when I sent you that clip, I was just like, there's got to be a drinker quote in here somewhere. <laughs> I, uh, yeah, I'm just thinking how I could match that up with like a, a Brie Larson clip. <laughs> I don't know. I can. Ooh, ooh, wow. Okay. I'll, I'll get to work on that. <laughs> Um, Stybeck B says, We present you 9 million Robocop 2. Ah, <laughs> uh, yeah, nine, so yeah, 9 million dollars Robocop 2. <laughs> okay, um, Dominic the Donkey, did you two legends watch the director's cut? If so, what are your thoughts? I think you might have. Yep, that's the, that's the only version that I currently own. Uh, the director's cut. Uh, I just remember back in the day when the movie came out, uh, it it created quite a controversy. You know, like I remember newscasters like saying, oh, you know, they had to cut down a few frames in order to avoid an X rating. And, you know, it's just so over the top violent. Uh, so then when I watched the, the director's cut finally many, many years later, it was like, really? Uh, you kept this, but you cut this out because it would have been too much? Uh, that's the thing. If it, if what they cut out is just more of the same, mm -hmm. you know, it's just more shots of a guy with squibs going off and more blood. It's yeah. like, well, how is that any worse? Yeah, I mean, you know I mean? it's just a continuation of the same idea. Yeah, you're just showing like the guy. You've already established that he's getting blown to bits. So what are you sheltering the viewer from, and why? Yeah. Uh, is there just like a point where it's like goes from being, you know, <laughs> tasteful in their eyes to gratuitous? I don't know. Yeah. Oh, that's oh! Now you've gone too far. Uh, you've used uh, twelve squibs instead of nine. Yeah, exactly. It's it's an odd one, uh, but yeah, I think we've both seen the most complete version that's available, as mm -hmm. far as I know. There was no scenes that we've referenced. I think that like one of us has seen the other one hasn't. So, yeah, I think that's that's it. Uh, but yeah, I definitely approve of the full version. Uh, Rob Altus, I know the actor that played Joe Cox, the cackling bad guy, a very nice guy in real life. Oh, cool. Uh, that's extremely okay. cool. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, I, I don't I don't really remember seeing him in anything else, if I'm honest with you. Um, maybe he has been, but I, I can't recall him off the top of my head. Uh, I, but he played this role great. Like, I think the only ones that really went on to greater things were was the, the guy that played Leon. Um, the the um, the guy who drops the 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 forty year old club guy. Yeah, uh, Ray Wise. Yeah, he's gone on to other things, and then of course Emil. Uh, he's gone on he, to many. He things. was in Twenty Four. He was. Yeah, I think he was Jack Bauer's brother. Um, and it was strange because obviously 
you know, I saw him in Robocop and then I saw him in 24, which was like 15, 20 years later. And it's like, obviously he's aged a great deal, but like yeah. still kind of recognizable. Um, but yeah, it's weird when you don't see an actor for a really long time. Uh, yeah, it's just like, oh, uh, hey, wait a second. You're the guy that uh, got turned into goo and got hit with a car. Yeah. Can, can you do that thing again? Uh, no. Uh, Achilles here saying, can you fly, Bobby? <laughs> great line. Uh, good way to establish Clarence as well as like a really uh, just an asshole bad guy. Yeah, poor Bobby. Yeah, poor Bobby. Um, Stybeck B. I went completely insane after watching the quarantine tapes with Sam Neill. This guy is beginning for Event Horizon sequel. It's terribly important. <laughs> uh, I'd love to see another Event Horizon, or a, I think they're doing a TV version of it. Uh, mm. Be interesting to see where that goes, but. Genuinely, I would just love to see the the director's cut of Event Horizon. Um, I think they've pretty much lost the footage that they had originally, but that would have been something else. Apparently, it was making people like throw up and faint and stuff. Uh, just brilliant. Um, automation D and D, dead or alive? You're drinking with me. <laughs> ah, cheers. Thank you, lad. I've got a bottle of Talisker here. Um, my publishers actually gave it to me on on. From a book coming out, it's like a little gift. And hey, wow. Man, it, it goes down smooth. It's uh, it's good stuff. I can need to write this down. What do, Talisker? Talisker. Talisker. Yeah. Awesome. Okay. Yeah, it's a it's a damn fine whiskey. Um, Earthworm Jim. Uh, hey, drinker, love the channel. What do you think of the movie Roadhouse? Great classic action film. Would be great to see you discuss it. Yeah, uh, bah, Roadhouse. Swayze is best. That was a good movie. It's just a fun '80s film. Like I, you know, it's it's got lots of like, you know, all the staples of a good '80s movie. Lots of ass kicking mm -hmm. fight scenes. Um, lots of drinking. Uh, I think Which there's a bit of tits in it as well. Yep. Yeah, there's there's a bit of tit in it. Uh, so yeah, perfect '80s film, really. Good film. All bases are covered. Yep. Exactly. Sure. Yeah. Uh, John Boring. Uh, what if the marketing? What if the marketing department at OCP settled on Bobby Bot instead of Robocop? Would have been a very different movie. <laughs> Bobby is like uh, the British version of. It's what we call cops. Like you would say that's a Bobby. Ah. Uh, which is okay. like a slang term for a for a cop. It's more okay. of a more of a sort of like London thing, and okay. I don't know if it's used so much now, but yeah, Bobby Bot. <laughs> uh, what's the next one? Ryan Barrett. What's your favorite line from RoboCop? Um, I I think it's the the bit where the president just yells at him like, "Dick, you're fired." <laughs> it's just the way he delivers it is brilliant. There are so many quotable lines in there. Um... I'm gonna to have to stick with uh, the kept the uh, city worker, the disgruntled city worker, um, just talking about the car. What kind of car do you want? Yeah, I think that's my yeah. favorite. Something that's really expensive and it's got really shitty gas mileage. Yeah, it goes really fast with reclining leather seats and gets really shitty gas mileage. <laughs> um, automata, little character moment. Murphy grins when they call. Sorry, they get the call, and Lewis rushes to the driver's seat and quips, why don't you drive? Um, yeah, that's when they're having coffee. So, like, he's already had the scene where he drives, yeah. and then, like, they're, they're just getting coffee, and they're starting to talk a little bit, and, like, she beats him to the punch at the driver's seat, and he's like, ah, oh, why don't you drive? It's Yeah, yeah it's good. Yeah, it's a, a bit good of play. Back and forth between them, you know, and it, it shows neither one of them is going to, like, you know, back down for the other, so... Mm -hmm. You establish a good relationship between them. Um, Trinonculus P. Dick Jones fits the definition of boss. Stupid SOB backwards. <laughs> True indeed. Yeah. Uh, I wouldn't say that he's stupid. I think he's just malicious and, um, you know, not a not a not a nice man. He is kind of dumb for putting his faith in Ed Two Hundred Nine, because that thing has failed like every single time that he's used it. Right, but he sort of revealed, and this is a great line, when they're having their little face-to-face -face in the bathroom, and he says, I had a guaranteed military sale with Ed 209, 
spare parts renovation program who cares if it worked or not and yeah. it's like so so he knew that they were cutting quarters he did that on purpose it was just i don't care just get this thing out the door uh mm. so i think that was just a, a little nod or a poke at how uh corporate america tends to do their thing yeah it did make me laugh as well when clarence just brazenly walks into his office like this guy who's like a wanted criminal and is probably yeah. quite well known. He just like doesn't try to disguise himself or hide himself. Nope. You know, they don't meet in some discreet location and just straight into Dick Jones's office, like mm -hmm. past the secretary and all the workers there. Right. <laughs> Fair enough. And she knows who is he who he is. He, yeah. you know, yes. He's, he's expecting you, Mr. Boddicker. Like, uh, shouldn't you be calling the police when this wanted criminal comes in? Nope. Yeah. Um, Eyes on the Wire here says, my grandfather worked at the steel mill uh, that Robocop was filmed at. The wow. Monessen Steelworks, about 45 minutes south of Pittsburgh, uh, PA. Sadly, it's no longer there. Okay. Cool. Okay, so I maybe I went to a different one then. I thought that, okay, my mistake. I thought that one was in Dallas. I know that the gas station that Emil gets shot at, that is in Dallas. So maybe... I went to a is different. That, I mean, is that still there? That gas station? No, that's long gone. Right. Okay. Hmm. Okay. I could have sworn that uh, my friend took me to a steel mill, but if it's in uh, Pittsburgh, then I can't say I've been to that one. Yeah. I mean, I assume it was dis it was decommissioned when they did the filming because it looked pretty out of action, you know. Um, Ryan Barrett says, Robocop is full of brutal, gruesome scenes. What is the most brutal scene of any film you have seen? Have you ever had to look away from a movie? Oh, oh good question. Huh. I mean, I, I haven't watched it all the way through, but I've seen the, the scene from Bone Tomahawk when they, they scalp a guy uh, and then basically split him in half. That's, that's pretty gory. Well, that's probably one of the most gruesome ones I can remember, um, just because it's like quite well acted as it goes. Mm -hmm. um, a lot of scenes of, of you know people getting limbs blown off and stuff like the Saw movies. Um, you know, there's one where like the they've got like one of the the dudes on a, a rack thing that twists all of your limbs until they snap uh, and like, the bones like explode out and stuff. Like it's it's all stuff like that, and it's like you know there's never really been one where I've had to look away from it. Mm. It's it's because you can you you can divorce yourself from it at a certain point and be like, ah, oh, it's just, you know, it's prosthetics and you right. know, special effects and all that. Um, but yeah, there's times when I've looked at it and just been like, yeah, I'm not really enjoying watching this. It's more like, it's just over the top, um, mean spirited torture porn, you know? Uh, and it's not the sort of thing that I enjoy in, in horror films and, and that sort of thing. Like, um, same with the hostel movies where, you know, there's a scene where a woman gets her face blowtorched and like her eyes hanging out and stuff. It's really gory and it's like it's impressive from a technical point of view, but I'm not like enjoying watching that. You know, that sort of thing doesn't like do it for me in terms of horror films. Yeah, I agree. I had I had scrubbed through those movies, like the hostel, like those Eli Roth movies, and it yeah. just left, it left a bad taste in my mouth. I'm like, I don't want this in my mind. So. Yeah. Um, so in chat here they're saying the worst scene in robocop was murphy's brutal death scene yeah it definitely was um yeah it's um it's unpleasant to watch some people are mentioning the rape scene in irreversible um i've never seen that actually so i don't know but i i do remember hearing something about it like it's done as of like one take so it's quite um it just keeps coming at you um and so it's quite difficult to watch from that point of view but yeah i've never never seen it so i couldn't can answer to it yeah that's another harsh movie there's also a scene in the nightclub in that movie where a guy gets uh, done in by a fire extinguisher and it is quite disturbing mm -hmm. um, people in the chat if you've seen that movie you know know the scene i'm referring to uh, uh, the someone else mentioned deliverance uh the rape scene in that yeah uh, <laughs> not a fun scene to watch um done it played out in quite a, a disturbing way as well just the way the guys act mm -hmm. um, and the way it's shot yeah it's it's quite effective especially considering how old it is you know that would have been pretty um nowadays it wouldn't be seen as much of anything but like back then it would have been extremely like you know pushing the the boundaries of what they could get away with mm -hmm, for sure 
Uh, and yeah, I mean, I know you love Event Horizon, but I remember the first time I saw that movie, I was like, uh, <laughs> there's a scene where someone, like, I think it, it was at an autopsy table or something, or and the yeah, body just was all hewn and like pulled apart. And I just remember the first time I saw that, it got burned into my brain of just like, oh, that's too much. I think I just found my limit. The, yeah, I know the scene you're meaning. It's like the guy's been kind of um, vivisected, and then his, his, right. what's left of him is hung above the table, and then all his organs and stuff are lying underneath him. Oh. Uh, and it's, yeah, it's pretty gory. <laughs> I'm not going to lie. Um, I mean, a lot of uh, a lot of event horizons like that, but it's all done really quick. Like mm-hmm. most of the, the the worst gore scenes are really quick cuts where it's only like a few frames, right? And it's like you know you see it for a second and then it's gone and you're like you're not quite sure what you saw. Mm-hmm. Um, and the the scene with the crew log um, where you find out what happened to the original crew of the ship is, um, yeah, again, lots of disturbing imagery in that, but it's very quick jump cuts all over the place, and that's why I'm saying like the original um, director's cut was a much longer and the, the gore scenes were much more intense um, to the point where they, they had to cut it down massively. Um, and it would have been interesting just to see what they put in there. Again, not because I'm a huge fan of gore, but just to see where they took it. Hmm. Yeah, I don't know if I can handle it. Yeah. Um, I... In terms of gore scenes, I like I personally cannot handle bone breaking for some reason. Like uh, I'll watch gunshots and you know impalements and decapitations till the cows come home, but I cannot handle bone breaking and joint dislocation. So to this day, like you know the scene from Lethal Weapon Two where he where he pops his shoulder out in order to take the straight jacket off, I can't handle that. Oh, okay. Uh, see, I I never really. With that, I was like, oh, it's just a cool little thing that he can do. I guess I, I never sort of thought, like, oh, it's probably like doing a lot of damage there, like, you know, dislocating your shoulder. I will uh, say. I know what, you, I, I know what I, you mean about bones breaking, though, like, the, like especially if they break through the skin. <laughs> oh, it's it's just so hard to, I don't know why, it's it just so hard to see. Yeah. Um, a couple of mentions of human centipede here. Um, oh, no. I've only seen the first one. I've never seen like the second or third. Um, I, from what I understand, the, the the third one's just a complete farce, and the second one is just really unpleasant. Uh, so I had no particular desire to watch it. The first one isn't actually that gory. It's more just the, the thought of what's actually happened to them that's right. the, the unpleasantness. Um, but yeah. Anyway, lovely. <laughs> okay, I don't... Now, I, now that's in my head. Okay, time for another drink. Yep. Um, what's the next one here? Um, Neil Hersig, the tattoo artist. Uh, is it nice having both Riker's beard and first name? Uh, yes. Excellent. Mm. Um, I, I, my beard isn't as awesome as Riker's, but I do try. Um, T Toms, great as always, guys. Hope you do Demolition Man and or True Lies at some point. Uh, I mean, I've already reviewed Demolition Man, so I kind of feel like I've. I probably said as, as much as I can say about that movie. Um, True Lies would be an interesting one to review, though, because uh, I, I like James Cameron films, or I did until recently. Um, Before they True got Lies, all- is, yeah, yeah. Um, and True Lies is one of those weird ones where it's like in this sort of great kind of record of James Cameron films, it's the one people talk about the least. Like it doesn't have the impact of Terminator Two or Aliens, um, but it was a pretty solid, like action movie with a bit of comedy sprinkled Mm -hmm. in oh for sure i think it was supposed to be like a his spoof take on the spy movie genre yeah and it's really if you watch it back now you realize that it's really about um what's her name jamie lee curtis's character true yes it's kind of about her like um you know, having kind of a midlife crisis and, and finding a way to get out of that and, um, you know, finding a new sort of like lease of life um, and learning to love her husband again. So it's kind of a, yeah, it's an interesting like flip on the your expectations, I guess. And Cameron's always been about that kind of thing, like having these these more interesting like sort of female characters that are they're strong and capable, but they're also kind of human and they got flaws. So mm-hmm. yeah, he did that quite well with this. And plus you have to give a give props again to Bill Paxton for his contribution in that movie. 
oh, he was just having great fun with that. You know, I love when they've got him at gunpoint and mm-hmm. like he recognizes Arnold Schwarzenegger. <laughs> He's <laughs> like, "Are you still interested in that bet at all?" Hey, hey, like, it's you. Uh, I'll give it to you for free. You can have it. <laughs> still trying to sell him the car. <laughs> I got a small dick. It's pathetic. <laughs> piss himself. Yeah. Oh God, he was great in that. Um, Philip JY uh, gave me a super sticker, so thanks very much, man. Um, Daveski nods. Uh, Hawk the Slayer stream when? Um, I will do my best. Mm. Dominic the Donkey. Robo Waifu goes boing boing. Now they would be a different movie. Yeah, I'm sure there's a porn version of Robocop out there somewhere. Oh, All right to Pornhub. Let's find out. <laughs> Uh, I'm I'm not gonna cross the streams on that. Yeah, don't cross the streams. Um, sarcastic mailman. I love this movie. When are you going to review the games again, drinker? Or sorry, just games in general. Have you played Jedi Fallen Order or Ghost of Tsushima? Uh, I played Ghost of Tsushima. I'm about halfway through it. It's great. It's just all consuming. Like it's such a big quest that you go on. There's so many side stories and everything. Uh, but a fantastic game, and I really like it. I'm going to be doing a stream soon, actually, uh, of me playing Resident Evil 3. I'm just going to try and speedrun it and see if I can do it all in one one sitting. Uh, because it's it turns out it's actually really easy to stream from like a PS5. So I'm just going to do that straight to my channel. It's good fun. I, th- I think you should play the PC version of it because apparently there are a lot of mods where Jill can be dressed up in a variety of different outfits. Ah, so see, I've completed it, so I've got her in the original boob tube um, outfit. Okay, which is which is definitely an improvement because the outfit they gave her in like the the remake is just like a really boring generic like vest and jeans combination. Mm-hmm. It's like, oh man, like I've seen so many characters dressed like this. Like, give them something different. At least her original outfit had. Uh, well, it stood out anyway. It sure um, did, and it. <laughs> It totally takes me back to like high school. Like boob tubes and crop tops were like all the rage in the late nineties. Hell yeah! Uh, um, but they weren't the most practical things because like if the girls were running about in them, like you know, um, fallouts were all too common. <laughs> Put oh, it that way. Yeah. <laughs> and then, it, then I think there was the term sharking, where you would just run up behind someone and just like yank it down. Yeah, that happened a few times. I don't endorse that kind of behavior naturally. No, no, but, no uh, I'm not calling for that. I'm, just... I'm always there to point and laugh when it happens. <laughs> um, <laughs> Martin Sevec, or sorry, Sevchech. Supposedly, the ball shot on the rapist wasn't planned until, very ho- until Verhoeven noticed how she was being held and had her legs splayed, which gave him the idea. Hmm. Now, that's interesting. Okay. Because, yeah, I kind of thought... When I remembered this scene, I thought she was just stood on the ground, and I, I was playing it out in my head. I was like, ah, she, she would probably be shorter than the guy that she's being held by, right. so how could Robocop shoot between her legs and hit him in the in the groin? And then, yeah, when I watched it today, I was like, ah, okay, he picks her up and holds her in the air. That's mm-hmm. how it works. Um, but yeah, if that's how it played out, great. I wondered how they were originally going to script that scene then. Maybe he just shot him in the head or something like that. Yeah, I, 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 is, I, I remember it was in the trailer, so uh, definitely very effective. I think it was a happy accident. Yeah, no, that's, that's good. Um, Action.com here says, isn't it weird that movies that try to satirize or make fun of the future are more accurate than the ones that are trying to take the future seriously? Yeah, it's kind of sad, really. Um, but that's where we're at. Yeah, I mean, there's so many movies that we've talked about, uh, like Predator 2, again, or, or Demolition Man. You know, it's like, take a look at Los Angeles, 1997. Uh, and you're trying to make it look all scary and dystopian. I will never get there. Uh, and we are. Yeah, you got to love it. David Steele says, love the original Robocop and thought the remake was okay. Drinker, do you think the remake would have been better if we didn't have the original to compare it to? Uh, I, I can't say rightly because I haven't seen it yet, but um, you, you're inevitably going to have to compare a remake to the original. And um, the original takes some beating, like dodgy special effects aside. I think that adds to its charm, actually. Uh, sure. But I think it's just a, it's just a, a movie that's smarter than you know you would think. 
on first glance um, and it's efficient, got a nice tight script. Yeah, I think it's a tough one to beat, really, if you're remaking it. Yeah, I'd, I've seen RoboCop so many times, and uh, so I pretty much had the movie memorized. So when I saw the remake, I saw the beats that they were trying to replicate and the story point, points that they were trying to replicate, but it just falls apart. It doesn't have the same feel. The effects were fantastic, and I love the industrial design of the, uh, the police units, but the movie itself is lacking. I'm going to have to see it, though. I think after having watched this one today, it's like, well, I, I need to at least see where they took it in terms mm -hmm. of the remake. Because chat's a, a total mixed bag on this one. Some people are saying it was awful. Some people are saying it was all right, and it's like underrated. Mm -hmm. So I don't know, man. It's going to be a, a weird one. Well, I'll tell you right now, when it came out, it was rated PG-13, not R. So you can take that for what it's worth. Yeah. See, that's that's where it goes wrong. You want the gore, don't you? It's that's part of the the whole reason behind RoboCop was that over the top violence. Yeah. Uh, Martin Sevchech here says the choice of the Taurus actually came about because they wanted a car that looked futuristic and initially wanted the six thousand SUX design as a special car that RoboCop would use, but changed their minds and saw the Taurus's more curved, less boxy design as that futuristic look they were looking for. Okay. Interesting. Yeah. Um, I mean, it really, like, in the movie, it just looks like a regular car that they glued a bunch of, like, extra bits onto. For sure. To make it look a bit more futuristic, but, yeah. It kind of looks like a piece of shit. <laughs> yeah. I mean, it's... You'd have to think of, like, who would market something like this? It's, it's this sloppy. Yeah. Um, the Justice 35 says... Three films were gifted to the race of men, but they were all of them deceived, for another Robocop was made. Yeah. <laughs> Indeed, one okay. Robocop to rule them all. All right. Good use of uh, the Lord of the Rings trilogy uh, yeah. there. Uh, Cheers. Yeah. I, I don't think the remake rules them all, though, sadly. No. Um, I, it probably rules Robocop 3, because that was god awful. Oh, what a movie. I think the low point, the truly the low point for me was when he's fighting a samurai. Oh man! I just, I just wanted that to stop. Oh, uh, the grinning samurai, and he like he hits him in the face, and then his face is all fucked up, and he's got that weird diabolical grin. I'm like, okay, you've gone too far now. Oh yeah. Uh, Armstrong, you down with OCP? Yeah, you know me. Yeah. Oh, all right. Well done. Um, Blue Satoshi, future gas, more like internet gas. Am I right? Mm. Yeah, Daniel Kibble Smith will be well proud of that one. That's truly his greatest contribution to humanity. Um, just, I, I suspect you don't know what I'm talking about here, Danquish, but it's uh, Marvel released a new comic book called um, The New Warriors, and they've got like characters called Safe Space. And, oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Yeah, I, that one. Yeah. So one of them's called. Um, fucking, uh, God knows what. It's like Internet oh. Man or something. Yeah, and he inhaled exactly. Internet Gas that keeps them connected online all the time. Jeez, what the hell was that? <laughs> safe place, uh, safe space, snowflake. Yep. Oh, yeah. That was definitely cringeworthy. It, it really is like that Key and Peele sketch where like he's Stan Lee pitching to like Marvel and he just comes up with like shit that's only relevant to old people. Like, um, oh, it's Computer Man. He's got the ability to understand technology. <laughs> It's like, yeah, most people have got that, Stan. It's just because wow. you're like 100 years old. <laughs> well, internet gas. Um, yeah. Put me down for some of that. Uh, yeah. I, I just genuinely, my mind boggles like how that functions. Like, do you just yeah. do you just inhale it and then you've got the internet like in you? Maybe. Who knows? I don't know. Like, I'm checking my PC right now to see if I have any gas leaks coming out of it. And so far, so good. It's screen time, his name is. Yeah. Screen um, time, yeah. Daniel Kibblesmith, if you're watching this, please make yourself known in chat and explain it to us. Somehow I suspect he's not. Um, Hacker Man. I wish he was. Ha I wish Hacker Man was in it. Oh, but yeah, absolutely. I, I do have to say thank you to you, actually, for um, prompting me to watch Kung Fury because okay. genuinely it was a fantastic film. Okay, we, we've been waiting like such a long time to hear your thoughts on it because it is such a, a, a drinker-worthy movie. 
it's I should honestly review it because it's so rare that a movie properly has me laughing out loud. But it's just the the sheer like um, unashamedness of it. Oh, <laughs> like, it's it's fantastic! It's just incredible. I have uh, to I, ask, love... I have to ask though: Were you able to blink or breathe for the entire duration of it, or were you just captivated? I was pretty captivated. Okay. Yeah, the 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 main actor that they've got. Um, who, who you know playing the main character like mm-hmm. his delivery is amazing like yeah. his, his voiceover is awesome just when he runs into like he travels back in time and there's like a raptor there that shoots laser beams at him and he's yeah. like ah laser raptors i thought they went extinct thousands of years ago i, I went like, back to so, far fuck yeah th- there's so much you could unpack with that yeah. one sentence <laughs> and then who comes to save him but a barbarian on a wolf with a minigun yeah barbariana yeah and uh, Thor's there as yep. well, and he's just like he's completely unfazed with meeting the God of Thunder. That's you know, right. he's just like, "Thanks, Thor." Let's just see. flexing. Check out my pecs. You're ep- yeah, pretty epic, sir. Yeah, for an old guy, he's doing pretty well. Like, yeah, um, one day I'll review it because that that movie was just genuinely beautiful. Perfect. Right. Glad you enjoyed it. Um, Ryan Barrett here says. Uh, Thank you for discussing not only the action of this 80s classic, but also Murphy's humanity and the socioeconomic themes this movie plays with. Mm-hmm. Thank you. It's, uh, it, it was a pleasure to talk about. It really was. Uh, Automata. The nightclub scene is also notable for the ministry uh, slash PTP sound track, uh, Show Me Your Spine, early wow. wax track sound, tracking with the rise of industrial music. Mm. Damn. In the late 80s as well. Yeah. Okay. Good call on that one. Yeah. Um, Nino Marocci, I uh, loved your video on cancel culture drinker. Thank you. Um, I really enjoyed the making that one. Um, I normally like my videos are all about just kind of mocking things and having a laugh, but that was like more of a serious one because the way she, the way things seem to be going, particularly when I made it, was like every old movie was getting dug up and they were all getting um scrutinized by like the ministry of truth like oh yes we need to censor this and we need to put warnings on this because it might offend someone and it just uh made me feel kind of sick um the the presumptuousness and the arrogance of people now to think like you can take classic movies that were made by people with way more talent than they have nowadays and just like delete bits from them because you don't like it anymore it's like oh no quit Um, that and again, that's what makes Demolition, Demolition Man so painful to watch now, in retrospect. Oh yeah, that's like, that's coming to that's coming to pass. Like, you, yeah, it will it'd be a matter of time before you have those fucking machines in your living room. Be like, oh, you're in viola- violation of the verbal morality statute. Exactly. Uh, I think we're uh, uh, we're getting pretty close to that. Yeah, I think Stolen had the best reaction to that. It's just like oh, so sure. much for the three seashells. <laughs> that's right. But if that paper is anything like the stuff that you see coming out of those dispensers, I don't think you really want to take care of yourself with that. Yeah, it could be an, it could be a tough experience, I think. He'll find a way, though. He's still on. True. Um, Mick Lally says, Ellen Page looks like Robocop without his helmet. <laughs> Ouch. Because I saw her in um, Umbrella Academy. That was Ellen Page. Yeah, that's Ellen Page. Um, she's just really bland and boring to look at. Yeah, it's like it's like someone took a character creation screen and just like set everything to like standard, hmm. you know, All on right. a game. It's just meh. Yeah. Um, Stretchy Hulk says during the final action scene, one of the cars flings off one of the hubcaps straight at the camera. Yeah, it does. Um, I always wondered if that was a lucky mistake. Uh, no idea. Um, but it it was good angles on it if mm-hmm. it was just a random one because it goes right by the camera and it just looks very cinematic, you know? Mm-hmm. So I, th- I like to think it just, you know, they probably shoot scenes like that many, many times and it just happened to do it on that one take and then they thought, right. yeah, that looks cool. We should use that one. I, just trying to th- I, I think they commented on that when I watched the director's co- commentary years ago. Um, and yeah, that might have been a happy accident. Uh, just looking at chat as well. They were talking about Ellen Page and Umbrella Academy. Yes, yeah, just looked 
what was it? So um, she looked so worn and miserable in Umbrella Academy. Um, when she was in Juno and Super, she was cute and pretty. Uh, yeah, that's when she was actually allowed to show personality. I remember those days. Um, but yeah, she was an absolute drip in Umbrella Academy. Hmm. Uh, Stephen Otten, most gruesome death ever. That'll be Alex Murphy getting gunned down. Yeah. True, but again, I'm gonna. I'm just watching the scene again. Uh, Emil getting turned into like tomato paste. That's <laughs> mush. <laughs> I love how his whole body like just explodes, but his head yeah. goes flying right over the, the top of the car. <laughs> as far as special effects go or practical effects, that was pretty epic. Yeah. Like I'd really like to know how they set that up. Like, did they just create like a a, a a prosthetic of him that they run into and it just explodes. I assume, yeah, it would be like a, a mannequin or something mm -hmm. that was um, easily destroyable. So like um, very thin plastic or something like that. I, they probably filled it with like bits of meat and mm -hmm. like liquid and stuff so that when the car hits it at high speed, yeah, it can just Ugh. explode in spectacular fashion. But they would have to be done really quick because obviously it wouldn't be moving. So mm -hmm. you'd have to just get a really quick shot of it, and then pff, the car hits it. Speaking of which, I took your recommendation, and I watched uh, The Thing again the other day. Just oh, yeah. To, you know, just to relive, you know, that great 80s movie. And, yeah, it is just so, like, the, the suspense, you know, uh, the, the tension amongst the, the people is as awesome. But the practical special effects is so gross and unsettling, and the body horror in it. Yeah. Um, yeah, great, the, um, the yeah, I mean the extent that they had to go to um, to make a lot of these scenes work, like um, especially some of the the more complex creature effects, where there would be like a team of guys like manipulating the the movements of it, yeah, um, or you know where the guy gets his arms bitten off, and like instead of giving him fake arms, they just put a, a cast of the actor's face <laughs> onto an amputee, and it's just like really like inventive ways to get around these problems that. For sure. um, you know, you obviously don't have to do nowadays. You can just you can CGI his arms out, and you know it would look shit. And like, yeah, I just love that they they had to put more thought and work into movies back then, for sure. And, and it's genuinely disgusting a lot of the time when you see people start to mutate and change. Oh, it's so hard. Like, just for ref um, for comparison, I watched the remake or whatever it was. I guess it was a prequel or something, mm -hmm. uh, but the one that came out a few years ago, and it. It was over the top with the body horror to the point of it just didn't carry the same feel. Yeah. And I think that, because I'm sure they, they used a lot of practical effects in the prequel. Uh, and then the studio executives looked at it and they're like, no, it's, it's, it's either like not convincing enough or mm -hmm. it's, it's too disgusting or something. So like they, they mandated that they replaced a lot of it with CGI. And that's what you ended up with. It's like, why would you ever do that? Yeah. Especially with the thing that's known for its practical effects. Yeah, exactly. It's just insane. Um, Scott S here says, drinker, fuck yeah, it'll be fine, my lovely linguistic lion of language lore. Thank you. Um, and thanks, wow. for the, thanks for the donation. Um, Ninas, when Ed 209 attacks Robocop is one of the best. You see his eye for the first time after his death. The contrast between a soulless toaster and a man. Yeah, like Danquish, you referenced that yourself. Like mm. You get that close-up shot of his visor with his eye just visible through it. It's good. It's a good scene. Very well done. You see the fear in his eye, I think, as well, which is good. For sure, yeah. Uh, Action Com here says, did Robocop fake out Clarence by pretending to yell in pain so that Clarence's ego would get him within striking distance of Murphy's spike? Hmm. I did wonder about that because I don't think Robocop feels pain in the sense that like, if you damaged his mechanical parts, he would feel it. Yeah. Uh, and that's what he seemed to be attacking. It was like his chest armor rather than like Murphy's flesh or anything. Well, I don't think it's ever... <clears throat> ever implied or shown in the movie just what like how much of his biological systems are left um you know morton says i thought we agreed on total body prosthesis now lose the arm so i guess we're left to believe that he's just a torso and a head so maybe he still has his internal organs uh, i think there's maybe even less of him than that like because he's got his digestive system mm -hmm. we know that because um, he has to eat 
I guess he would need lungs because he would need to bring in oxygen. So the, they would be there. I don't know if he would need a heart. Would they have a mechanical heart, perhaps? I'm not sure. Well, uh, they expand upon that, or they sort of uh, expose that for you in the remake. Uh, right. Which is what I was telling you earlier. There's a really cool scene where they it, they reveal uh, Robocop to himself. You know, they show his reflection so that he can see mm -hmm. uh, that this is reality and not just a, some bad nightmare. And it was it's a really cool scene. Um, but yeah, there's not much left of him. Okay. Um, I, I could totally buy into this suggestion though, that, um, it was a bit of an act so that he mm. could try and lure Clarence in okay. and then knife him. Um, mm -hmm. it would make sense for him to do that. Um, but it, I think it's kind of unknown based on what we know of his physiology. Like it's, it's a little bit of guesswork, I think, mm -hmm. uh, super flea says, sorry, super fly. Uh, drinker trivia tidbit uh, the shiny desert eagle was going to be robocop's gun but when they tested it it looked too small in his hands mm. uh, okay okay that's interesting um the actual weapon that they gave him um i think you were away when i was talking about this but it's clearly mm. some kind of burst fire pistol because it seems to fire in three shot bursts uh, i have no idea what it is but it kind of looks like a conventional gun with like a lot of extra stuff added onto it it is a beretta 92f uh, right, the same, yeah. The same gun that they used in Equilibrium, but also what John McClane had in, in uh, Die Hard. And then the prop department just added on uh, a stylized barrel. Okay. So is it the burst fire variant of the Beretta? Because I know uh, that it can do that if you put an extended mag on it and you can change it. I don't know what they call it. Is it like an FS or something they call it? I believe it is, yes. Right, okay. Because um, it does seem to fire in bursts. Mm -hmm. Or at least the, the, that's the way the sound effects guys done it. Right. Kind of hard and you, to tell. Like the, the sound effects, you know, it was just like the alien's pulse rifle. You know, it was just like, wow, that's a cool sound. How many shots is it actually firing? Uh, but you get a sort of hint later when he shoots Emil's van just before he hits the toxic waste. Mm -hmm. he, fi he fires once, like one burst, and you see, I think, five bullet holes in the windshield of the yes. van. Yeah. Uh, people are saying it's a 93R. Yeah, so it's that's okay. a free round burst that it will fire. Okay. Uh, so I can go with that, yeah. Um, but it's a cool gun anyway. Um, and yeah, you, I guess with a, a guy the size of Robocop with you know the, the gloves that he wears, like the, the prosthetic hands, it would need to be a big gun to balance that out. So it does look suitable. Um, but yeah, he would be out of ammunition in like two seconds <laughs> with something like that. I always wondered about that. Like the first time I saw the movie in the theater and he's at the range, it's like he fires so many times without reloading. Like, uh, are you using future ammo or just how big is the magazine in this gun? Movie gun, movie right. guns. They're great. You know, <laughs> um, what's the next one? Ace spades, uh, says, thank you. $2 super chat. So thank you. Appreciate it. Uh, Ninas, Says, you're dead. We killed you. Pew, pew. We killed you. Yeah. That's uh, Emil. Uh, that's, that, that screen grab was, I had posters of that all over my bedroom as a as a teen. Like, uh, it's one of the promo shots that they used. And I just loved the body acting that Peter Weller did there. Um, like, he's got his left hand up in the air for whatever reason while he's holding his pistol with his right hand. And it was just, and you got the explosion in the background. It was just really cool. It was a, mm. it was a cool scene. No, it's, he, he, he poses sometimes when he fires. Mm -hmm. uh, right, where did I get to? Damn it. Sorry, I have to refresh sometimes with the, the super chat so I can catch up to myself. Uh, oh yeah, Hartsner says, wasn't one scene in the final fight a reference to Jesus Christ where Robocop is seemingly walking on water? Yes. Absolutely. Paul Verhoeven references that as well. Um, oh yeah, of course, like when he's when he's walking towards Clarence. Yeah, mm -hmm. okay, I get you. Um, could well be. Yeah, if, if so, good detail. Um, Captain Spire, I'm disappointed they never had Newcomb board game. <laughs> Yeah, I would have played it. I totally would play that, yeah. Any board game that's got loads of buttons and stuff that you can press, that's great. And a holographic explosion. 
Yes, definitely. Um, Mr. Oh, Bentham. Sorry, what was that? Oh, I was just going to say, speaking of, uh, it just occurred to me, uh, board games. Have you seen the movie Battleship? Uh, yes. You have? Okay. I would love to hear what the drinker thinks of that movie. Personally, I think it's one of those guilty pleasure movies that's just a lot of fun. I mean, yeah. Like, if you can just separate your brain from your body and just, like, watch the, the pretty things explode, then you'll be fine. Um, but man, yeah, if I was to try and review it, like in terms of the plot making sense, mm -hmm. wow. Yeah. <laughs> that's a different, that's a different prospect, All but right. just seeing like an old timey battleship blowing the shit out of, uh, the alien spaceship. It was great fun. I was just watching that. Like, Hey, this is yeah. awesome. Why not? Exactly. Yeah. I love battleships. Who doesn't like a good battleship? Um, add on a banging ACDC soundtrack and, uh, you're good to go. Exactly, yeah, exactly. It, that's a movie, it knew exactly what it was, and mm -hmm. fair enough, you know. Um, Mr. Bentham, I would love to have a box set. Do it! Uh, I don't know if that's my books he was referencing. Um, mm -hmm. If so, I'll get back to you, see what I can do. Um, Gianni Greco, uh, Jesus had days like this, hounded <laughs> and attacked like a criminal, but like <laughs> him, I don't blame you. They program you, and you do it. <laughs> Yeah, that's Kane, isn't it? It is. It is. Good call. Good job <laughs> his, on del one. his delivery there was great. Like, way, obviously, way better than mine. But uh, yeah, his, his uh, that's when Robocop's been taken prisoner by him, isn't mm -hmm. it? Yeah, uh, Kane was a good character. That that actor is just so genuinely creepy. Um, I think he was in the X Files as well. Uh, is it Tom Noonan? I need to know. I need to look that up. Uh, oh, 1990. Kane, Tom Noonan. Yep. Tom Noonan, yeah. Um, he was also in, oh man, Last Action Hero. I think he was the villain in that. Okay. The Ripper. Yeah. Good actor. Good, um, good, good villainous actor. Genuinely um, creepy. Um, that's also got that scene in Robocop 2 where the guy gets like cut open. Yes. From stem to stern. Um, yeah. Yeah, that's a quite a disturbing one, actually. It's just the fact that it takes so long, like the build up to it. Yeah. Um, yeah, it's quite a quite an effective scene. Uh, uh, Captain Spire, ever seen the fan made Robocop crotch sock parody? Uh, no, uh, I've never seen that. I didn't even no. know it existed. Explain. Yeah, I'll need to look that up. Um, Anonymous Coward 3000. Can you do an episode of The Drinker Fixies on Robocop 3? <laughs> wow. Oh, I don't know. I don't think I there's, mean, a, there's no scotch strong enough to handle that one. Because, yeah, most of the time it's like the bare bones of, of a good idea are there. And you can just tweak things to to get it on track, but like with Robocop three, like I don't know if I'd even have made that film in the first place. It was unnecessary. Yeah, I mean, really, like the second one was kind of unnecessary too. Like I could have just done with the first, and that would have been fine. True. Uh, but um, yeah, I would really need to rewatch it and get a good feel for it again. See if there's anything you could do. Um, John Ochiltree says, "Just wanted to say how hilarious was it that Nancy Allen just had to sneak." Sorry, had to sneak a peek while the guy was taking a leak. That mm -hmm. wouldn't fly today. <laughs> nope. Uh, yeah, isn't this is probably one of the only times you ever see a guy using like sexuality to like get one over on a woman? I can't mm -hmm. think of any time that's ever happened in a movie. That's true. But, so um, yeah, this is this is just equality, man. Yeah, but we should be all in favor of it. Yeah, we were equal opportunity in the eighties. Exactly. I uh, see. We we're progressive back then. We were. Uh, Solar Sailor 41 says, Drinker and Danquish, hi there. Uh, love the critical revisits. Congrats on the book. What are you writing next? My birthday is on Thursday, so here's a drink on me. Well, I hope you have an amazing birthday, man. Um, what am I writing next? I don't know at the moment. Um, I've got another book that I've mostly written, and I think we need to do some edits on it, um, but we'll see um, if that proves to be my next novel. I'm going to talk with my publisher about it pretty soon. Um, but stay tuned. I can't say much more about it at this stage. 
but yeah, um, I might take a break from the Ryan Drake series and um, and move on to some other stuff. Maybe do some standalone novels. But I really like doing thrillers and action based stories, so uh, that's my genre that I like doing. Um, Rob Ashley, uh, there is an Event Horizon sequel. It's called Warhammer Forty K. Yeah, hmm. it is. It's just the warp that the the Event Horizon goes into. Um, I would just love it if that if they were genuinely tied together. Like if there was a little bit of lore in 40k somewhere talking about the Event Horizon ship. <laughs> That'd be great. I've never actually played Warhammer. Uh, yeah, I mean it's it's this it's obviously like this sci-fi thing. It's set in yeah. the far future, and like the idea is that you can travel through warp space to okay. get from one place to another. Uh, but it's not like warp in Star Trek terms. It's more like this dimension of like chaos and death and like it's filled with like demons and stuff and mm. you need to be like protected in order to travel through it. And sometimes okay. it doesn't work and you, you'll just get lost forever in it. Um, so it's exactly like Event Horizon, essentially. The idea is like the Event Horizon went in with no protection and this is the result. Mm. Okay. Uh, but yeah, it's quite quite cool. Like the the amount of lore and background to it is just incredible at this point. It's mm. Well, it's a very well developed universe. Uh, what's the next one here? Jason the Lemon just jumped in for a quick hi and thanks for these movie talks. They're great. I'm looking forward to listening to this after work. Cool man. Um, thanks for the the donation and um, yeah, I hope we we provide you some entertainment and I hope your shift goes in quick. Uh, Samurai Squirrel, is Event Horizon in the so bad it's good class? No, it's so good that it's good. Mm. All right. I'll not hear a word said against it. That's right. Yeah, I'm just fighting words. Uh, Wormy Spoons donated $2 for a super chat, or £2, sorry, so thanks very much for that. Um, Ryan Barrett, have you seen Brawl in Cell Block 99? It's from the writer and director of Bone Tomahawk. I'd love your thoughts on that. Uh, I haven't seen it yet, no, but I've heard that Vince Vaughn's really good in it. Have you seen it, Danquish? I have not, no. Cool. Um, yeah, like I say, I've heard good things about it, and I've heard that he's actually, you know, he's normally known for doing comedy roles, but, like, he plays it pretty serious in this, and, yeah, it's apparently meant to be good, but I'll need to see that sometime. Um, Stephen Otten, the Plakeeps. Fuck, I can never say this word. Plakeepsy? Is that how you say it? Pl oh. Uh, Plowkeepsy. It's how it's written, but I know it's not actually said like that. Fuck. This is this is where my lack of like American background knowledge kicks in. I think it's Plakeepsy uh -huh. tapes. Anyway, it was the most messed up movie I've seen recently. Uh, yeah, I haven't seen that one, I'm afraid. Uh, and now you've got me intrigued. Plakeepsy. Okay, there we go. Uh, yeah, I don't know how to... People yeah, are saying it, it's pronounced Pokeepsy. Okay. 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 Pokeepsy. Yeah. All right. I'm sorry that I'm butchering your, your place names here. Um, but honestly, if you had to pronounce half of the Scottish towns, then uh, you'd probably struggle as well. That's, oh, man. We've got some some right humdingers. Our ongoing joke in our house is uh, we had a, co a co-worker of ours who was, uh, had a child and had named the child Kaylee. And the way he spelt it, we did not know that that's how it was pronounced. Right, yeah. It was it C-E-I-L-I-D-H? Yes. We, we would have never guessed that that, that said Kaylee. So. Uh, yeah, I, I, I don't even know what to say to you on that one. Yeah, a lot of the words that you'll see, like especially at, like original Gaelic words, mm -hmm. like, yeah, they, they're, they're not pronounced anything like how they're written. Mm -hmm. And it's just, it's a language that wasn't really invented for the written word, I guess. That's probably the reason for it. All right. Um, what's the next one? Not Alpharius here says, speaking of snapping bone scenes, thoughts on the Riddick movies? Uh, first one was good. Yeah. Second I... one, I didn't really care about the Chronicles of Riddick. Uh, and the third one was kind of meh. You know, it wasn't as good as the first, but it was okay. I think the the second one was like they they gave Vin Diesel too much creative control, hmm. uh, and he tried to bring in this weird like um, you know 
almost like Warhammer 40k kind of kind of lore into it, where you've got like the necromongers, and it's like it's got like borderline magic in it, and you've got ethereals and all this weird stuff. Like it's so out of step with the first film, uh, and it's just they took it in a really bad direction. It just felt really self indulgent. Yeah, I, I I barely remember them. I think they were just too entirely forgettable for me. Yeah. Um, Wormy Spoons gave me two pounds, so thank you. Thanks for that super chat. Um, Natty here says, do you think when nationalism wins out in the West and groups like Patriotic Alternative come to the fore, we will have a media renaissance? Mm. I don't know, if I'm honest with you. Um, the, the way the media is set up at the moment, um, it seems to be a kind of a dying industry, really, uh, the mainstream media. So you know, when they don't have guys like the orange man in office to hate on and get ratings out of, I don't know what they would talk about. Exactly. That's, uh, I'm kind of hoping that we'll have a time of peace for the next few years where people aren't constantly railing on the orange man. Yeah. Um, but yeah, I honestly don't know where it's going to head in terms of all that. Uh, I'm not really too well versed in the politics of it. Um, Super awesome space paladin says Red Dragon or Silence of the Lambs. I prefer the former. Uh, I'm going to say I prefer Silence of the Lambs, mm. if I'm honest with you. Um, it was more disturbing for me, uh, very, um, and I, I preferred that that si that version of Hannibal Lecter. I think by the time you got to Red Dragon, it's you know wasn't quite as good. I'm but that's gonna, just me. I'm going to quickly take a, a break, and I'll be right back. No worries. Um, Action Come here says Terminator versus Robocop. Is that viable? Uh, I don't know how you would do it. Um, I'd love to see it though. I'd love to see a Terminator fight in Robocop. <laughs> it would be great for the spectacle, if nothing else. Um, I mean, I kind of feel like Robocop would probably prevail. Yeah, I'd like to see that. Um, John Orchard. Met Dr. Weller. The guy is as cool as the other side of the pillow. Watched him interact with fans. It made you feel like you were the only person in the room. Um, so I guess that's Peter Weller. Um, yeah, that'd be quite cool to meet him, actually. Um, I, I've not seen him in many other things apart from, you know, the Robocop movies. I saw him in a movie called Screamers, which was like a, a kind of horror sci-fi movie. Um and he's like leading a squad of soldiers on like this planet that's been taken over by like these uh, robotic killing machines. Um, and it was pretty disturbing as well because it's got them like masquerading as children. So it's yeah, pretty disturbing stuff, but he, he played it great. Um, PSX hacker irreversible is amazing. It's a French movie, Monica Bellucci at her best. It's amazing how Robocop manages to do social critique without being preachy. Yeah, that was actually an art back then. People could do things like that. They could make social commentary um, in a way that just got you thinking without trying to like lecture you about how you had to think. Um, but yeah, I, I've never seen Irreversible yet, uh, but I do like Monica Bellucci. So it's maybe worth watching. Uh, yeah, he was in Star Trek Into Darkness um, as Admiral Marcus. Um, and he was looking pretty old by that point, but um, yeah, still a good guy. He's got a very like gravelly, authoritative voice, so I like that. Um, Ty Tyler Donovan says, Drinker, I'm a professional Michael J. Fox lookalike impersonator. Curious when you'll do a Back to the Future stream. I'd love to be part of it. <laughs> That'd be cool, man. Um, I definitely am going to be talking about the Back to the Future movies. I'd kind of like to just do a proper review of it, like um, do a you know a, um, a scripted review, so I can really get into it and um, I'd get my thoughts into some kind of order. But um, I'd be up for talking about them well as well, just on a, a more like informal live stream because uh, they're genuinely some of my favorite movies, Back to the Future. Agreed. Uh, do you have a preference of which one you like the most? Uh, you're asking me? Yeah. Uh, you know, people people say that they didn't like the third one. I actually really enjoyed it. I thought it was quite clever. You know, like I just loved the the, the Old West storyline. Uh, um, and then, you know, going back to when Hill Valley started. 
Um, I don't know. I, I enjoyed it. I'll say that I think the second one was the best out of the whole thing. Oh, that's interesting. Um, I think my, my favorite is still the first. Okay. Just because there's a, there's a kind of, it's a simpler story, obviously, mm. but there's an elegance to it. And um, I like the ideas behind it of like, mm. you know, you know, meeting your parents when they were still teenagers like you and like they, they're being yeah. these, they were always these remote figures that you didn't understand. And then suddenly right. you get to see them at your age um, and like going through some of the same stuff you've experienced at school. Sure. Like it's a cool, cool little story. And you know, how his dad's a complete dork and like getting mm. bullied by Biff. <laughs> uh, I mean, it's, it was a brilliant story that way. And again, we could, um, talk for hours about the paradox of time travel but the one thing that never sat well with me is he goes back meets his parents alters the future so that it's you know uh successful in the future but when he returns wouldn't his parents have remembered him meeting yeah, him? yeah i i wondered about that because it's like okay it's like you know what 30 years ago so yeah so that's a long time but you'd kind of think wow this this marty guy that i remembered yeah. Looks and no Calvin Klein they call him I yep. think um, he looks an awful lot like my son does now. Mm -hmm. <laughs> <You know? laughs> yeah. I don't know. Like I, I guess it's going on the assumption that like after thirty years you would have forgotten him a little bit or at least forgotten what he looked like, um, mm. or maybe it's like almost like an in a wink wink thing between them. Like they knew what he did and that he went back, but they couldn't tell him about it because then it would have altered things. I don't know. Okay. You, you could go different ways with that. But yeah, I totally get your, your, your point. Like, it's definitely something I've wondered about in the past. Mm, okay. It's kind of like a little contrivance, I suppose. Um, Alberto Suela says, Robocop 2 screams Frank Miller for the screenplay and story. It really looks like a giant comic book. Yeah. yeah. I think it does. When you see him fighting Kane in that, that huge um, robot, you know, exoskeleton, mm -hmm. yeah, that's straight out of it. I was just actually watching a documentary on that film the other day, and uh, Phil Tippett, the guy who did the stop motion, was talking about the poor stuntman that they had uh, attached to the back of this thing, uh, the RoboCop stuntman. And this poor dude was uh, getting uh, pretty severely injured because he was getting flailed around all the time, being strapped to this uh, cane robot that they were uh, flipping around. So uh, hats off again to the stuntman. Yeah, absolutely. Um, what's the next one here? Dominic the Donkey. Drinker, you gaming master. Have you played Yakuza or any of the Yakuza games? I highly recommend them. Uh, no, I've heard great things about them, but I've never played them myself, actually. So um, it's one for the list. Uh, but yeah, like I say, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to stream a couple more um, Call of Duties. Uh, in Warzone and stuff, and yeah, I'm going to try and do a, a, a run through of Resident Evil 3 because it's so short, I should be able to just complete it in one session. Um, hopefully, I don't die too many times. Um, PlayStation Hacker says, Hail Drinker, I keep forgetting to praise you for the mandatory work of art that was Why the Past Matters. It touched everyone I showed it to. Absolutely. Uh, it really, yeah, it really seemed to strike a chord with people. It was interesting. I mean, sure. I, I, I guess I was hoping it would make a valid point, but people really responded to it. I got like so many emails from that more than any other movie or sorry, any other video that I've ever put out. Like that's yeah. the one that seemed to get the biggest response. Well, every point that you made was just uh, like right on, right on the mark and uh, it tripped on nostalgia as well. And I mean, I'll admit I had to like shed a tear or two. It was just like, wow, that was just really, really good. Well, as long as it got the point across, then hopefully mm -hmm. you know, sure. it got some people thinking, I guess. Um, Walt here says, congrats on the book. How are the sales going? I hear the lockdown madness is still going on in Scotland. I don't suppose book tours are as vital to sales as they were back in the day. Uh, yeah, you're right about that. Um, we don't get the sales figures usually for the first couple of weeks. You have to wait for all the different territories to kind of report in and then get like my... Um, publishers will send me a kind of consolidated sales update. Um, it should be good though, because you know when I've mentioned it on my channel, it's really you know shown a big bump in pre-orders and stuff. So all that's really helped. Um, so hopefully it's going to do really well. Um, yeah, book tours are, are a waste of time for the most part. 
Um, mm. I've gone to book signings where like I've been in a bookstore for like a whole afternoon and maybe sold like five copies. So it's just not worth my time at all or, or wow. most authors' time. It's it's fine if you're like super famous, you know, and people are gonna generate a real buzz with you being there, but most of the time it's just like an unknown author kind of thing. Um, and people will wander by, they'll talk to you for a while and then not buy your book, you know? So yeah, it's pretty, a bit, it's a bit discouraging, I suppose. So I don't know if it would be different now. Um, I could just go as the drinker and maybe that would get more interest. Who knows? Um, Asante here says, when is the Matrix trilogy coming? Um, my review? Oh yes, one day. I want to review... Back to the Future trilogy, the Matrix trilogy, uh, the Lord of the Rings, and the Hobbit. Because wow. there's so much I can say about all of those movies. <laughs> okay. Uh, I don't know yet how I'll do them, whether I'll do one video for each trilogy or each film gets its own one. Not decided yet. But I'll, I'll work it out as I go. Um, Jay Ho gave me $5 super chat, so thanks for that. Um, Slosher, don't remember when... Sorry, I don't remember you talking about No Country for Old Men. Do you have any thoughts on it? Um, yeah, I mean, I thought, um, what the hell is the guy's name? That's, Javier, uh, Javier, Javier Bardem. Bardem. Yes, I mean, his performance was great. Um, really, like, an unsettling kind of character. Um, I thought Josh Brolin was good in it. Uh, the story not terribly complicated um it's a movie that's kind of about the performances rather than the story um i can see why it was such a difficult movie to film like the book apparently was really difficult to adapt uh but i thought they did a pretty good job with it um but yeah it just it didn't like make a huge impact on me but i could see that it was a well acted like well written movie for what mm -hmm. it's worth yeah um flubber 11 usa says Carl is my favorite of the Marx Brothers. Yours? <laughs> uh, I, it was funny, I mentioned that on Twitter once. It was like, when I said I was going to do Fight Club as a review, uh, someone said to me, who would you fight if you could fight any historical figure? And I just replied, like, you know, like from the movie. Uh, my one was like, well, I, I would fight Karl Marx. Uh, and that got, like, I got a message from Twitter saying this is a protected... Uh, tweet like not many people can see it because it's controversial or something i was like what what really saying, saying that i would fight a guy who's been dead for 150 years <laughs> like oh, how man. uh just shows you where their where their leanings are i guess wow. at Twitter. What, what a lovely site it is yeah that's uh, i don't think it's in anyone's best interest to be on that platform no absolutely um yeah parlor's looking more appealing by the day um What's the next one? Idiotosin says, Peter Weller voiced an older Batman in the animated movie The Dark Knight Returns, not Rises. Uh, the voice really fit. It was worth checking out. Yeah, okay. Um, I am going to do a video, actually, on The Dark Knight Rises because I've got things I want to say about that film, and they're not good. Really? Oh, yeah. Man. Okay, I'm looking forward uh, to that one. You know, enjoyed Dark Knight. Um, mm -hmm. Batman Begins was meh. It's kind of all right, but not not very memorable. Uh, but Dark Knight Rises, like I had a lot of problems with the writing on that one. Um, yeah, a lot of it centers around Bane's plan, and you know the the pacing of it and stuff is terrible in my opinion. So yeah, I'm gonna I'm gonna put together a review on that one. Excellent. Uh, what is it, Eddie Eddie Riffic, USN vet? Um, Robocop versus Terminator. The comic book was cool. Um, yeah, it was people, actually. Yeah. Someone was asking me about that earlier. Like, who would would it be good to see Robocop versus Terminator, and could it work um, cinematically? I'm not sure. It, it was um, in terms of a comic story. I thought it was pretty creative um, how they tied the two universes together. Uh, but I, I just remembered someone uh, making a joke comparison about you know. Robocop versus Terminator, like, what would it be like? You know, well, they just punch each other uh, ad infinitum, and then who wins? No one? Uh, yeah. Because, I mean, shooting each other is not going to do much, so... Nope. Yeah. I don't know what you could do there. Um, 
Natty here says, if current demographic trends continue and ethnic Brits become a minority by 2066, do you think we can finally stop being the bad guys in films? Never. It's it's pretty much like your your standards like career path for any British actor. You'll become the villain in some movie. Uh, it's true. So it's probably a big earner for a lot of them. Uh, yeah, I think there's something about like I don't know the British attitude or the British accent, like a posh English accent. It's kind of where you go to for like a cerebral villain. <laughs> I don't know why, but they just they keep doing it. I think we need to see more representation of some Scotsman rather than just uh, groundskeeper groundskeeper Willie. I know, like yeah, that that brief scene in The Force Awakens where there's a <laughs> Scottish guy for some random reason, and like I got so excited, I was like, oh wow. Finally, I see myself represented on screen. Mm -hmm. It's so stunning and brave. Yeah, um, because <laughs> you know, up until up until that point, I couldn't identify with anyone in those movies or in the OT or anything. Oh, for sure, Had to be a Scottish guy. Yep, I feel bad for you. You got misrepresented. Yeah, uh, we've got we've got Scotty though from Star Trek, so that's something. true. True. Yeah, I mean, he's played by a Canadian, but you know, nah, close enough. Same th same thing. It's all for the Commonwealth. Exactly. Um, Ken of the North here says, thanks for the review. Love this. You guys helped me finish out the last few hours of a 12 hour shift. Damn, Ooh, man. That's wow. intense. All right. Well, uh, glad, glad to help. Uh, have you seen the Salton Sea with Val Kilmer? The Salton Sea. I, I feel like I have seen the Salton Sea, but I feel like I can't remember anything about it. So it must've been a really long time ago, but the name definitely stuck in my head. Huh. 2002. No, I have not seen that. Hmm. I need to come back to that one. Um, Bud Dickman gave me a thumbs up. Super chat. So thank you for that. Just refreshing here. Just give me one second. Um, hologram Nunchuck here in chat was just saying, I love Alan Rickman in Galaxy Quest. He cracks me up. Yeah, oh, he's great. I love Alan that Rickman. movie so much. Uh, swayed off the cuff here saying uh, in Salt and Sea, Val Kilmer, it was an undercover cop gone meth head. Okay. Sort of rings a bell, actually. I'm just looking at uh, some screenshots here. It's Val Kilmer when he still looked like Val Kilmer. Yeah, he's looking a bit rough these days, isn't he? Yeah. He um, Did he not have throat cancer and he had to get a tracheotomy or something? Possibly. Um, I think so. Because there was, yeah, there was a picture of him and he had like a, not a bandage, but like a scarf around his neck or something. And he looked mm. like he lost loads of weight. He just looked really old. And it's like, damn, like, wow. Tom Cruise look, basically hasn't changed in 20 years. Right. And Val Kilmer just looks like an old man now. It's a real shame. Ouch. Um, what's the next one? Yeah, Arch Stanton says, Drinker, you should have a second channel where you post these happy hours. I really love them and I couldn't catch this one. Uh, well, you're in luck because I do have a second channel and I do repost all of my live streams there. So it's Critical Drinker After Hours. Uh, and yeah, that's where all my live streams can be found so they don't clutter up my main channel. So yeah, go there and you'll see them all. Um, Brown Gaijin says, there's an alternate ending to BTTF that hints uh, the dad knew, or Back to the Future, sorry, that hints the dad knew. Really? About all of this. That's interesting explain yeah it would make sense maybe doc told them and he's like look you're gonna have a kid called marty who's gonna end up going back in time but you can't warn him because then it'll mess things up and he won't do it okay i mean i can see why they might take that out because it probably would clutter the ending up mm -hmm. a bit too much and they probably just wanted to keep it nice and streamlined um, I know that there's like an alternate take in Back to the Future 2 where, you know, Biff comes back to the, the future after going back and changing stuff, like mm -hmm. old Biff, and right. then he suffers a heart attack. And in the alternate take, like he, he suffers the heart attack and as he falls to the ground, he kind of vanishes. Um, and that's to signify that like the, uh, the timeline's been changed and this version of old Biff doesn't exist anymore. So he, he just fades out of existence. Hmm. But they removed it because they're like, well, we didn't want to clue the audience in at this point that things had changed. And it would have just looked really visually confusing. Like, why did he just vanish for no apparent reason? So they took it out. Okay. Um, 
But yeah, um, yeah. Some of people are suggesting uh, maybe he just drops a subtle hint to Marty at the end. Yeah. Um, drinker, please review George Orwell's 1984 with Richard Burton and John Hurt. Yeah, I've watched it and read the book actually. I think that would be another painful, painful story to revisit. Oh yes, yeah. It's it's funny. It became like a cliche after a while. Like, oh yeah, referenced in 1984. Are you? Oh, it's for like, sure. Well, it's it's so relevant. I'm afraid. <laughs> like that's Absolutely. the problem we have. Um, and uh, oh, I mean. Demolition Man gives plenty of nods towards uh, uh, 1984, but also Brave New World. Yeah. Yeah. Um, that's why Lenina Huxley is named as she is. It's like mm -hmm. it's a reference to Aldous Huxley, isn't it? Yes, absolutely. Uh, here's a question for you, actually, from Jay Weatherford. Uh, Danquish, clever. Mm -hmm. Ever play Binary Domain? Wish, would you guys ever do a Last Starfighter walk through? Oh, jeez. Um, okay, part one. Yes, I did play bi binary domain um, because I loved Vanquished so much. I just lost count after my hundred playthrough of it. Uh, binary domain was a lot of fun. Um, really enjoyed the visuals in it because it had cyborgs. And uh, Last Starfighter. Yeah, I adored that movie. Every time yeah. it would pop up on like pay TV at the time, I would make sure that I was home to see it. It's a good film. Yeah, it's good fun. Um, Ages Flow says, Drinker at Danquish, thanks for doing this. It's been a treat. What movies do you think are appropriate to applaud at the end of, if any? <laughs> uh, I don't know. I mean, I, this, this isn't a thing that you get in the UK. Like, I know in America and other places, like, people interact a lot more when they go to the movies. You know, I've been in the States once or twice where I've seen a film um, and you, the audience like properly like whoop and cheer and stuff at various times. Whereas here you don't really get that. Like they'll laugh at funny scenes, but that's kind of it. Um, so yeah, it's, it's a difficult one for me to relate to. I don't know if that ever happens where you are, Danquish, or if there's any <sighs> movies that you've seen it. You know, admit it. I'm just, I'm really trying to think about this because we haven't been to a theater in a long, long time for... Uh, some strange reason that we won't expand upon. Uh, I think the movie Upgrade, when we saw that in the theater, my wife and I were just so impressed with that movie that at the end, we just clapped just because that was awesome. We loved it. But in terms of like audience participation, yeah, it's kind of a, kind of a rare thing. It doesn't really happen all that often. Hmm. Um. Michael Markowski says, Drinker, when Brie Larson and Az have a baby, will you be the godfather? Mm. I don't know, man. I think the quarter in is like taking taking the place as like Brie Larson's biggest fan. Uh, so I think he he should have the honors, really. Uh, I've 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 been pushed out of that role, <laughs> sadly. <laughs> I'm just so pleased that she's got a YouTube channel, though. It's <laughs> it's glorious. Does, is it still going? Uh, I think so. Oh, as man. far as I know, yeah, I think she still produces videos. She gets like I don't know a hundred thousand views or something per video, which, I mean, it's not bad, but like for an A-list celebrity, I don't know, mm -hmm. man, you'd expect more. Um, oh, but that's what happens it. when when people aren't actually like propping up your your content and putting it to the top of the trending list for no reason. Then yeah, suddenly you, you have to work for it. Wow. Okay. Uh, but yeah, I. I Definitely think Az has got a shot with Brie Larson, so who knows? Watch this space. Um, Jay, Jay Weatherford, uh, you never fight Mark's drinker, you fight Engels. Uh, I mean, either one really would be fine. I think I could take them. Um, PSX Hacker, I can volunteer to participate in any Back to the Future stream. I'm quite versed in the Back to the Future lore, same for the Matrix and the sad Star Trek V final frontier ah cool well we'll keep you in mind then and we'll All right. see what we can do um should I actually you know one time i'll just do a a stream that's all guests like mm -hmm. i'll bring in like a whole bunch of guests and they can have like half an hour each or something we can just cover whatever they want uh, del morales says guilty pleasure here 2014's robocop remake i enjoyed the black tactical suite and thought they did a decent job of not copying the original okay 
So is it more like a militaristic style of Robocop rather than the satire of this one? Kind of. Um, yeah. The, it's Michael Keaton's character that suggests they paint him all black to make him like look more menacing. Okay. Uh, yeah, I, I will watch it because I'm just curious now to see what they do with it. Um, George here says, Drinker, what non-franchise movie would you like to rewrite or remake? Any chance of reviews from Miller's Crossing and Road to Perdition? Okay. I mean, I enjoyed Road to Perdition. Um, and it would probably be a Drinker Recommends. I just... I don't know if I could, like, get enough material on it to, to make a good review, if you know what I mean. Like, I would just be basically saying, yeah, it's really good. It's a well-made film. I liked it. Um, but yeah, I'm just trying to think a non-franchise movie that you'd like to rewrite or remake. Hmm. <laughs> I'm generally not a big fan of remakes ever because there's very few that I can think of that have come that, that have even equaled the original, never mind being better than it. And I think that's the only reason I would ever consider doing a remake where it's something that was bad to begin with and I think I could do a better job. You know, mm. um, yeah, I'm, I'm just more inclined to appreciate the original for what it is and move on to new ideas rather than just rehashing the same thing. Um, the Battlestar Galactica remake that they did like 15 years ago was great. Like that's one of the few examples I can think of where it's like, ah, okay, that was clearly way better than the original version. Hmm. Um, okay. But that, yeah, genuinely, they're few and far between. So, yeah, not not too much that comes to mind, I'm afraid. Um, Scottish Nerd here says, Mr. Drinker, there are six pubs near the bookshop in Dundee. A book signing here wouldn't be a total loss. Oh, well, that's all right then, yeah. Um, Dundee's always good for a night out because it's a big student town, so booze is well cheap there. Or at least it was when things were open. <laughs> exactly. Uh, yeah, I had, I've had some good nights out in Dundee, like... Um, John Ochiltree says if you want a good laugh, listen to Val Kilmer's demo track, Hold On To Daddy it makes me wish music had never been invented oh. <laughs> this, what, has Val Kilmer got a, a, a singing career that I don't know about? oh no, damn man okay, it was hard enough watching Russell Crowe do that music video shortly after he rose to stardom with Gladiator right, he, uh, that was that was cringy is it as bad as uh, when all the celebrities did Imagine on their iPhones? Well, no, that that's that's a total different level of suck. Yeah, that was legit painful. I think my, my spine actually separated from my body and just cringed right out of it. Damn right. It's yeah. like, uh, no, please make it stop. Stop it. Just stop. Yeah. <laughs> uh, Bruce Willis, people were mentioning, yes, he's, he's done a lot of singing. Mostly bad. Um Tom, Tom C. is uh, giving me a $5 super chat, so thanks for that, man. Um, the Quiet Man. Hey, gents. Was wondering if you've watched the Vikings TV show and what your thoughts on the series were. It's got some badass action in it. Hmm. I mean, I've seen the odd episode. I've never watched it, like, real, you know, religiously, so I can really follow the characters. But what I saw was pretty good. Like, yeah, nice and gritty, um, good fight scenes, bit of gore, pretty good. It's just there's so much of it now, like it would be a hell of an undertaking to go back and watch it all. I think we had added that to our list. Like my wife was like, I think I would watch that. But that was when we were still uh, enjoying Game of Thrones. And then when the season went the way it was, my wife was like, you know what? I think I might be burnt out on this type of story. Yeah. It can, um, yeah, it's amazing the, the knock on effects that that's had Game of Thrones. Like, the fantasy genre has really exploded because of that, but then right. it's almost self-destructed because of that as well. Like you exactly. say, so many people have been put off it now. Yeah, uh, The Witcher's got potential, I think. It got off to a shaky start, but I think it's it's got a good core to it, so I'm looking forward to season two. Okay. Uh, I, I don't give a shit about any of the prequels for Game of Thrones. I hope they never get made. Ugh, uh, just, and I'm, just let it die. Yeah, and I'm not enthusiastic about um, the Lord of the Rings show either. Yeah. Um, I just don't think that's a story that needs to be told. 
to quote uh, Princess Leia, I've got a bad feeling about this. Yeah, exactly. Um, I, I wish, especially with the Game of Thrones prequels, I wish they would just stop all of that and just tell George R. R. Martin, just you're not doing anything else apart from yeah. writing your books. Just go yeah. into a fucking log cabin somewhere, finish this goddamn book and get it done and stop torturing people with your shitty updates every like two years. Exactly. Uh, but yeah, that's like, yeah, I, I've got no time for authors like that who, who just procrastinate and get nothing done. But he's probably uh, just so rich at this point that he just doesn't care. Probably. And I think he really got caught up in the fame of, of like the show and all that. And, you know, just going to every convention that existed and, and just like lapping up all the attention rather than realizing, yeah, at a certain point you have to actually do some work as well. Well, don't you think he would, there's some kind of professional pride where he would want to redeem his story after what had happened in the last season? Like, I think maybe that's his problem in that now the TV show got ahead of his books and did a bad job of it. And he's probably had to think, okay, now I need to do something completely different from the show, which okay. wasn't my plan, but I have to keep it consistent with what I was, what I've done up until this point. Okay. So it may be that he's having to like rethink the entire series from this point on, which, you know, that's not a, an enviable task. But then yeah. he brought it on himself by not getting his book done in time. Exactly. Uh, that was just because we genuinely enjoyed it the first several seasons. But then when those two guys, uh, Benioff and what are their two names? Damon. Benioff and Weiss. Weiss. Yeah. The way that they okay, we'll take it from here and we'll fill in the blanks and just, ugh, you guys suck. Yeah, pretty much. And I was in denial about it, like, right mm -hmm. up until, like, season seven, I think I was like, yeah, no, it's still amazing, mm -hmm. you know? Yeah, they're having to move things on a bit more now and it's maybe not as uh, intricate as it was before, but it's still good. And then got to season eight and I was like, no, no, it's not. It's yeah. I give up now. Uh, well, we'll... All we know is that we'll forever be in your debt for your review because it was because your reviews were the only reason why we continued watching because we watched <laughs> the episode and we're like, okay, the the silver lining is that we and very like shortly within a few days, Drinker's going to release a review video and that makes it all worth it. That was so. probably the most intense like work that I've done with YouTube because it had to be done so quickly. Right. You know, the the, the episode would come out and it's like, okay you know, stay up late to watch it here in the UK so that it's like matching up with the, the US times and then straight away got to get to work, like putting together a review for it before the next one comes out. Uh, yeah. And yeah, it was, <laughs> it was demanding, but man, yeah. uh, the response to it was incredible. Yeah. We were genuinely, genuinely grateful. My wife would message me at, at work and say, drinkers videos up. So I'd have to stop what I was doing so I could. <laughs> uh, what's the next one here? Sorry, it's just blanked out for a second there. Uh, oh, yeah, here it comes. Um, yeah, Friggle D says, any chance you'll review to live and die in L.A.? Ooh. Uh, I would need to watch it first, to be honest, before I could review it. I've not seen it. So, uh, yeah, I don't know what to say on that one. Um, the Quiet Man says, how about some John Wayne movie reviews? Oh, man. Classics now. Um yeah, I was going to talk about The Shootist, which I think was his last movie. Um, but I think it would be an interesting comparison because I did um, Unforgiven, which was Eastwood's last Western, mm -hmm. um, and absolutely loved that. Um, yeah. And I think The Shootist was quite a good Wayne movie as well because he was he plays like a gunslinger who's dying of cancer, and John Wayne himself was dying of cancer at the time. So it, it was, um, you know obviously are imitating life, but he gave a great performance in it. Um, so I'll keep that one, keep that one um, on my list. Um, Slosher says, do you read much nonfiction? Are there any books or movies in particular that made you a better writer? Um, no specific books or movies that, that taught me about writing, I guess. Like it's a, a thing that built up over a long time where, you know, you, the more movies you see, the more things that you notice, um, common threads between them like the structure of them will be quite similar um, and you start to realize oh okay i get how they do this i get how they tell these stories and i get how they make the audience feel a certain way and then you start to realize that you can do that as well 
Um, and in terms of nonfiction, um, I mean, I, I've read like history books, um, some biographies and stuff on people, just like, you know, leaders or actors or, or whoever I might be interested in. Um, but like, yeah, that would that would probably be it. Like mostly historical stuff, if I'm going to read nonfiction. What's the next one? Uh, Kalashnikov says, not enough Scotch, Scott representation. Uh, tell that to Kanji Club. <laughs> yeah. Mm. <laughs> I want to know more about Kanji Club. Yeah. Um, I bet they, they'll get their own spin off eventually. Uh, Will Elmore, might be an unpopular opinion. I like the new Magnificent Seven. Not more than the original, but it was good. Also, for video games, Deus Ex Invisible War was pretty good. Once again, the original was better, but it's still good. Uh, yeah, um, I mean, I was a big fan of the original Magnificent Seven and Seven Samurai, and even Battle Beyond the Stars, that was like the sci-fi equivalent of Magnificent Seven. Uh, but I have not yet seen the, the remake, so I don't know about it yet. Uh, I don't know if you've seen it, Danquish, have you? I have not. Okay. Um, but yeah, it's, I think it was more of a light-hearted one, as I understand it, because you got guys like Chris Pratt in it, Kind of associate him more with comedy and stuff. Uh, I think we're almost at the end of the super chats, actually. Just a couple more here. Uh, yeah, Daniel Gonzalez. Hey, drinker. I have to disagree with you regarding Brie Larson. She's an amazing actress. Um, just kidding. Plank's acting on Ed, Ed, and Eddie was better. <laughs> Thanks for making Sunday awesome, man. Cheers. Yeah. <laughs> Damn. Cool, mate. Um, Phantom Boomer, uh, to live and die in LA is great. Okay. This could be a, could be a drinker recommends then. That reminds yeah. me, have you ever seen the movie Kiss Kiss Bang Bang? Oh gosh, a while back. I have okay. seen it, but it's been a while. It's got a very, very young Robert Downey Jr. in it. It's, uh, I think it's yes. a great movie. Yeah. Um, the horrific podcast here says, um, George R. R. Martin is one of those people that turned out to be a real prick. I lost interest in him after his interviews. Um, yeah, like I say, I mean, he just seems to have gotten really immersed in the fame and the, the attention of the TV show and kind of stopped putting in the work. And I think that's this the worst thing you can do is just getting complacent as a, a creator and a writer, you know. You, there comes a point where you just have to knuckle down and get it done. And the worst thing that can kind of happen from that creative standpoint is just losing your momentum. Mm -hmm. You know, you, you can't just be on, working on a book and then leave it for a year and then try and get back into it. You'll totally lose the thread of where you were at, mm. you know? Um, so it's, it's just, a, it's an awful way to write, write, you know, to write any piece of fiction. It's like, so when you write a, a new novel or anything like that, is that, what you do, you just kind of lock yourself in a room and, and crank it out? Not quite locked in a room, but I will make sure that I work on it like consistently. Okay. You know, even if there's nights when I can't be bothered or whatever, you know, I'd rather be doing something else. It's like, no, I need to get this done because if I stop, you know, I'll, I'll lose that momentum and then it's really hard to get back into it. Okay. Um, and it's awful when you feel like you've, you've kind of lost your feel for where you're going with the story. Right. And you have to almost force yourself to like, you know, get that that sense of it back again. And it takes time and it's just wasted time then. Um, so for me, yeah, I just have to stay kind of immersed in it and keep my keep my head in it until it's done. Nice. And, you know, it means like six months of, yeah, quite a lot of work on that book. But then it's done and it doesn't take me like 10 years to write it. Okay. I mean, yeah, obviously he sells a lot more books than I do, so he may, maybe he's doing something right, but yeah, that's that's what works for me. <clears throat> um, last of all here, yeah, one more from The Quiet Man. Review McClintock, best, uh, most un-PC John Wayne comedy. Uh, yeah, McClintock. Damn it. Is that the one where he's, he's got an eye patch and stuff and he's... Yeah, that could be. I could be confusing that with a different Wayne movie, um, but yeah, I'll keep it I'll keep it in mind as well. Um, I think that's actually all of them. Wow! I think we made it to the end. Yeah, ah, uh, that's that's all of the super chats covered. So, wow, that was that was pretty awesome, man. All right. Um, 
Yeah, I mean, it was a pleasure as always to talk about Robocop. It was a pleasure to have you on board. And um, I just want to say thanks as always to chat. Thanks for all the super chats. Thanks for everyone who's given me all this great feedback. And um, yeah, I hope you've all enjoyed your, yourself on the stream this evening. Hope we've provided a little bit of entertainment. Um, is Thank there, you so uh, much. Yeah. Yeah. Um, I was going to say, like, because I don't think you you really have a channel yourself, Danquish. Because normally I give people a chance to, sure. to plug their work. But yeah, I I have actually uh, been doing some house cleaning with my social media, so I really only just exist on Instagram now. Okay. Um, yeah, I don't. I can't say I blame you to be honest. Um, Twitter ain't fun anymore. I'm not yeah, sure it ever was. Yeah, I ditched Facebook, Twitter, all that. Uh, yeah. And I don't. I, I've wanted to make a YouTube channel or a Twitch channel. I just don't know if I would have anything interesting to, to, to do or say that hasn't been done already. Okay. Well, I mean, I'm sure we can have you back on the channel again if you're willing to do it, and we find a, a movie we want to talk about. It's always a pleasure to talk to you, sir. Nice one. All right. Well, we'll, we'll end it there. Then I guess, guys. Um, thank you for everyone who joined us, and um, I'll catch you for the next one. Um, just to let people know. Um, I'm going to be doing my next stream, I think, with Robert Meyer Burnett on Thursday next week. And we're going to do Star Trek, the motion picture. God help me. I need to watch that movie again. Wow. Okay. Uh, that's but, awesome. Um, yeah, we're going to try and make sense of it. And that's going to be a challenge. But I'm looking forward to talking to him because we've been looking to set this up for a while. So cool. should be good. In the meantime, stay out of trouble. Yeah, stay out of trouble. Uh, yeah. All right, well, thanks, guys. That's all we've got for this evening, so we're going to go away now.